Hello and welcome. To get you started on your R journey, we need to set you up with the required software, R and R Studio. R is the programming language you're going to use to write code, and R Studio is a development environment that makes working with R easier. So let's see how we can get you access to these software. Let's get started. So your learning objective for this lesson is that you can access R and R Studio either through rstudio.cloud or through your local computer. Let's see what this means. So the first distinction we want to make is between R and R Studio. And like I said before, R is a programming language you're going to use to write code. R Studio is an integrated development environment or an IDE that makes working with R easier. There are many other IDEs you could use to work with R but our studio is by far the best. The other distinction to have in mind is cloud versus local. Will you work with R on the internet, on the cloud, or will you download it to your local computer? Most people download it to their computers and work that way, but there are a few reasons why you might choose to work on the cloud with a service called RStudio Cloud, which I will introduce you to. One reason is you just want to give R a quick test drive and you don't want to waste time installing software. Another reason is maybe your computer is old or slow and it can't run R competently. And then a final reason is maybe you've run into trouble installing R in R Studio, and so you just want to try it out on the web before bothering with the troubleshooting. Note though that R Studio Cloud only gives you a 25 free project hours per month. After that, you have to pay. So keep that in mind when making this decision. Now the rest of the video is going to be divided into three parts. First, I'll show you how to get set up on the cloud, if that's what you're using, with the service rstudio.cloud. Then I'll show you how to install the software locally if you're on a Windows computer. And then I'll show you how to install locally if you're on a Mac OS. So jump to the section that's relevant for you. So now I'm going to show you how to get started with RStudio on the cloud. It's quite simple. You go to your preferred browser and you type in rstudio.cloud. And you go to the RStudio Cloud website here. And you can click on this Get Started for Free button. Or at the top right there, you have the Sign Up button. They're both the same. So I'm going to click Get Started for Free. And I'm going to click on this Sign Up button here at the bottom. And it brings me to this page where I'm going to enter my details. And once that's done, I'm going to click the Sign Up button. Now it says it has sent a link to my email. So I need to go to my email and click on the link sent. And that brings me to the Email Verified page. So now I can open a new tab and go to rstudio.cloud again. And from there, I can log in with the provided credentials. So again, I'm just going to go to rstudio.cloud, the login section, and then I'm going to put in those credentials that I just created. And it brings me to this nice workspace to create a new RStudio project. To get started with R, we need to click that button at the top right for new project, and then click on new RStudio project. And while that's deploying, we can rename our project to something like R underscore intro. And that brings us to this RStudio window here. This is going to be your home for a very long time to come. We can close this side panel so we have a bit more space. And we can press Command or Control Plus to zoom in. And now if you already want to start working with R, you can type code directly into this tab here, which is the console. You can see our cursor down there. For now, we're going to type something very simple, 2 plus 2. And that is our very first R code. So now you are set up. You can use R on the web with rstudio.cloud. So now you can jump to the final section of the lesson. See you there. Now, if you're on a Windows computer, let's see how you can install R and RStudio. To install R, you're going to go to cran.rstudio.com, or you could just Google search Cran R Studio, and it'll take you to this website here where you have three options for download. You're going to click on the third one there for download R for Windows. And it gives us this scary page with a number of subdirectories. We're going to click on this first one because it says this is what you want to install R for the first time. So we click on that. And then at the top, we have this big link here that says download R for Windows. We're going to click on that there. And it triggers our download, as you can see. Once the download is over, you can go to your downloads folder, or in my case, I can click directly on it from here and click on open file. And it says, do I want to allow this app to make changes to my device? I click yes. And then I'm just going to follow the instructions to install R. 
So I didn't change any of the defaults, I just kept hitting next, and now R is being installed on the computer. And once it's done, I can click on finish, and now my computer has R. But for the most part, you're never going to work with R directly, you're going to work with R via R Studio. So let's see how to get the R Studio IDE. The easiest way to get to the download page for the R Studio IDE is just to Google download R Studio, or you can search on your favorite search engine. So here I see the first result there, download the R Studio IDE, and I'm going to scroll down to this R Studio desktop free option click on download there, and the browser has already figured out my operating system, which is Windows, so I can click on that button, and that triggers the download over there. Now once the file has been downloaded, I can open it from my downloads folder, or in my case I can click directly, and I'm going to go through the installation process just clicking next, yes, next, yes. And now to open our studio, I can just click on the Windows key, and search for R Studio there, and I can click to open the application. And that brings us over here to the R Studio window, which is going to be your home for a long time to come. Now we can already type some R code by going to this console tab here. You can see a flashing cursor. In there I'm just going to type 2 plus 2 and run that code, and that is our very first line of R code. So now you're set up with R and R Studio. You can use R on your local computer, so you're ready to go to the end of the lesson. Now if you're working on a Mac, let's see how we can get you set up. First you have to go to cran.rstudio.com, or you could just Google Cran R Studio, and it will give you the cran.rstudio.com page. And you can see here that you have three options for downloading and installing R. Since we're on Mac, we're going to click on that second one, Download R from Mac OS. Now the page looks quite scary, but all you have to do is find this latest release section, and for the majority of you, you can just click on that first link there. If you want, you can read the description of what it pertains to, but for the majority of you, you can click on the first link. If you have bought a new MacBook since 2021, chances are you might be on what's called an M1 Mac, and in that case, you would actually want to pick this second link there. But I think for the majority of people, you can click on that first link. Now in my case, I am using an M1 Mac, so I'm going to click on that second link for M1 Macs only. And that will trigger a download to my computer. Now you can see in my downloads folder, I have that file, so I can just double click that to open it. And I can just follow the steps for the installation. It might ask you for your password, so you can put that in. And voila, in a few seconds, it tells us the installation was successful, so we can close, and now we have R on our computers. But like I said, usually you're not going to work directly with R, we're going to work with the R Studio IDE, so let's see how we can get that. Now to get the R Studio IDE, your best bet is just to search R Studio Download on your favorite search engine. And usually, if you click on the first link, it'll take you to where you need to be. So if we scroll down on this page, we can see here the download link for RStudio Desktop. That's what we're going to click on. Now the browser has already figured out what operating system you're using, so it gives us the right download link there. Download RStudio for Mac, we're going to click on that. So now in my downloads folder, I have this DMG file that I can double click to install RStudio. And now all we need to do is drag the RStudio icon into our applications folder. And once that's done, we can simply press command and spacebar and find RStudio there, and we can open up the RStudio IDE. Now it says RStudio is an app downloaded from the internet, do I want to open it? I click sure, or open rather. And after a few seconds, it shows us the RStudio interface. This is going to be your home for a long time to come. We can press Command and Plus in order to zoom in a little bit. And here, in our console, we can already type some R code. I'm going to type something very simple, 2 plus 2, and I'm going to press Enter. And we've just run our first line of R code. So now you're done setting up R and R Studio on your computer, so you can jump to the final part of the lesson. If you are still following along, congratulations, you've just begun an amazing journey into the world of R, the best programming language for data analysis. Over the rest of the course, we're going to show you how to make the most of this tool. 
I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello and welcome back. Now that you have access to the required software, we're going to go on a quick tour of our studio, your digital home for a long time to come. So let's get started. Your learning objective for this session is that you can identify and use the following tabs in our studio. The source, the console, the environment, the history, the files, the plots, the packages, the help, and the viewer. Now that's quite a lot to go over, so it's important that you do not panic. We are going to cover a lot of territory fairly quickly in this lesson, but we do not expect you to remember this all on the first go. Rather, as you go through the course, you will assimilate some of this material because you will encounter it many times. So hope you're feeling ready. Let's go. Now, of course, before you can get started, you need to open our studio. So if you're working on the cloud, you can go to rstudio.cloud as we did last time and open this project that we created, the R intro project. If uh, you haven't created that project yet, just click on a new project and create it. If you're working on your local computer, you just go to your applications folder and open our studio from there. And once I've clicked on the R intro project here, I get the nice R Studio interface. It might look a little bit different depending on your operating system. That is totally fine. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, so make sure that you can actually see the, the code, although that might be a bit too large. Let's see how it goes. Um, now, as you can see, R Studio is divided into what we call panes here, sort of like window panes. We seem to have this one pane, which has a number of tabs another pane which has a number of tabs, and this large pane here. There's actually one more pane that's missing, and to make sure we can see that, I'm going to click on File, New File, and open a new R script. So now, as we can see, there are actually four panes. Before we start thinking about these panes, though, we're going to rearrange them to make R Studio a little bit more usable. To rearrange these panes, we're going to go to Tools, okay, then Global Options, and we're going to go to the Pane Layout option there, all right? And we leave the source where it is, but we're going to change that uh, right pane to uh, the console, okay? Then for this bottom left pane, we're going to uncheck everything, uncheck all of these tabs, okay? And then we're going to basically transfer those over to the right pane. So in this bottom right pane here, we're going to have environment, history, files, plots, packages, help, that's all good, viewer and presentations. We don't really need presentations, so we're going to uncheck that, and we're going to press OK, OK, wonderful. The reason we've just done this is to make sure we have enough space for the editor or the source, which is where you're going to write code. So now we're going to click on that button there to maximize the editor, OK? And now we can get started working with RStudio properly. Now another thing to note, though, is that you can easily resize any of these panes by just dragging your cursor along the divider between the panes, as you can see there. Actually, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I think this is maybe a bit too tight. All right, let's start talking about the editor. So the editor, also called the source, is where you type out your R code. Let's go ahead and type out some random piece of R code right now. I'm going to type print in parentheses, excited for R, okay? And make sure you're following along with me so you can get that muscle memory in. So once I've typed that, I'm going to press command enter to run the code. If you're on Windows, that might be control enter. So I press here, Command Enter, and that has run the code. How do I know it ran the code? Because I can see that it sent this blue line here to the console, and the output of that code, which is the text excited for R, was printed also in the console. This number one just means that's the first line of the output that was printed, okay? We can run multiple lines of R code in the following way. I'm going to type another line, make sure you're following along with me, print and R Studio, okay, another exclamation point. Now to run these two lines, all you need to do is highlight those two lines of code by dragging your cursor, and again you can press Command Enter or Control Enter, and that will again send the code to uh, the console. 
And now we can see we have those two lines here, print excited for R and print and R studio. Wonderful. If you want to select all of the code you have written, you can use the shortcut Command A or Control A. So now I'm going to press Command A on my keyboard and that automatically selects all the code. And of course, I can run that code again by pressing Command Enter. And we've sent that code once more to the console. Very simple. Now let's see how we can pop this script window out of our studio. Sometimes you want to work on it on its own. There's a little button here that lets you pop out this window or pop out that pane rather, okay? Oh, it says that there's some mistake I need to try again. I've been blocked by Safari. So I'm going to uh, try that one more time. And now it has uh, shown me the popped out uh, RStudio editor. Sometimes that is useful for your workflow. We're going to put it back by pressing on that same uh, button, okay? Now the last thing we're going to talk about for the editor is how to save the code or the scripts that you just started writing. So to do that, of course, you can just press Command S or Control S on Windows. I press that here, and I'm going to save it with the name RStudio Intro, RStudio Intro. Okay, and I don't need that capitals there. I can save that. And if you are on a local computer, it might ask you where exactly do you want to save that file. For now, just save it anywhere that's easy to find on your computer. We'll come back later and think about what are intelligent ways to store your files. So for now, we're basically done thinking about the uh, RStudio editor. The next thing we're going to look at is the data viewer, which also comes up in this top left pane. So to trigger the data viewer, you need to try to view some data set. But we don't have any data loaded into R yet, so we're going to use one of the built-in data sets. So I'm going to type the command to view data, and it's just the word view. Notice the capital letter there uh, for the V, okay? And I'm going to view some data set which is called women, okay? And I'm going to press command enter while having my cursor again anywhere in that line, all right? I press that, and you can see this data viewer for uh, the women, the women data set, okay? This is a familiar spreadsheet view. You can sort it by clicking on these icons here. You can filter it, you can scroll through, you can search it. I'll let you play with this if you like. Pause the video and play with some of this uh, functionality to make sure you are familiar with it. For now, we're going to close that tab by clicking on the X beside women, and that will return us to our uh, regular script. Now, having done all that, we're basically done with our discussion of this top left pane of our studio. We can now proceed to thinking about the console. Now, as you have seen, the console seems to be where our code gets run. So, so far, we've been typing code into the script and sending it to the console, but you can also type code directly into the console. Let's try that right now by typing some calculation. I can type two plus two, okay? And that gets run in the console and we get the output of four. An important thing to note about the console is that if you put your cursor anywhere in the console, or rather on the bottom line of the console, and you press the up key, you can scroll through past code that you have run, okay? And to run that past code, you can again press uh, enter. In this case, you don't have to press command enter because you're in the console. You can just press enter. And as you've seen, we have rerun that view women code and we get that data set again. I'm going to close that tab one more time. So that's the basics of the console. It's where you can type out some code in a quick manner if you don't want to save it in a nice script that you want to reuse later. Now, our Studio Cloud has brought up a terminal tab and a background jobs tab. We don't need to think about that for now. We can jump directly to the environment tab. Now, like I mentioned before, the environment tab shows you objects or data sets that are stored in R. Let's import a data set from the internet to see how the environment tab works. So I'm going to copy this code here that imports the data set Ebola data from a Google Sheet, okay? And you're going to have to type this out manually. Sorry about that. It's a bit of a long URL, but I trust that you can do that. It's tinyurl.com slash Ebola hyphen data hyphen sample with the, with the uh, HTTPS as a prefix, okay? So I'm going to run that code again by putting my cursor anywhere in the line and pressing Command Enter. And after a few seconds, we're going to see Ebola data show up there in the environment. It tells us the number of observations or rows of this table and the number of variables or columns, okay? If we click on that blue arrow beside Ebola data, we can see all of the columns that are in that data set. And if you click directly on the name of the data, it will open again this familiar spreadsheet view of the data. If you like, you can take some time 
and play with that. For now, I'll close that tab, okay, and think about how can we remove this object from our workspace, from our environment. To do that is very simple. There's a nice R command called RM, which stands for remove, and we can type RM Ebola data. We can put the name of that object in these parentheses there. We can run that with command enter, and we have removed that data set from our environment. Now we can move on to the history tab. Now, as the name suggests, the history tab will show you code that you have run previously. So you can see it shows all of the code that we have previously run. If you click on a line there, you can either send that code to the console or send it to the source. Let's try sending one of those to the console. So I click to console there. And as you can see, that got sent to my console from which I can press enter to run it. Okay, if I want to send it to source, let's try that with excited for R. I send that to source, that puts it in our script. Okay, sometimes that's useful. If you want to run multiple lines of code, or if you want to highlight multiple lines of code there, you can use the shift click method. So you click on a line, then you hold shift and click on the last line that you want to select, and that will auto select everything you need. Let's imagine we wanted to send all of that to console, we can click to console there, okay? Now, shift click is generally useful for most of your computing tasks, so hopefully that will come in handy for you in many other contexts. So that's the basics of the history pane. Take some time and try to play with some of the other uh, options there, some of these buttons above. Notice that there is a search bar, okay? Because in this session, we're not being very comprehensive. We just want to show you the essentials, but it's good to take time, pause the video, and play with some of the other buttons. Let's move over now to the files pane. Now, what does the Files pane help you do? It helps you interact with your computer's file system. Here, you can create new files, delete old files, rename files, find your R scripts, and so on. Again, I'm going to let you play with some of these icons up there. If I expand that pane a little bit, then I can see what they actually stand for, okay? So take some time, pause the video. In particular, I want you to try creating a new R script, number one. Try deleting that script then try creating a new one and renaming it, okay? So again, those would be new blank file, delete and rename. Make sure you know how to use those buttons. Next, we're going to move over to the plots tab, okay? So I'm gonna click here on plots. Now, what does plots do? It shows us, of course, the plots that we've created in R. Let's create one example plot by running some code in our script. So again, I hope you're still following along with me. I'm going to type plot and then women. And I'm gonna run that code and it sends the code to our console, but there's no output in the console. Rather, the output is here in the plots tab. The plot looks a bit stupid right now because it's super compressed. So to make that look a bit more sensible, we're going to increase the size of that plots pane. And you can see the plot of the weight and the height of American women. I think that's what this data set uh, refers to. Again, I want you to take some time, pause the video, and try playing with some of those icons. In particular, you should know how to export a plot from this section. We're getting close to the end now. Let's look at the Packages tab. So I'm going to click on Packages. Now the Packages tab helps you install and load packages. What is a package? It is a collection of R code that extends the functionality of R. Now this tab here shows you any of the packages that are installed on your system, and it shows you the packages that are loaded. So packages that are loaded have this tick mark there, okay? And packages that are installed are the packages that are shown on the list. So if you want to install a new package, there's a button for you. And if you want to load a package, you can tick any of those. To use an R package, it has to be both installed and loaded. We're going to come back to this later. Do not panic. But one thing I'll mention here, though, is that usually for interacting with packages, we do not want to use this graphic user interface. Rather, we'd like to uh, play with that using code, or rather modify that using code. So let's try to do that right now. We're going to try to install the package called HighCharter, which gives us nice visualizations in R. So I'm going to type install.packages. This is the command to install a package. Then I'm going to open up some quotes, okay? And RStudio nicely auto-completes that close quote for me. And then HighCharter, okay? Make sure you're following along, please. And I'm going to press enter on that. And now we're going to see some magic happening over there in the console. RStudio is installing HighCharter along with a number of dependencies that HighCharter has. Now, don't be scared of this stuff. It looks red and it looks angry, but it's actually all good. As that's running, I'm actually going to do the next step, which is to load the package. So to, I'm going to, to do that, I'm going to type library, 
okay? Because I'm loading the package from the R library and then high charter, okay? And once this is done uh, compiling, it's almost done. Once that's done, then I'm going to load it with a library. So it's actually done, although it gives me a bunch of warning messages. <laughs> Don't be scared. We can see here there's a line that says done high charter. That means the package is installed. And we can verify that it's installed actually by making sure that it shows up in this list. So let's quickly look for high charter there. Okay, so we can see it there above HTML tools. We have high charter. Okay, and now that we've installed it, we can uh, load it. So to load it, I type library high charter and I run that. And now we can actually use some packages, or rather some functions, from the high charter package. Now that we've loaded it, we can use some functions from the high charter package. You do not yet quite know what a function is properly, but you'll see that uh, very soon. So let's go ahead and try to do uh, what I'm suggesting there, which is to use a function from the high charter package. I type high charter, I type two colons, okay? And then I can see already all the functions that are in the high charter package. But I'm, the one I'm interested in is hchart, okay, hchart. And what are we going to plot? We're going to plot the heights of the women in that women data set we, we looked at before. Women, and then the dollar sign, okay, and height, okay. Now I really feel like <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here you've never seen before. This might seem like gibberish to you. That is completely fine. All I wanted to show you is the idea that you can install a package and you can use specific components on that package of that package after you've installed it. So let's go ahead and press enter on that or command enter. And what that shows us over here is a nice uh, interactive histogram. Hopefully you know what a histogram is. If not, you can pause and Google it. It shows us a histogram of the heights of women in that data set. It's not a very useful figure. <laughs> it's just uh, for illustration, okay? And we also have a nice opportunity to look at another tab there, which is the viewer tab. The viewer tab shows you interactive documents or HTML uh, documents that you create or generate using your uh, R code. Now the last tab we're going to look at is the help tab. So we open that up and usually how you're going to interact with the help tab is by searching for documentation about certain R functions or R data sets that you are confused about. So let's try that now with this hchart thing that we use there. So to search for the help on hchart, we're going to use a question mark, question mark, and then hchart, okay? And we can run that line of code. And what it shows up us there is some documentation about what hchart does. Now a little secret, many of these help files are not always super helpful for beginners, okay? But over time, you will start to understand them a little bit more. But at the, at the moment, they might seem a bit too technical for you to understand. Okay, but now we've, we've looked at the help for the H chart. Let's look at the help for uh, the women uh, data set that we loaded, uh, that we looked at before. So I'm going to type question mark women and run that. And this is, this we can actually understand. Okay, so the women data set which we've been looking at shows the average heights and weights for American women. And uh, it's in height and pounds, okay? Sorry, it's in inches and pounds, okay? Inches for the height and pounds for the weight. Okay, so we're basically done looking at all of the tabs of our studio. That went by quickly, didn't it? So the next thing we're going to look at are some special options that will make our studio a little bit easier to use. So again, we go to tools and then global options, as we did in the beginning, and we're going to change a few things. The first thing is we're going to go to code and then uh, display. And here we're going to allow R to highlight our function calls. So let's see what that does. Highlight our function calls. If I press OK, you can see now that the functions are a slightly different color. I don't know if you can notice that. Now they're slightly blue, okay? And that's helpful to make your code a little bit more readable. And we're going to change the color of those functions in a second, actually. Let's go back to code again, display. The next thing we're going to do is check rainbow parentheses. So I'm gonna click rainbow parentheses. And what that does, is whenever you have nested parentheses in R, nested parentheses means you have one pair of parentheses and then another pair outside of it, okay? And this will happen often in R. Here it's not really necessary, it's a bit silly, but often in your R code you end up having nested parentheses. The rainbow parentheses will give the pairs different colors, and this helps you to match them and prevent any errors in the R code that you type. So we've, we've checked now the rainbow parentheses. The next thing we're going to do is allow you to change the, uh, the view of your editor. So let's go ahead and go to global options again. 
And then under code, sorry, not under code actually, under appearance, you can see a number of editor themes and you can pick any of these. Students always get very excited about these editor themes. So pause the video, take some time and scroll through them and see which of those you like best. The ones that we would recommend are the following, the crimson editor, if you want a light theme, okay? And if you want a dark theme, we would recommend the tomorrow night. Our recommendation is not based on much though, so if you prefer something else, go ahead and stick with that. So for now, we're going to try and use the Crimson Editor, okay? And press OK. And as you can see, our code has changed uh, much of its colors. The final thing we're going to do is make some changes about how R treats data sets that have been loaded into the environment. Remember that we loaded before this Ebola data into the environment, so let me load that in again. Now we're going to make some changes about how R will treat that data set. The first change we want to make, let me leave that for now, the first change we want to make is that we don't want R to remember this workspace. We don't want R to remember that this data set was loaded. We want R to forget about that data so that each time we come back and open this script, we have to re-import that data set. The reason we're doing this might not be super clear at the moment, but just do it and you'll thank us later and we'll explain it later. Why, we'll explain why we're doing this. Okay, so to do that, we're gonna to go to Global Options, and then here in General, under Workspace, we're going to uncheck Data into Workspace at Startup, so that won't restore any data you've, you've uh, loaded in. And the next thing, Save Workspace to R Data on Exit, we're going to change that from Ask to Never, okay? So those two changes will save you a lot of headache in your R career. So we press OK, and now we're done with some of the essential settings that will make our studio very usable over the next uh, few weeks. Now the last thing we're going to look at is the RStudio command palette. This is a searchable list of RStudio menu options and settings. To trigger this, we're going to type uh, command shift P, use the shortcut command shift P or on Windows control shift P. So I do that there and I have this nice searchable list of many different RStudio options. For example, if I want to create a new document, I can type new and we have all the different options for kinds of documents. If I want to rename a document, I can search rename, okay? If I want to change one of the RStudio settings, for example, the changes we just made with the workspace, I can search for workspace. And here we can see that change we just made by changing the, uh, the uh, save workspace on quit to never. You can change that directly from here. So what this is, is it gives you a quick way to access many of the RStudio options instead of having to click, click, click on those uh, menu options. So this will come in helpful for you uh, in, in quite a few cases. Okay, so basically we have now covered the essentials of the RStudio interface. There is a lot, of course, that we haven't covered. So one thing that might be helpful for you is the official RStudio cheat sheet. To find that, you can go to the following link, rstudio.com slash resources slash cheat sheets, or you could just Google search RStudio cheat sheets, and it'll bring you to this page here. If you search on the page for IDE, you can see the RStudio IDE cheat sheet, which you can download. I've already pre-downloaded that, and we can take a look at some of the stuff there. It's really a nice documentation about each of the different uh, RStudio options, how you can navigate, how you to open in a new window, save, find and replace, and so on and so forth, many of which we didn't cover in this lesson. So go ahead and browse through that file to get a bit more of a handle on the RStudio interface. So congratulations, you are now a new citizen of our studio. Of course, we've only covered the surface of the functionality of this wonderful IDE. As you advance in your R journey, you'll come to discover more and more great features. We're excited to be part of that journey with you, so I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website, where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes, and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello and welcome back. Previously, you saw how to use the RStudio development environment that makes working with R easier. In this video, we're going to jump into the nitty-gritty of the R programming language itself. So get excited and let's go. So what are we going to learn in this lesson? Here is our list of learning objectives. 
If you like, you can pause the video and read through these, but we will come back to them at the end of the lesson. For now, some quick notes. First, this is going to be an unusually long lesson, so if you like, feel free to pause the video and watch it in sections, take a break, and come back when your brain is refreshed. Secondly, I want you to really type the code along with me as I'm going. This way you'll build it into your memory much more efficiently. Thirdly, I want you to make sure that you pause the video to think as I am coding or as you are coding. Pause the video, play with the code, and make sure you really understand what is going on. And lastly, it will be important for you to watch this video several times. Because we're covering so much material, you won't get it all on the first try. So on the first time you watch it, watch it at the normal speed, but later come back and watch it again at 1.5x speed or 2x speed. Whatever video uh, player you're using, there should be an option to watch things at a fast speed. So try that and see how it goes. So now let's jump into the actual lesson. Now as usual, to get started, I'm going to open up RStudio. I've gone to rstudio.cloud and I'm going to click on this R project here, R intro. If you haven't created a project yet, just click on new project and new RStudio project. If you are on a, a local computer, you're not working on the cloud, you can just go to your applications folder and open up RStudio from there. But for now, I'm going to open up my R intro project here. And that brings me to the RStudio interface here. It seems to have restored my work from the last session, and I actually don't want that. So I'm going to click on Session here, and then Restart R to restart everything. Okay, and now my environment is empty. We also have this last script that we had worked on still open. We can leave that open, it doesn't matter. We can open a new script beside that. So I'm going to click on File here, New File, and New R Script. And now we have a new script we're going to work on. Let's also make this uh, tab a bit larger by clicking on this icon here so that we have a lot of space to write our code. And we're going to save this, uh, this file with Command S or Control S if you're on Windows. Let's save it with a name like a coding underscore basics. The first thing we're going to think about are comments. What are comments in R? There are basically two types of code you could write in R. There are commands, which is telling the computer to do anything. That's a command, so if you write two plus two, for example, and we run that with command enter or control enter, that sends this command to the console and we run that code. So that code was interpreted by the computer. If we want to type a comment instead of a command, we use the hashtag symbol or the pound symbol, this one, okay? And if we type anything after that, it's not going to be evaluated by R. So if I type two plus two after that hash, then you can see nothing ran, okay? So when you put a hash, that turns something into a comment. Comments are useful for humans to read. They're not useful for the computer. They're useful for yourself when you look at the script later on or for your collaborators so they can understand what you did. So generally, when you're writing a comment, you write the comment either above the relevant piece of code. For example, here we can say, the code below adds two numbers, okay? Or you can write the comment on the same line, but after the relevant piece of code. So we could write, this code adds two numbers. So those are the two main ways that you're going to use comments. Now, you should always try to comment your code so that it's clear what your code is doing. Like your mother always says, too much of everything is bad, except our comments. So throughout this tutorial, I'm going to give you short practice questions that I want you to pause and try on your own. I'm going to paste the first one here. It's a very easy question to start with. It says, answer true or false. Both code chunks below are valid ways to comment your code. So here we have this first one and that second one. Is it true or false that these are both valid ways to comment your code? So pause the video, think about it. If you like, you can actually type the question text into your script. And at the end of the video or in a text below the video, I will put all the answers to the questions. So one very nice use of comments is to create section headers. If you type a comment, say something like section one, and then four dashes, one, two, three, four, you get this icon beside the comment, which you can click to fold or unfold that section of code. We actually have this for the question one there, so I'm going to click on that button right beside Q1, and as you can see, it folds that section of code. We can click on it again to unfold that section. That's the first beautiful thing about these section headers. The other nice thing is that there's an icon at the top right of your editor, which opens up a document outline. If I click on that, I see a document outline, and I can click on each of those sections to navigate to them. 
So this will be very helpful for you when you are working on long scripts and you want to jump through different sections. But for now, we're going to close that outline and think about using R as a calculator. So I'm going to type in a new section, R as a calculator. So R can do the basic things you would expect a calculator to be able to do. You can do 2 plus 2, for example, and you can see it shows 4 there at the console. You can do 2 minus 2, of course, 2 minus 2. We can do 2 times 2. To do times, you use the asterisk, okay, 2 times 2. How about divided? 2 slash 2, that's the same thing as 2 divided by 2, okay? Um, how about raised to the power of? You can do 2 raised to the power of 2 using the caret symbol there. Okay. Now, as you can see, in some of these, I have a space between the operators. In others, I don't have a space. It's really up to you how you do that. An important thing to note is that, like any good calculator, R follows the expected order of operations. So, for example, if I type the following code, 2 plus 2 times 2, pause the video and think about what will be the answer to this. So, if I run this, as you can see, the answer is 6. Why? Because the multiplication is evaluated before the plus. So you have 2 times 2, 4, 4 plus 2 is 6. Now we can also do simple mathematical operations or transformations. For example, SQRT stands for square root, and I can do 100. Square root of 100 is 10. Now this thing, SQRT here, is what's called an R function, where 100 is an argument to that function. We're going to talk a lot about functions later on. Now here's another question for you. I'm going to paste it in. It says, in the following expression, which sign is evaluated first by R, the minus or the division, the minus or the division? And what is the expected answer to that? Pause the video and try it. Now let's spend a minute thinking about code formatting, specifically the use of spaces. So I'm going to copy this and paste that, and let's call this uh, formatting code, formatting code. The main thing I want to talk about is the use of spaces. So if you type something like a 2 plus 2, Okay, that evaluates to 4, but like I said before, you can put spaces between the operators there, and that has the same effect. If you do 2 and then lots of spaces and then another big chunk of space, that's exactly the same thing. So the way you choose to space out your code is completely up to you. Let's look at another example with the square root function. So we had SQRT and then we had 100. You can type it like that, or you could do SQRT and then a space, and then 100, okay? The, the, the way you really should do it is this one, okay? I'm just showing you that you can space it out however you like. Or you can do something like SQRT, and then open parentheses, and then you press an enter, and you put the 100 there, and you run that code. And again, it's the same thing as this first one. You can see we get our nice result there of 10. Now, of course, there are sensible and nonsensical ways to space out your R code. As a beginner, you may not have good intuitions for these, so you can use a little trick you can highlight any code you want to uh, format nicely. Here I'm just going to highlight my whole section of code with a command A. And go to this option in RStudio, code, and then reformat code, okay? And it reformats the code in the way that it deems appropriate. So as you can see, it has gotten rid of all the spaces in my square roots, okay? And it added some spaces there as well. So you can always reformat your code that way. Now at this point, I want to pause and acknowledge a common problem that students run into when they're running code. So imagine I'm trying to find the square root of 100 and I type SQRT and then uh, open parentheses and 100 and for some reason I don't have that closing parentheses there. Okay, let's put in some space, all right? And I try to run this line of code. Let's try to run that line of code. Now look what I have in my console. Instead of the usual um, arrow like that, we have this plus sign. What that plus sign means is that R is waiting for some additional code to wrap up that command. That means that, for example, let's go to the console and press enter. Each time I press enter, I just get another plus. R is still waiting for me to complete that command. If I type something like uh, some random command, like if I want to print um, hello, okay, and I type that, it's going to give me an error because what this is, is turning out to, what this is evaluating to is SQRT 100 print hello, which is invalid code. So if I run that, it tells me there's a problem. Okay? So whenever you see that plus sign, that annoying plus sign here in the console, it means you've run some incomplete section of code. And how do you get rid of that plus? So to get rid of that plus, you can press escape while you are in the uh, console. So I press escape and I get rid of that plus, and now I'm ready to type in a new line of code. But in this case, as you can see, RStudio has actually highlighted that there's a problem with that line of code. 
So if I hover over it, it says unmatched opening bracket. That's a wonderful piece of information there. So I can close the bracket there, and then I wouldn't have the problem with the annoying plus. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is objects in R, specifically creating objects in R. So let's make a new section and call it a creating objects in R. Now what exactly is an object? When we run code the way we've been doing in the past, the code just gets shown, the output of the code just gets printed on the console. We don't actually store it anywhere. But most of the time when you're doing data analysis, you're going to want to store the things that you create. To do that, you need to assign the values of those things into objects. Let's look at an example. We're going to try to create an object called my obj, my obj, underscore obj, okay? And I'm going to type the assignment operator. What is the assignment operator? It's a less than and then a minus, less than and minus. And I'm going to assign to it the value two plus two. And I can run that line of code. And it shows me that the code has been run there. And it shows me in the environment that I have a new object, which I called here my obj. Now this assignment operator, we're going to type it many, many times in your R career. So rather than typing less than minus every time, you want to use the shortcut. On Mac, the shortcut is option minus. On Windows, I think it is alt minus, okay? So you type option minus and you get that assignment operator. Let's type two plus two again. Let's run it again, just for good measure. So this is one way you can create an object in R. There is another symbol you can use, and that's the equal to sign to create an object. So let's say we want to create an object called, I don't know, another one, okay? And we can type another one equals to maybe three plus three. And we run that, we can see now we have another one there as six. So you shouldn't actually use the equals to sign though. You should use this assignment operator. Now it might seem a bit annoying given that this is much easier to type. For historical reasons, mostly, our programmers prefer to use this one. There are some other good reasons why we prefer to use this one, but it's mostly historical reasons. So we would recommend you stick to the assignment operator. Don't use equals to for assignments. So I'm actually going to delete that line so you do not remember it. Now in order to really drive home the idea of objects, let's consider an analogy. When you type code like this, two plus two assigned to my obj, or actually let's change it to 20 assigned to my obj, what you're doing there is you're creating a kind of named bucket. So here, when you do 20 assigned to my obj, you're saying, get me some bucket and call it my obj, and put the value 20 inside of it. Put the number 20, it reads here, inside an object called my obj. Does that make sense? It's a named bucket, and that means if we want to access the value 20 later on, we don't need to think about what's inside of it. We can just pull that name, and that allows us to get access to what is inside that bucket. If we consider another example, we can create an object called something like first name and assign to it the value Joanna. So I'm going to put Joanna there and notice the quotes. When I do that, it shows, me, it shows me that in my environment. But by analogy, what we're doing again is the following. We're taking the value Joanna, we're putting it inside an object called first name which means whenever we want to access that first name, we don't have to get Joanna anymore, we can just pull this object from the R environment. Let's consider one last example. Again, that two plus two that we wrote, let's write it again actually. So my obj, and we're gonna overwrite the old my obj actually, two plus two, all right, so we can see we've overwritten it there. What we have done there is not exactly similar to this, but a bit different, why? Because we added these two numbers, and it's not literally two plus two that's stored in my obj, it's the result of two plus two that's stored in my obj. So what I wanna explain there is that in this case, the code is getting evaluated first. So it says evaluate two plus two, and then store the result of that evaluation, which is four, in the object called my obj. Hopefully that makes sense. The code always gets evaluated before it gets stored inside of your object which we're thinking of in these cases as named buckets. Now keeping all that in mind, here is a practice question for you I'm going to paste in. I want you to pause the video and think about this. Consider the code below, uh, two plus two plus two assigned to result. Now answer for me this question. What is the value of the result object that we've created? What is the value of this thing? Is it two plus two plus two? Is it numeric or is it six? Pause and think about it. Now let's jump to a new section which I'm going to call data sets are objects too. Let's triple click here so I can highlight that. And then I'm going to change the name to data sets 
our objects to. Whoops, objects to. Okay, and let's put an exclamation point there. Why do I put an exclamation point? It's because I know you might be getting a bit frustrated. You might be asking, why are we spending all this time talking about this simple primary school math stuff? Isn't this supposed to be a data analysis class? Well, I want you to be a bit patient, okay? The reason we're spending time thinking about these objects in this very uh, elementary way is because when we start working with data sets, they will also be stored as our objects and they will be subject to the same principles that we are discussing. Let's look at an example of that uh, right now. So I'm going to import a new data set into R, the same one we imported in the last lesson, actually. So I paste in this code. Whoops, that's the wrong code. This one here, okay? It's called Ebola Sierra Leone data. And I have the assignment operator, read.csv, https blah, 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 tinyurl.com slash Ebola hyphen data hyphen sample. Sorry that you have to type all of that out. Now, if I run that line of code, I'm going to import this data set that I stored on Google Drive on the internet. And as you can see, it shows up here also as an object. Hopefully you remember this from the last session. A beautiful thing about this object setup is that you can work with many data sets at the same time in R. In some other data analysis software, you're stuck working on one data set at a time. In this case, you can work on many at the same time. So now I'm going to import another data set from the web, okay? And I paste in this code here. This is a data set uh, on a diabetes in China. So you type this code, read.csv, blah, 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 diabetes hyphen China. Pause and type that up. And I run that code. And that data set has now been imported. So we have two data sets at the same time in our R memory or in the uh, environment. If you want to see what's inside of these objects, you can just send them to the console. I can take this line of code, let's paste it there, and press a command enter. And we've sent that to the console, and so the output of that object actually prints in the console. Let's make that a bit larger. Uh, it's a bit hard to see. Let's run that one more time. Okay, now we can see the t tabular looking uh, thing in the console. And we can do the same thing for the diabetes data set. Let's run that here. But the diabetes data set is really quite large, so it's easier to view it in the data viewer. Hopefully you remember how to open that. You type V-I-E-W. Here I'm typing it into the console as opposed to into the script because I don't need it for later. Okay, so view diabetes China. Okay, and I can see what that data set looks like in this uh, data viewer. I can close that tab for now or I can just click back to our script. So in summary, when you work with the data set in R, you are storing it as an object in the R environment or in your R workspace. And therefore, the things we're going to say about objects apply to the data sets you're going to be working with in R. Now, what happens if you want to rename an object? So I'm going to create a new section and call it object renaming or rename an object. Rename, rename an object. So there's actually no direct way to rename an object. To rename an object, you need to copy the contents of that object into a differently named object and delete the old one. What does that mean? So let's say we want to rename Ebola Sierra Leone data because we decide it's a bit too long. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to type Ebola data. That's going to be our new name. Then the assignment op operator. Then that old name there. And we run that line of code. And what we have done here is we have copied the contents in this bucket, this object, into that bucket. Okay, that new object. And now we need to get rid of this old one so that we only have the new one. So to get rid of the old one, we type RM. Okay, and inside of that those parentheses there, we can put, we can copy and paste that, uh, that object, and we run that line of code. And as you can see now, if we look at our environment, instead of Ebola Sierra Leone data, we now have Ebola data. So we copy the contents from here into here, and then we got rid of that one. And in doing so, we have effectively renamed our object. It's quite painful, but that's the way you do it. Now, what about when you want to overwrite the contents of an object? That is, you want to replace what's inside of the bucket. So let's create a new section and call it overwrites an object. It's really quite simple. Let's look at an example. Remember we had run this code up here that's assigned Joanna to the object first name. Okay, let's rerun that just to remember. Okay, now let's say we want to replace or overwrite this object first name with a new name because we're, we've changed our name or something. <laughs> so we're just going to write a new line of code and put in a new name. Let's say Luigi, for example. And if I run that, notice what's going to happen in the environment. In the environment, we're going to change the value from Joanna to Luigi. So we have overwritten the contents of this object. We have gotten rid of the content of the bucket and replaced it with some new content. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is how to work with objects. So I'm going to make a new section called working with objects. This will be a short section. Okay. Now, you can run simple commands on objects. For example, let's say I wanted to uh, take the square root of a number. 
instead of taking the square root of a number directly, I could assign that number to some object, for example, my number there. I run that line of code, and I could take the square root of my number, okay? And that gives us the expected value there of 10. Hopefully that makes sense to you. R sees the object my number as the value 10, and therefore is able to evaluate its square root. You could also do something like add my number to itself. So I could take my number and add it to my number. I'm pasting that there. And let's assign that to a new object called my sum. Okay. And so what have we done there? If we look in our environment, we can see the value of my sum there is 200. Why? Because I've taken my number, which represents 100, plus my number 100, assigned it to a new object, my sum, which is therefore 200. Now, one small side note, if you want to see the value of an object without looking at your environment, one thing you can do is you can highlight the uh, relevant piece of code in your script, in your editor, and from there press Command Enter or Control Enter on Windows. Okay, and what that does is it sends that object to the console and prints out its output. But of course, most of your data analysis will not involve small objects like this. Rather, you'll be working with uh, data objects, such as the Ebola data object we looked at before. So let's pull that down and see what sort of things can we do to this object. I'm going to press Command Enter to send it to my console so I can view it here. Okay, then I scroll up. And let's just take a look at some of the variables there. Pause and, and examine this data set so you understand what it's showing. What I'm going to try to do is make a small table that shows the distribution of the patients by sex, by that sex column there. So to do that, I'm going to type the following. Just type along with me. Table, the table function, then Ebola data. Okay, we can press enter with the autocomplete there. And then uh, the dollar sign, the dollar sign will let us see the different um, columns in that data set. And then the one I care about here is sex, so I press enter on that. And we have there our nice table of the distribution of genders. You have 124 women and 76 men. That's just a small preview of what it looks like to work with data sets in R, to work with data objects. We're going to come back to this info in a later lesson. For now, try out this practice question that I'm going to paste in. Okay, so this is a two-part question. In the first uh, part, I want you to consider this code below and think about what is the value of the answer object that is defined here. Just look at the code and see if you can figure it out. And then you can actually type out the code and, and run it. It should be fairly easy for you. I just want to make sure you understand the concept of objects. In the next uh, question, I want you to use the table function to make a table with the distribution of patients across districts in the uh, Ebola data object. So similar to what I've done here, I just want you to do that for the uh, districts. Now the next thing we're going to look at is a common errors with objects. So I'm going to make a new section in my script and call it errors with objects. Errors with objects. The first type of error concerns when you try to do things that are inappropriate to your objects. That's a bit of a weird sentence. Let's see an example. Imagine that I have a, an object first name and I give that the value Luigi, okay? And I have another object last name with the value Fenway, Fenway. And let's run those two lines of code, okay? So now I have those two, two objects, a uh, first name and last name. And what if I try to add them? So I try to do first name plus last name. What do you expect will happen? Well, if I run that, as you can see, we have an error message. It says, error in first name, last name, non-numeric arguments to binary operator. That might sound like gibberish to you, although the word non-numeric there should give it away. It means basically that we're trying to add two things that are not numbers, two things that are non-numeric. So in this case, the way you would actually uh, combine those two strings is you would type paste and then first name, first name, comma, last name, and you can do that, all right? So in this case, it's quite obvious what happened, why this plus generated a, a problem, but in, in the future, when you're actually writing real analysis scripts, you might have defined an object further up in your script, and you, you won't keep a, a good track of its value, you won't remember its value very well, and so it won't be this obvious. This is a bit of a silly example, but it's just to demonstrate that specific kind of error. For now, we're going to comment out this line so that our code doesn't generate an error. Generally, you shouldn't save a script that generates an error. That's a bad idea. Now, let's look at another kind of error, which concerns a case sensitivity. So you might do something like this. You might create a variable my number, and let's assign to it the value 48. And I use the term there, variable, uh, instead of object, 
I should have pointed out that objects and variables in R are really uh, synonyms, okay? So you might hear them used uh, in the same context. Okay, so imagine now I try to take that object or that variable and do something to it. So I type my number plus two. If I run this line of code, what do you think is going to happen? Let's, let's see. So I run that line and it says object my number not found. Pause the video and see if you can figure out what went wrong there. If you're paying attention, you should notice that here I have a small m and there I have a big m, okay? And R is case sensitive like most other programming languages. So this and this are not equivalent and therefore R cannot find uh, that my number. So I need to change this to the lowercase my number and then it should work. Now these kinds of errors are the sorts of things you're going to run into fairly frequently at the beginning of your programming career, unfortunately. So you need to become familiar with them and comfortable with them. Now, one thing you should learn how to do is to take, uh, take your error message like that, maybe without this part, without this part that's specific to you, this first name, last name business, just grab that bit, non-numeric argument to binary operator, and put that in Google uh, or your favorite search engine and see what comes up. You'll often see other people run into the same error. The reason we remove this first name, last name business is that that is specific to your own data analysis. So other people's error message won't have that, okay? Later on, we're going to talk about the wonderful forum Stack Overflow and how to post questions there and get answers from the R developer community. For now, let's look at uh, some problems for you, some practice questions for you. So I'm going to paste a couple of practice questions, two practice questions, all right? And if you're paying attention, these should be really quite easy. The first one says uh, that the code below here returns an error. Why does it do that? So read through it and think about why it returns an error. The second one says the code below also returns an error. Again, it's asking why does it return an error? So pause the video, think through these. You can jot down your thinking in your script. Now the next thing we're going to look at is naming objects. How should you name your object? So let's make a new section and call it naming objects, okay? And I'm gonna paste in this quote from someone called Phil Carlton. I didn't pronounce that right, Phil Carlton. It says, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and uh, naming things. I don't know what cache invalidation is, but I know that naming things is hard. Why is naming things hard? Well, because you want your names generally to be both short, so that they're easy to type, but also informative, so that people can, just by reading the name of your object, for example, this one, they can know what is probably stored inside of that object. So for example, some object like, uh, if we take the, the Ebola data that we imported, if we had imported that and given it some name like um, Ebola data from 2014 outbreak um, in West Africa, that would not be such a great name because it takes too long to type. Although with a code completion, uh, with RStudio, this is not actually that painful to type. But in general, your name should be a little bit shorter than that, but they shouldn't be so short that they're meaningless. Like if you, if you imported this data set and you called it just D, that wouldn't be a very helpful uh, name because it doesn't give a sense of what is inside of that object. So as you uh, read other people's code and as you write your own code, you'll get good intuitions for what uh, good names look like. Now for compound names, those are names with more than one word, there are some common conventions that you will see. The first is called a snake case. So with snake case, you write in all lowercase and you divide, it, uh, you divide the words up with an underscore there, and that's what we've been using so far. Um, so let's just say snake case uses all lowercase with an underscore, and we can define that object or that variable just so you can remember it. Then the other uh, common case is period case. So you, you use a period instead of a, an underscore to separate the words, okay? So uses all lowercase with a period. And then the last common case you might see something called camel case, camel case. It's named after the back of a camel. Now what you have with camel case is that every uh, second word, so you don't capitalize the first word, but every word after that you capitalize the first uh, letter. So I can write camel case capitalizes new words. So those are the three main ways that you're going to uh, name variables that have more than one word in them. Now let's look at some things that you actually cannot name your objects. It just doesn't work. So one thing you can't do is you can't start your object name with a number. So if you try to do something like this, define an object 2014 data and store in it the value 2, if we try to run that, it says unexpected input in 2014. 
So that doesn't work, but I can actually pull that number and put it after the data, okay, and define it that way, and that actually does work. So you just have to always start uh, with a letter. And the other thing is that object names can only contain letters, underscores, periods, and numbers, and nothing else. So if, for instance, you try to define an object like data-2014, sorry, data-2014, and try to define that as the value 2, it'll give us an error, okay? We don't need to figure out what the error means. It just, it just says this doesn't work. Or if you try to do something like data um, exclamation mark 2014, that will also not work, okay? And of course, you can't have spaces in your name. So if we try to do data space 2014, that is not a valid name. Now, there is a small secret, though, that you can use to rescue all of these names. If you really want to name your objects these weird things, you could use backticks. So you might need to Google to figure out where exactly a backtick is on your keyboard. But in my case, it is beside the Z uh, letter. So I can put those backticks there, and then I can actually define that new object, okay? So there you can see data hyphen, uh, sorry, data exclamation mark 2014. And I can do the same thing with the space, okay? But generally, you should avoid uh, doing this. It's not very useful. When it might come in useful is when you have um, columns that come in uh, with your data, and those columns have spaces in them, and you want to refer to those columns. But we'll see that later on. Let's go ahead and try a small practice question. I'm going to paste in this practice question here, okay? And it says, in the code below, we are attempting to take the top 20 rows of the Ebola data table with this head function here. You don't need to know what the head function is. Just concern yourself with this part here. It says, all but one of these lines has an error. Which line will run properly? So two of the lines have an error, and only one line will run properly. See if you can figure out which line is going to run properly. For now, I'm going to comment out those lines of code so they don't generate any errors in my script. Now, that's something I may have not mentioned yet, actually, is how do you comment out code? So you can just highlight the code and uh, press Command-Shift-C if you are on a Mac or Control-Shift-C if you're on Windows, and that will put your hashtag there and comment out the lines of code. And with that, we are finally done with our discussion of objects. So now we're going to move to the other main citizen of R, which is a function. So, so far we've been mostly talking about objects. Let's think now about functions. So I'm going to start a new section and call it uh, functions. Now most of your work in R is going to involve calling functions. So what exactly are these functions? Let's consider this visual analogy here. We can think of a function as a named piece of code that does something to its input. So you have this function, it contains some code. Who wrote that code? Maybe you wrote that code, you created your own function. Or someone else who wrote a package in R wrote that code, they created that function. But in any case, that function is going to take some input, or what we call in R, arguments, and manipulate it somehow, and give you some outputs. And so far, you've already seen quite a few functions. So let's go back to our script to remind you of the functions that you've seen. You've seen something like square root, okay? Square root of 100. And we remember that that gives us 10 there. Let's expand our console a little bit. I think we've also seen the paste function. So I can do something like this, paste, and then I am number, and then let's say 2 plus 2. And I think I'm missing a comma there. Okay, so the paste function uh, takes these two arguments and pastes them together. Or you've seen a function like plot, actually. So if I tried to plot, for example, the women data set, which we saw in a previous lesson, then I can see the plot uh, out there. So you already kind of have a good idea of what functions are. But let's formalize our discussion of functions. Specifically, let's talk about uh, function syntax. So I'm going to make a new section here and call it basic function syntax. And I hope you're still following along with me. So the standard way to call a function is to provide a value for each argument in a function. To understand, let's, let's type up some, uh, some pseudocode here. So the general thing you're going to do is you're going to type the name of the function, function name, then a pair of parentheses, and then you're going to have some argument, argument one, equals to some value, value, comma, argument two, equals to some value, okay? And that's the general form of most functions you're going to call. Let me comment that out since that's not real code. And let's look at a real code example. But let's make a bit more space right now for our script. The concrete example we're going to use here is the head function. What does the head function do? It takes the first few elements of any object that you pass to it. So I'm going to type head. 
And the first argument for head is x. x just stands for whatever object that you want to take the first few elements of. In our case, let's take the first few elements of the Ebola data object. That's going to be the first few rows of Ebola data. And the second important argument is called n. n basically stands for the number of things that you want to take. So if we want to take the first five rows, we do n equals five. If we want the first three rows, we do n equals three. So now I'm going to run that line of code and let's see the output. Let's expand our console a little bit so we can see the output a bit better, all right? We can see that it gives us the first three rows of that data set. Head x equals Ebola, n equals three. Now you can actually switch the order of those arguments. Let's, let's scroll down a bit so we can put this uh, code in the middle of our screen. So head, okay head, and then we can type n equals 3, and then x equals Ebola data, okay? And that should give us the exact same output. So the first three rows of the Ebola data set. Now by default, the first argument in the head function is this x, is this thing you want to take the head of, and the second argument is the n. Because of that default, we can actually skip writing the uh, name of the argument. So instead of writing head x equals Ebola n equals 3, we could write head Ebola data comma 3. And that's the exact same thing. So if we run that, we also get the top three rows. But if you try to do that in this order with n equals 3 x Ebola data, you get rid of the, the name of the argument, then you're going to get an error. Because what this is telling R is get me for the three objects, get me the top Ebola data rows, which obviously does not make any sense. Now, how do you figure out the correct order of the arguments? You can simply consult the help of that function. So if I do question mark head, then I can see the help for this function. And we can see here, for example, that it goes x then n, okay? Or if we scroll down a bit, we can see the arguments x is an object and n is an integer. So this gives you the order of the arguments. And it can tell you whether or not you can do something like this three Ebola data. It explains basically why this does not work. So because that line does not work, I'm going to comment it out. Okay, and I'll also comment out this uh, question mark thing there. Now, an important thing is that some uh, functions have default values. Sorry, what I mean is some arguments have default values. So the default value for the n argument is actually six. What that means is if I run something like this, head x Ebola data, and then no n argument, okay, then I return the top six rows because the default value of n is six. And you can see that default value again in that help file. So if I look here, you can see here in this, in this line here that it goes head x n equals 6L. 6L, L is just a symbol for uh, integers in R. We'll come back to that later on. But basically, this is telling you that the default value of n is 6. And I'm going to ask you a small question, or a question 7 here out of 10. So the question is, in the code lines below, we are attempting to uh, take the top six rows of the women data set, which is built into R. Which line is invalid? One of these lines is invalid and will not do what we want it to. Pause the video and see if you can figure that out. Now the last thing we're going to talk about with functions is the concept of function nesting. So let's make a section and call it a function nesting. Whoops, function nesting. And we're going to expand a bit our console since we uh, reduced it too much, okay? Now what is function nesting? Function nesting is basically when you take the output of one function, or rather you take one function and put it inside of another function. Not necessarily the output of the function, but the function itself. So what does that mean? Let's, let's see an example. So I introduce you now to a function called toLower. What does toLower do? Let's see what it does. I'm going to type toLower Luigi. Make sure you're typing along with me. And as you can imagine, this is going to convert Luigi uppercase, whoops, why is it giving me those warning messages? You can ignore those. Luigi uppercase to uh, lowercase there. So it converts uppercase to lowercase. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to nest this code or nest this function inside of another function. So I'm going to type the following paste, okay? My name is, and then I'm going to get this stuff here and put that after the comma. And as you can imagine, when I run this or when you run that, you're going to get the, the uh, output, my name is Luigi. So what we have done is we have nested this function inside of that larger function. 
And because we have rainbow parentheses turned on, you can easily see the matching brackets. You can easily see which parentheses closes which other one. So we have the orangish parentheses in there, and then you have the pinkish ones outside. Now the alternative to function nesting in this case would have been to assign an intermediate variable or an intermediate object. So I could have done something like this, to lower Luigi, and then assign that to an object called, say, like my lowercase name, my lowercase name. Okay, so I could run that. And then now my lowercase name has the value, whoops, my lowercase name has the value Luigi. Okay, so I can then do paste, I copy and paste that. And instead of to lower Luigi inside of there, instead of the function nesting, I could put this object there, put that value there. Okay, so hopefully you see the similarity between this and this. Here I took the function itself and I nested it, but here I pre-assigned an intermediate variable and I put that in there. Function nesting and the assignment of intermediate variables are going to become very important in the rest of the uh, data analysis you're going to be doing with R. So now I have another practice problem for you. I'm going to paste that in there. Okay, now let's expand our script. So question eight says, the code lines below are all examples of function nesting but one of those lines has an error. Which line is it and what is the error? So pause the video and read through those and see if you can figure out what the error is. And of course you should really just type out the code and see if you can identify the error that way. So now we've talked about comments, we've talked about objects, we've talked about functions. Let's now talk about packages, which I already introduced you to in the last lesson. So I'm going to make a new section in my code and call it packages, okay, packages. And let's go ahead and install a new package. Hopefully you remember how to install packages. We have the function here install.packages, okay, and I'm going to install specifically the table one package. So I run that code and let's expand our console to see what's happening. And now once that's done installing, you actually want to comment out this code from your script so that R doesn't install the package every time you run the script. So we'll comment this out, or you could just delete it, but I'll comment it out. And now we need to use the library command or the library function to actually load the package. So we type library, okay, table one. And what that'll let us do is actually use the functions from the package. The function from table one we're going to use is called create table one, create table one, okay? And we're going to use the data argument in uh, this function, data equals, we're going to use our Ebola data object, so Ebola data. If we run that, we can see the nice output there. Okay, it looks a bit scary, but if we go to the top, it should become clear what we have. We have basically a, a table that describes the sample. So we have the number of people in the sample, n equals 100. We have the mean ID, that's actually meaningless because ID is not a, uh, it's not a useful variable. We have the mean age, we have the sex uh, breakdown. You can see that uh, we have 38% uh, of them are men and so on. So if you're publishing a paper or you're working in academia, this is the type of table that you usually put at the start of your paper. And you can do that with a single function there, create table one. Of course, this table is not fully ready for publishing yet. You need to get rid of this date variable there, and maybe you need to get rid of that ID. But as you can see, it's fairly simple to get that fairly complex piece of data analysis. So the point of showing you this here is to show you how rich R is. There are tens of thousands of R packages being developed by thousands of different developers, and many of these packages could be helpful to your data analysis. Now, how do you learn about R packages? You can just Google top 20 R packages or something like that. Another good place to find nice R packages is on Twitter. If you follow the RStats hashtag, you'll usually run into some cool packages, so I really recommend that. Now let's talk about what I call full signifiers. So full signifiers for, uh, for functions. So generally, you can just write a uh, function name like this, create table one, blah, 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 blah. But sometimes it is helpful or useful to put the name of the package before you put uh, the name of the function. So you could write this table one and then two colons, two colons, all right? And you can run that line of code and it does the same thing. I don't know why it keeps giving me this error message, <laughs> which I don't care too much about. So this line of code has the same effect as doing that. There's two important differences though. One is this is more explicit, and so it's very easy for someone to know where you got a function from if you type this out. So sometimes uh, you see other developers write code like this. The other reason is that if you do this, you actually don't have to use the uh, library line in your code. 
because this is telling R exactly where to get that function. So you don't have to pull this thing out of the library first. This pulls it out of the library, okay? So now here's a second to last question for you to answer. It concerns packages, okay? So here I say, consider this code below, okay? Which of the following is the correct interpretation of what that code means? Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. This is just a test of your understanding of R lingo. And now the last thing I'm going to talk about with packages is the package called uh, Pacman. Okay, so let's make a new section in our code and call it Pacman. Pacman stands for Package Manager. It is a package that helps you manage other packages. So let's first go ahead and install that package. Instead of running the code from our script, I'm going to type it in here actually in the console. Install.packages uh, Pacman, and we need the quotes there. And once that's done installing, I can load library pacman. Actually, I'm not going to load library pacman. I'm going to use the full signifier uh, that we just learned about. So I'm going to do pacman a colon colon and then pload. There's a function from pacman called pload. Now, what does pload do? Pload is the power horse or the workhorse of the pacman package. What it does is, if you give it any package, for example, we're going to try now the outbreaks package it is going to do the following. It's going to check whether that package is available on a user's computer. If it's not available, it will install that package by running install.packages in the background. But if it's available, then it won't do that install. And then once it has installed it, it will load the package. So it both installs, if not yet available, and then loads. So as you can imagine, this saves you quite a bit of work or quite a bit of code. So if we run this now, it's going to install the outbreaks package, okay, and it's also going to load it. So doing this is equivalent, therefore, to doing install.packages, okay, outbreaks, whoops, outbreaks, and then library outbreaks, okay? And as you can imagine, if you have many packages to install slash load, you might have to write this line many times. But with Pacman, you can just put a comma there. Let's get rid of this. Put a comma and type the name of some other package that you care about. For example, let's imagine we want to make sure we've loaded table one, so we could do that, we could run that. And because both these packages have already been installed, when I run this line of code, nothing is happening, okay? Because Pacman is intelligent and has figured out that I don't need to install those packages. So Pacman is really what you should use when you are uh, installing packages and loading them in R. This is what we definitely recommend. There is one small extra devilish detail though. Imagine that I sent just this line of code in a script to someone, okay? This should work for them if they already have Pacman installed. If they don't have Pacman installed though, then we need some way of telling their system or telling R to install Pacman for that person. And we can't use Pacman pload because Pacman is not yet installed. So there's a line of code that I'm gonna paste in. You don't have to understand the code for now. You can just copy and paste it into your scripts. So let me paste that in, okay? And now I'll actually read the code. It says, if do not require Pacman, install .packages Pacman. It's basically checking, if Pacman doesn't exist on this person's computer, install it. And once Pacman now is installed, then I can use this to handle all my other packages. So in general, this is the piece of code you should put at the start of every analysis script to make sure that the necessary packages are installed and loaded on a user's computer. And now I have one final question for you. It's a bit of a tautological question. Basically, it's what I just said. I just want to make sure you're still listening because we have gone through a lot, okay? So what is this question? It says, at the start of an R script, we would like you to install and load the package janitor. For example, hypothetically, which of the following code chunks do we recommend you should have in your script? So which of those, based on what I've just said so far, which of these is what we recommend for making sure that uh, the package janitor is installed and loaded Pause the video, think about it, and write some notes in your script. So here are the objectives that we had set out at the beginning of the lesson. Let's see if you have achieved them. We wanted you to be able to write comments in R. Can you do that? We wanted you to be able to create section headers in R slash R studio, okay? Now you should hopefully know how to use R as a calculator. Now you should understand how to create, overwrite, and manipulate our objects. You should also understand the basic rules for naming our objects. Hopefully you remember that. You should also understand the syntax for calling our functions. How do you use our functions and our arguments? 
Next, you should know how to nest multiple functions, and you should also understand the idea of assigning intermediate objects. And finally, by now, you should be able to install and load add-on R packages and call functions from these packages. If you don't feel like you've grasped all of these, try watching the video once more, maybe at a faster speed, 1.2x or 1.5x, and see how that goes. But also, you don't have to understand it 100%, because we're going to re-encounter these topics as we move on to actual data analysis lessons. So with your new knowledge of our objects, our functions, and the packages that those functions come from, you are ready, believe it or not, to do some basic data analysis in R. We're going to jump into that headfirst in the next lesson, so I will see you there. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website, where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello and welcome back. Now that you understand the basics of R, you are ready, believe it or not, to get started with real data analysis. We're going to jump in headfirst in this lesson, so let's get started. What are we going to cover in this lesson? Well, here's the list of learning objectives. If you want, you can pause the video and look through, but we're going to come back to these at the end of the lesson. For now, I'm going to make some quick points. I also made these points in the last lesson, but they apply to this lesson. This is going to be another of those unusually long lessons. So I want you to feel free to watch this in sections. Usually we like short lessons, but I think at the beginning of your programming career, it's sometimes nice to have these big nuggets so you can capture a lot of information at the same time. But again, feel free to watch this in sections, take a break, and come back when you feel refreshed. Secondly, I want you to make sure you're typing along with me. This is going to be a follow-along tutorial. Next, I want you to make sure you're pausing often to think about the code and really play with it. And finally, I want you to consider this a resource that you can come back to and watch again, because it will be hard to get it all in the first try. So as usual, the first thing to do is, of course, open RStudio. If you are working with RStudio Cloud, you can, of course, go to rstudio.cloud and it should bring you to your workspace here. If you haven't yet created a project, you can create one using that button over there for a new project. If you already have your project, you can just click on it to open it. If you are working locally on your computer, then you, of course, should go to the Applications folder and open our studio from there. But here I'm working on the cloud. So I've opened up my project. I can see that it has loaded some of the stuff that I had from before. I don't want that. So I'm going to go ahead and restart the session. I'm going to click on Session here, and then Restart R, and that should clear my environment. Okay, if it doesn't clear your environment, it means you forgot to make one of the uh, changes we had suggested before, which is going to Tools, and then Global Options, and then unchecking this option for Restore.R Data into Workspace. You want to uncheck that, and you also want to set this to Never. That way, whenever you restart R, you have a clear environment. So make sure you did that, okay? So now I've cleared my environment, and I can also close some of these uh, open tabs so that it's a bit uh, easier to work. Okay, these are from the previous lesson. I don't need to save that. Okay, and now I'm going to open up a new script. So let's go ahead and click File, New File, R Script. Okay, of course, you could also use this option here, or you could use the, uh, the shortcut. All right, and then let's also make this tab a bit bigger, or this pane, so that we can really see what we're doing. And now we can save this script. We're going to save it with the name uh, Ebola Analysis because we're going to be analyzing some Ebola data. Okay, so Ebola Analysis there. Of course, if you're working locally, it's going to ask you where to put that file. You can put it anywhere you want for now. Put it somewhere that's easy to find, though. In a future lesson, we're going to talk about intelligent ways to store your R scripts. But for now, just put it anywhere on your computer. Now, unlike in past lessons, we're going to add a little header section to the start of this script. This is something you're supposed to do generally for good data analysis practice, but in the past we haven't done it. Now we're going to do it. So I'm going to copy this piece of code here. Okay, it says Ebola Sierra Leone Analysis. So you should write that as a title. Then you should write your name. I've written here John Sample Name Doe. I'm going to change that to Ken uh, David Nwosu. And you should also write uh, the date. I'm going to write the date here as 2022 
I think it is 0901 today, okay? What is the usefulness of this? Mostly it is so other people know what your code is about by virtue of the title. They know who wrote it, so they know who they can ask questions to. And you know when it started, they know when it started as well. So it's helpful for general housekeeping because remember that usually you're not going to be the only person working with these scripts. You're usually going to be collaborating with others. Then next we're going to have a section called uh, load packages. So we're going to load all the packages that we're going to use in this analysis. So load packages and then four dashes like that. Okay. Then we're going to type that code that I told you about which helps you install and load packages. But like I mentioned, you don't need to know exactly what this code means. Just type it with me. So I go if exclamation point require um, the package pacman okay then install dot packages and then in quotes pacman okay and we can run that line of code but I know that it's already installed so it's not going to install it afresh for me remember what this does is it checks whether this package is installed and if it's not installed it installs it and why are we installing this package because this package is a package manager pacman and it helps us manage other packages so now that we have that installed we can type the following pacman okay and then two colons and then the function pload and then inside of here we can put all the packages we're going to use in this session the first package we're going to use is called tidyverse and tidyverse is actually a suite of packages it is what we call a meta package okay so that's a comment I'm putting there it's a meta package which means it loads several other packages inside of it I will mention those packages when they come along so I put a comma there after the code and then I'm going to load the other packages we're going to use. Let me look at my notes and see what those are. Okay, so we're going to use this package called inspectdf. Okay, put a comma there. Then we're going to use a package called plotly for some plots. Next, we're going to use a package called janitor. Okay, then another one called visdat. And then finally, a package called esquis. Very interesting package names from these uh, R package developers. So once that's typed up, I can press enter and I'm going to see those packages being installed in my console. It might take a while for you. Sorry if your internet is slow. Okay, so now we're going to look at the data set you're going to be working with. So to do that, I've stored it on a Google Drive for you. So open a new tab in your browser. And let me zoom in a bit. We're going to go to the following uh, link, bit.ly slash Ebola hyphen, sorry, no, slash view hyphen Ebola hyphen data. Okay, and when you go there, it should take you to this uh, CSV. Now you're going to download it by clicking on the download button there at the top right. So download that to your computer. And then now that it's downloaded to your computer, you can import it into R. However, if you are working on RStudio Cloud, then you technically don't have it on your computer yet because this is a computer on the cloud. So now we have to put it on that computer on the cloud. To do that, you're going to come here to the Files pane, okay, and click on Upload. And that way, we're going to put that data set we just downloaded to the computer on the cloud. But again, if you are on a local computer, you don't care about this step. So I go ahead, I click Choose File, and I locate that file I just downloaded. Once I've located the file, I click on OK. And we can see that the uh, data set now shows up in, uh, in my Files pane. So now we're ready to import that data set into R proper. To do that, we're going to go to File, and then uh, Import Data Set. And then from, whoops, from text, but the read R option. You could use the base option, but it's not quite as good. So let's use the read R option. So we click on from text read R, okay? And then we're going to locate where that file is. In this case, I'm on RStudio uh, Cloud. So it should just be directly in my environment there. So I can browse and I click on Ebola Sierra Leone CSV. If you are on a uh, local computer, it might take a little while to find that data set. You might have to navigate to it. Now this data set is very clean, so we don't need to mess with any of, this other, uh, any of these other options. We can go directly and click on Import. Okay, and what it has done is a few things. If you look at your, uh, your console, let's look at the console first, we can see the code that was run by R, or by R Studio. First it ran library read R, to load the package uh, readr, and readr was then used to import this uh, CSV with the function read CSV. We didn't actually need library readr because we've actually already loaded the readr library. How did we load it? When we loaded tidyverse, readr is one of the packages in tidyverse. Actually, I will mention to you all the packages in tidyverse later on. 
but let's go back to the console for now. Okay, so it loaded readar and then got us the read CSV function and then imported that data set Ebola Sierra Leone. It printed some outputs about what it was doing when it imported the data set. We don't have to consider that for now. And the last thing it did is it ran this function here, view Ebola Sierra Leone, so that you could look at it in your data viewer. Okay, we can see what that data set looks like here again. But we're not quite done with the data importing process. There's still one more thing we should do. What we should do is we should take the code that was just run, specifically this line here, Ebola Sierra Leone read CSV blah blah blah, and we should put that in our actual script. So let's put that in our script and let's title that section something like a load data. So why is it important to copy that code and put it in your script? Because your script needs to be a reproducible record of the analysis that you have done. This is the concept of a reproducibility. The whole point and click stuff that we had done, it's hard to tell someone else's computer to do that. But when you put this code in your script, then you can send this to anyone and they will be able to automatically rerun your analysis and reproduce all of your results. So although it is nice to use that graphic user interface point and click functionality to import your data set, you should always copy the relevant code and put it in your script so that your script can run from A to Z as a reproducible record of what you have done. Now a small side note, and this is especially relevant if you're working on a local computer. If you're working on a local computer, it is likely that the path for your file is not just Ebola Sierra Leone uh, CSV, but rather something like uh, users slash kene slash desktop or slash downloads slash blah 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 blah, the exact location of this file in your computer. Now that is not fully reproducible because that would not, would not apply if you send the code to someone else. So later on, I'll introduce you to the concept of RStudio projects, which give you a nice way to have reproducible data paths that don't have all of this uh, personal stuff, users, can blah, blah, blah. So now that we know that our script is a reproducible record of everything we have done, then we can do something crazy like restarting R and rerunning everything we just did. So we're practicing this concept of reproducibility by going to session, restarting R, to clear our workspace and clear our console. And because this thing is fully reproducible, we can just rerun it. Press Command A when your cursor is anywhere in the uh, script, and then press Command Enter or Control Enter and send that code uh, to your console. What that is going, going to do is uh, load all of these packages again and then import your data set. So it's easy to redo the analyses. It's easy to reproduce the analyses. Of course, we haven't quite done any analyses yet, but this concept will flow through to all of your analytic workflow. Now, most of this lesson is going to focus on a single data set, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what that data set is. This is from the 2014 to 2016 West African Ebola outbreak. If you want to learn more about the data set, you can go to this link here, bit.ly slash Ebola data source, and you can read the actual source paper for this data set. Okay, you can also go to this DOI, just in case this link dies in five or 10 years. And we can look at a quick preview of what that data set looks like. You have the age column, you have sex, you have status. The statuses are confirmed and uh, suspected. Confirmed means they have confirmed uh, Ebola, suspected means it's suspected. The date of onset is when the symptoms started to show for these uh, patients. The date of sample is when a test sample was taken. And the district is of course just the district. Now, as we're working with this data set, we're going to be showing you many different R functions for parsing and understanding your data. I want you to be keeping these questions in mind. So see when you can answer these with the code that you're learning. And whenever you feel like you can answer one of these questions, you should pause the video and try to type out the code needed to answer the question. So here are the questions. When was the first case reported? As at the end of June 2014, which age group had had the most cases? What was the median age of those affected? See when you have enough R code to answer that question. Have there been more cases in men or in women? Next, what district has had the most uh, reported cases? And finally, by the end of June 14, which is basically by the end of this data set, uh, was the outbreak growing or receding? See at which point in the lesson you feel like you can confidently answer those questions by typing up some R code. So now let's look at how to explore your data set in R. We're going to open a new section and call it uh, Explore Data. Okay, so let's make a section and call it Explore Data. 
And actually, something I forgot to mention is that here, uh, our studio chose the name Ebola Sierra Leone for us based on the name of this um, file, this CSV, but you can import it with whatever name you want, so it doesn't have to be Ebola Sierra Leone. In any case, let's go ahead and think about how to explore our data. So we're going to look at a few functions that help you get a quick sense of what your data looks like. One of those functions is called head, so you run head, okay, and then the data set you care about, in this case Ebola Sierra Leone, all right, and let's run that. I think you have seen this function before, actually. What it does is it returns the first six rows of your data set. If you want to return uh, more than six, you can put a comma and put the next argument, which is n. n equals whatever number of rows you care about, for example, 10. So you can return the first 10 rows like that. If you try to return more than 10 rows, say something like 50, our studio will truncate your output. It will shorten your output for you. Okay, it's stick, it gives you only 10, and then it says use print and blah, blah, blah to see more rows. So if you want to see more rows, then you have to type uh, print instead of head. Okay, let's type uh, print there, and then we can see more rows. So RStudio shortens it for you. Okay, similar to head, you have the tail. The tail returns the bottom rows of your data set. Okay, so we can type tail, and then run that, and that gives us the bottom six rows. We don't really have a way of knowing that it's the bottom, but I promise you it is the bottom. Okay, uh, now we can use another function that's called an end call. What does end call stand for? The number of columns. So the number of columns of the Ebola Sierra Leone data set. Okay, we can see there's seven. How about n row, the number of rows? We can see that there are uh, 200 rows. Now these functions may seem a little bit useless in the context of this small data set, but when you have larger data sets, it's often useful to just look at a sneak peek of the data set or see some quick stats on the data set with nCall and nRow. A related function to nCall and nRow is the function dim, which stands for dimensions, so Ebola, Sierra Leone data, dim, and that gives us both the number of rows and the number of columns, okay? Then I'll show you one last quick function for exploring your data, it's called summary. So you, you call summary and then again your data set in there, and then we run a command or control enter. Let's expand the console so we can see that output a bit better. Okay, so uh, what do we see here? It looks like for the numeric columns, things like age, it gives us the minimum, the first quartile, if you don't know what that is, you can Google it, the median, the mean, the third quartile, the max, and the number of missings, the number of NAs. And then for the characters or the strings, which are just uh, pieces of text, we'll talk about what these are later, it just tells you the length, that is how many rows they are. Um, and that's about it. For the dates, it's considering the dates kind of as numerics as well, so it also shows you that same information, the minimum, the quartiles, the mean, median, and so on. Now, as a quick reminder, if you're wondering what any of these functions does, or you're looking for some additional arguments to those functions, you can just type question mark, and then the name of the function, for example, question mark uh, n call. okay, you can run that, and it'll show up in your help tab here what that function is doing, in this case, the help is both for n row and n call. You can scroll through, look at some examples in the bottom, and that way you can better understand what's happening uh, with the code. Still on the topic of data exploration, now I'm going to show you a very nice function, which comes from this package of visdat. The function that I'm going to show you is actually called a visdat. So to find that function, let's type visdat, and then, uh, whoops, and then two colons. And then we can scroll through to find the function I'm caring about, or I'm thinking about, which is this one, the viz hyphen, or viz underscore dat. And we can put our data set in the Ebola Sierra Leone. And we can run that there. And let's see what it gives us. It gives us in this plots pane, you need to expand it a bit. What is this? It's a basically a visualization of your data. It shows you all of the columns. Imagine this is a kind of zoomed out spreadsheet. And it also shows you the types of the columns, which are characters, which are dates, which are uh, numerics. And it also shows you in those uh, light gray lines there where there are some missing values. So a nice way to just quickly zoom out and get a quick sense of what your data set looks like. The next function I'll show you for quickly exploring your data is called uh, inspect cat. And it comes from the, uh, the inspect DF package that we loaded here, inspect DF. So uh, let's, let's uh, make some space for our code. And let's go ahead and type uh, inspect cat. Okay, inspect cat, and we can see it come up. Um, in this case, we didn't type the name of the package first. Remember I told you that you could type the name of the package first, and this is a full signifier. And the reason you might do this 
is that it basically makes your code sometimes a bit easier to read because people know exactly where that function comes from. Okay, but it's really up to you. It's a, it's a bit of a stylistic thing. Okay, in any case, uh, here we're just going to type inspect cat and then Ebola Sierra Leone again. And when we run that, uh, the output is in our console. So let's take a look there. Uh, it doesn't look to be anything uh, quite meaningful. Um, but what we're going to do is send this output to the uh, show plot function, which also comes from inspect df. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, send this thing into show plot. We're going to nest it in show plot and run that that way. Okay. And now it'll show us a very nice plot. It says though that the viewport has zero dimensions because our plot window is too small. So let's open that up properly and then let's run that code again. And what does it show us? Something very nice. It shows us basically for the categorical variables and uh, for the date variables as well, what is the breakdown of the categories? So you can see that there are more women than men, more F than M. You can see that they're more confirmed than the other one, which is suspected. It's too small to show the label. You can see most people come from the Kailahu district. You can see what sort of a distribution of dates you have in terms of date of onset and date of sample. So really a very nice overview of those uh, variables. Now a quick clarification about what we did here. This is what we call function nesting. I explained it in a previous lesson, but let me just quickly uh, go through it again. So what we did here essentially, I'm going to uh, cut this out and put it on the next line, okay, and close that. What we did here will be analogous or similar to first taking the output of inspect cat Ebola Sierra Leone, which was this, this table here or this tibble. Uh, you don't know yet what a tibble is, we'll explain that later on. Okay, so it's like taking this thing and assigning it to an object. Hopefully you remember how to assign an object. It is a uh, less than and then minus, but really you should use the shortcut which is option and then minus or alt minus if you are on a uh, Windows, okay? We take that and we assign it to some object. Let's say, um, let's just call it, what should we call it? Let's call it categorical summary, cat summary, okay? And what we've done there, what we do next rather, is we take this cat summary and plop it into show plot. So we're taking this table here and asking R, show us a plot of that table, or rather asking uh, inspect D, the inspect DF package. Okay, so we can run that again. Let's open up our plots. To, to close this plot, we're going to click on this, uh, this X over there. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on that. Remove the current plot indeed. Uh, so we can run it again and run show plot now on cat summary, and we get that same plot. So what we have done here is analogous to just taking this portion of code, okay, and nesting it inside of show plot. Hopefully you see how that is happening. So this, uh, this thing here, inspect cat, becomes this object, and we can ask for the plot of that object, or we can put the output directly inside of the function show plot in a uh, nesting uh, setup. But now that I've explained that, let's neaten up our script so that our script is really only doing one thing. We can get rid of this. And in fact, uh, to be even neater, I'm going to get rid of that package name because I don't think it's necessary in this case. And another thing we should get rid of is this question mark and call because that's not relevant to our analysis. Okay, it was just a side quest. And uh, this, this function, or rather this plot that I've shown you, is quite nice, but we could uh, make it better. We could, we could improve it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make it interactive by using another function which comes from the uh, Plotly package. Now we're learning a lot of functions here. Don't get overwhelmed, okay? The idea is just to introduce you to a, a wide breadth of different things you can do uh, for your uh, exploratory data analysis. But you can always come back to this uh, script later if you've forgotten a specific function. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, take the output of this stuff and put it inside of ggplotly, okay? So we could either do another nesting. If we're gonna do another nesting, then we should probably press enter inside of ggplotly and put that code there, all right? And we can run it that way. But now it's starting to look a little bit uh, scary. So instead of nesting it that way, this is correct, but instead of doing that, I'm going to assign an intermediate object indeed. So I'm going to call this thing, whoops, I'm going to call this uh, the plot, the cat summary plot, so let's call that cat summary plot. And we're going to pass that object into ggplotly, okay? And what ggplotly will do is make a nice uh, interactive uh, diagram for us, okay? So We've lost the labels, but actually you can hover over this interactive diagram and look at each of the labels. So now we can see, for example, that the proportion of people who account as confirmed, let me zoom in, 
The proportion who count as confirmed is 0.9 or 90%, okay? And the proportion who count as uh, suspected, it says new level key suspected there, that proportion is 0.09 or uh, 9%, so you have to multiply by 100 to get to the percentage. Now we should actually add a few more comments to make sure that it's clear what our code is doing. So I'm going to put a small comment here that says um, categorical, whoops, no, visdat is for a general overview of data, okay? And then the categorical stuff we did here with inspect cat, we can call that a categorical overview. The next thing we're going to look at is the numerical overview. If you want to look at the overview of the numerical uh, columns in your data set, you're going to use uh, the following function. It's called inspect num. So instead of inspect cat here, we're going to use inspect num. And in fact, I'm just going to copy that whole line of code and paste it, all right? And uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's type in inspect num, okay? And here change this to num summary plot. So I run that line of code. And to view the num summary plot, we can just uh, highlight it and then press command enter or control enter and that'll send this to the console, okay? And now we can see uh, histograms of the two numeric variables in our data set. The age variable there, you can see that most people cluster around age 40, okay? And the ID variable, but the ID is just IDs that don't really mean anything, so that's a bit uh, useless in that case. But again, you can see we have a nice numerical overview of all of our, uh, of all the numerical variables. So again, we're going to do ggplotly on this output, okay? So ggplotly on num summary plot, and it'll make that diagram uh, interactive. So you can hover over and see, for example, that those with a middle of 27.5, let me zoom in a bit, those with a middle of 27.5, that is those from 25 to 30, that's how you read a histogram. If you want, you can do a quick Google to see how to read histograms. But those from 25 to 30 make up 0.13 of the whole uh, population, of the whole sample. 0.13 is a uh, 13%. Don't get too overwhelmed. I'm just trying to uh, make sure you understand what we're looking at but it's not super relevant for our lesson. We just want you to know that you have these nice functions that can give you a quick overview of your data sets. So now that you see how to get an overview of multiple variables at a time in your data sets, we're going to look at what happens when you want to zoom in on specific variables, on specific uh, columns. So to do that, I'm going to make a new section, and instead of explore data, we're going to call it um, analyzing individual variables, or analyzing single variables, whoops, single variables, and we're going to start with numeric variables, okay? So numeric addition or something like that. So in order to analyze a single variable, you need to have some way of pulling it out of your data set. The easiest and most basic way to do that in R is with what's called the dollar sign operator. So we're going to grab our data set, which remember is Ebola Sierra Leone, and we're going to try to pull out the age variable. So we're going to type Ebola Sierra Leone hyphen, sorry, not hyphen, but rather dollar sign, and then our studio gives us the nice selection menu there. We can click on age, or if you want, you can type it manually. So we click on age and we run that code. And as we can see here, we have, what is this? This is basically all of the ages that we had in our data set. It's a very long uh, list. Specifically, what this thing we've just printed out is, is it's called a vector, a vector in R. We're going to introduce you to vectors properly later. But just think of a vector as a list of things that are all of the same type. A vector, is a, a vector is a list of things that are all of the same type. Now we can ask some basic questions of this vector. For example, we can ask, what is the mean age? All right, so we can type the following function, mean, all right, and then put this stuff in there. Ebola serial hyphen, I keep saying hyphen when I mean dollar sign. Ebola serial dollar sign h, okay. So we run that code and whoops, it looks like we have a problem. It says NA. NA means not applicable or not available. Why is it NA? Well, here's the problem. If you look at this vector uh, of ages, you see there are a few NAs in there. We have one NA there. We have some others uh, throughout the data set. That means that the uh, value is missing and R cannot find the mean of a bunch of values where some of them are missing. You need to get rid of the missing ones for R to understand that code. So to do that, you're going to put a comma, and there's a function in mean called na.rm. To see that function, I think you can press tab. Yes, if you press tab, you see the other functions in R, sorry, in the mean function. And here we have na.rm, okay? A logical evaluating to true or false, indicating whether any value should be stripped. So we can click on this thing, okay? And set that logical to true, 
Okay, we haven't properly looked at logicals yet, but just know that there are two special types of values in R, true, all in capital case, and false, all in capital case, and they're, they're quite unique, they're quite important. Okay, so we set na.rm equals true, and we can run that code now, and what that has done is ignored the NAs, and we have our nice new uh, mean, which is 33.8. Now, instead of na.rm equals true, you could also shorten it and write na.rm equals t, so an R T stands for true, and S stands for false, okay? And another thing you might ask is, is R so stupid? Why doesn't it just remove the NAs by default? Why does it force you to have to type this extra piece of code? The reason it does that is because it wants you to know that there are NAs in your data set. Because there are NAs in our data set, this our mean is not fully valid. Imagine if 90% uh, of the data set was missing. 90% of the data set was just NAs. And you found the mean, and the mean will say something like 60, and you said, the mean of my sample is 60. That would be a wrong statement. It, would, it really should be the mean of 10% of my sample is, is 60. But because you didn't check your data set, you didn't know that, and therefore you made a false statement. So R forces you to reckon with the missingness in your data set. This applies to other functions too. So now we're going to look at other functions you can use to analyze your numeric variable. We can try something like median, so we want to find the median of Ebola Sierra Leone age, okay? We run that there, it tells us NA until we put NA.RM equals true, so I copy that from the previous line, I paste it in, and we run that, and now we have the uh, median. So these are just two functions, let's look at a number of additional ones, but before we do that, we can shorten this code a little bit, make it a bit easier to read, by assigning this stuff here, Ebola Sierra Leone uh, age, into its own object, We'll call that object something like a age underscore vec, okay, and that'll make the rest of the code slightly uh, more legible. Let's press a bunch of enters so we can pull this to the middle of our data set, or rather to the middle of our screen. So now we're going to try a few other functions. We start with the sd function. What does it do? It gives you the standard deviation. So sd, you put in the age vec there, okay, comma, na.rm equals true in this case. And that is our standard deviation there. We can look at the minimum age, so min, and then age vec na.rm equals true. I'm actually just going to uh, copy that and then type min instead, okay? We can see that the minimum age is 1.8. Okay, we can look at the maximum age, max. Or we can look at a single summary that gives us many of these statistics. So we could type a uh, summary of age vec, summary, all right? And I think for summary, we don't actually need the na.rm equals true. Let's check that by deleting this and pressing tab. And we can see there isn't actually an argument called na.rm equals true here. So I don't think that's relevant because summary takes into account the NAs, okay? And you don't have to actually uh, get rid of them. So we can uh, run summary without the na.rm equals true. And it's all the same code there. We can check the length of the vectors with the function length, or the length of the, the vector singular. Okay, length. Okay, it is 200 because, of course, it came from a table that had 200 rows. And something else you could do is you could find the sum of the ages. I don't know why you would care about the sum, but maybe you do, maybe in another context. In this case, we do need na.rm equals true, okay? And we can see that the sum of the ages equals 6,000 years. Now I know that we're teaching you many functions again, and you're starting to get scared about, am I going to have to learn these functions? Well, not really. First of all, many of them are kind of natural sounding. Min, min is minimum, max is maximum. So that's kind of easy. And also, you can just always Google. Just Google, what is the function for median in R? And the first one or two uh, results should be correct. All you need to remember is that there is some function for it and what the syntax for that function might look like. Okay, so now we're done with the section on analyzing a single variable numeric. We're going to look at how about when you want to visualize a single numeric variable. So visualizing a single num uh, variable's numeric. For plotting with R, there are generally two main families of visualizations. There are visualizations that are created with what's called base R, or base plotting. These are plotting functions that come built into R, and they are visualizations that come with a package called ggplot. What is ggplot? First of all, it's a very funny name, but secondly, it's one of the packages that comes within this tidyverse meta package that we talked about. The tidyverse meta package is really a very wonderful thing. And we are thankful to the team that builds that. In general, ggplot graphics are preferred. So first, I'll just show you the base plot way to visualize a single variable. 
One base plot function you could use is something called hist, which stands for histogram. We could pass the age vec, which again is this long list of ages, into hist, and it won't show us the plot because our figure margins are too large for that space. So we rerun that now that we have more space. It gives us a histogram of age vec, just like you saw before. There's also a function called box plot, box plot age vec. Okay. But like I mentioned, ggplot visualizations are generally more recommended. So you can really just forget about these for the most part. We're going to look at how to use uh, ggplot instead. So let me just put a small comment and write ggplot. Actually, when I say we're going to use ggplot, I'm not being fully honest. What we're going to use is a package called esquisse. esquisse. And what esquisse does is it gives us a point-and-click interface that lets us easily create uh, ggplot figures. The code for ggplot can take a little while to get used to, so we actually will introduce you to that in a separate course. For now, we're just going to show you how to use this esquisse graphic user interface, which is a very nice way to get started. It is quite limited in its functionality, but it's a nice way to get started and acquainted with the idea of making uh, ggplots. In order to use esquisse, we can type the package name. I've already typed it, so I'm just going to copy paste. And then our two colons. And the key function here is esquisser. So I can scroll through and look for esquisser there. All right. Now that I found it, I don't actually need the name of the package there. I don't need the full signifier. I can just put our function. And inside of this, we can put that vector we've been playing with, that list of ages. So I can plop that in there. All right. Run that. And uh, esquisse is going to be hard to use so zoomed in like this. So I might have to zoom out. But let's see. I'm going to drag the data column or the data variable. You can see it's labeled there as variables into my x-axis. So let's drag data into x-axis. And let's see what it does. Like I imagined, it's a bit too small to see. So let me try and zoom out a bit. And as you can see, it's the same kind of uh, plot of the ages. But it already looks a little bit uh, more elegant. In fact, though, in general, when we're using esquisse, we don't pass individual vectors into the data the way I've done here. We actually will pass the whole data set in. So we're going to, let me zoom back in, we're going to pass, instead of age vec, let's pass in the whole Ebola Sierra Leone data set. And that'll make everything we're doing a little bit clearer. So now I zoom back out again because I'm about to jump into esquisse. All right. So what we can see here are each of the variables in this uh, Ebola data set. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. Let's see how that works. Okay. So we have each of the variables in the data set. And the one we were working with is called age. So we can drag age to the x-axis of our data set. And we can uh, moreover click on histogram here and change it to some other plot styles. Instead of histogram, we could try it as a density plot which smooths it out, and we can change the smoothing settings. I'll show you how to do that maybe later. Actually, I'm not sure if I will. <laughs> we can change it to a box plot, and we can see what the box plot looks like there. We can change it to a violin plot. A violin plot is similar to a box plot, but it's uh, more rounded. And my goal here was to show you how to visualize a single variable, but since we're already here, it's a bit too tempting to show you how to visualize multiple variables. So let's go ahead and try that. So now we're going to try to uh, visualize the age distribution across different sexes. To do that, all we have to do is drag the sex variable onto the y-axis. And what that gives us is two different box plots, one for men at the uh, top and another one for women at the bottom. If we want, we can change it back to the violin plot. It gives us the box plot by default. Let's change it back to the violin so we can see what those look like. Another thing you could do is change the colors of these uh, these violin plots. So you could drag the sex variable or the sex column into this box that says fill and that gives us two different colors of plots. And I think it also gives us, if we zoom out a little bit, it also gives us a nice legend here with the uh, male and female categories. But like I said, the goal here isn't to jump fully into all the kinds of visualizations you can do with esquisse. I invite you though to go ahead and play around with this uh, graphic user interface. It's quite simple to use. In particular, try playing with these uh, buttons at the bottom. Try adding labels, try adding a title. You can say this is my first plot, for example. And you can see that it gives you, if we close this now, click on that, I guess, uh, it gives you a nice uh, title. Try playing with the subtitles, the captions. Try messing with the plot options. For example, you can mess with the bandwidth here. Okay, but most importantly, you should go to that last tab there, code, 
and look at the code that was used to generate this plot. Why is that useful? We're actually going to copy that code into our script. That way, whenever we want to regenerate the plot, we can just run the same code. Again, coming back to the concept of reproducibility. So we're going to copy this to clipboard. And before we close Esquisse, actually, I realized I should quickly mention what a violin plot is because it's not super intuitive to everyone. On our x-axis, you can see that there's a bunch of edges. You might not see it very well on my recording, but on your screen, you should see it uh, quite nicely, okay? And basically, wherever the violin is fat is wherever you have lots of people. So here, the violin is fat around 40, okay? So there's lots of people around 40. The violin is quite skinny, above 60, so very few people at age 60. So, so it gives you a nice hourglass way of representing uh, the distribution of those variables. But for now, we can copy that code. I guess I already did that. And close Esquisse. We can paste that code into our script. So let's paste it. Now, as you can see, the code here is ggplot code. So like I mentioned, we have used Esquisse to create a ggplot plot. And we use the graphic user interface. But eventually, you're going to have to learn how to at least understand ggplot code. You usually don't have to memorize every single function because these things are easily Googleable or you can just consult the help files. But eventually, in order to make more complex plots and more attractive plots, you will need to learn how to write ggplot code. But that is for another course. For now, we can uh, put a hash symbol before this esquisser because it's not part of our reproducible analysis. The reproducible thing is this ggplot code. So now we are done with uh, this section on visualizing single variables numeric. Although now I'm realizing we're actually not visualizing a single variable here. So in order to stay uh, faithful to the actual title of this section, let's make a new plot that is actually just the, um, a single variable. So let's pull the age into the x axis. And we're just going to copy the code for this histogram. Copy that to clipboard. Okay. And we paste that in. And this code, if you want, you can keep it in your script. I'll comment it out for now. And let's just put in the histogram code. So now we have the code for generating that histogram, which allows us to visualize a single uh, numeric variable. So now let's jump to the next section of the lesson, which is analyzing uh, categorical variables. So analyzing single variables uh, categorical. Now I'm assuming you know what a categorical variable is. It's something with distinct categories, something like male versus female, or Africa, Europe, North America. So distinct categories as opposed to something like uh, age, which is a continuous variable because you can be zero years, you can be 0 0.111 years, you can be 0 0.1112 years, and so on and so forth. So the categorical variable in our data set that we're going to be thinking about is the uh, district variable. So again, we're going to use that dollar sign syntax to pull out our variable. So we type Ebola, we get the nice autocomplete, we press enter, then the dollar sign, and we're going to pull out the district variable. We can run that code, and let's look at our console so we can see what actually got printed. As you can see, it's a nice long vector of all of the uh, district names in our data set. It should be about 200 um, elements long. You can see this is 199, so that means that one is 200. And so the most common way to analyze a single categorical variable is to make a table of it to look at its numbers. So to do that, R has a nice built-in function called a table, of course. <laughs> so we do table. And we can put in that vector there, all right? We run that code, and what we have there is a not so nicely formatted, but somewhat useful table giving us the counts of rows per district. So there's two people from Bo, there's 155 people from Kailahu, and so on. So the table function is quite nice, but as with many things, there's a nicer function that someone else has built in an external R package, and that is the function called uh, also table, but I'll show you how it's spelled. It comes from the janitor package. So we're going to look into the janitor package and pull out a function called table. So I put uh, two colons there, and I, let's look for table. Actually, I know how to spell it, so I don't actually need that. It's like this, okay? So table, T-A-B-Y-L. If you want, you can call it table, or you could just call it janitor table. That's usually how you would hear it called. So janitor table is a nicer form of table. Let's see what it looks like. Let's paste that code in and run that. So as you can see, the output from a janitor table is a bit nicer. First of all, it's formatted uh, more nicely. You, it's easier to read, okay? Secondly, you also have a percent column there, which gives you the uh, percentages of the different uh, variables. 
I think technically there is a bit of a mistake because that isn't a percent, that is a proportion. So 0 0.775 is actually 77.5%. Despite that bad uh, nomenclature there, the janitor table function is otherwise uh, quite good. There is one small side note though. Generally when you use the janitor table function, this isn't the exact syntax you want to use. Um, in order to make that clear, I'm going to consult the help file for the janitor table function. Let's get some practice looking at help files. So I look at the help file for janitor table, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Okay, As we can see, it says that the way to call the janitor table function is type table, then dat, whatever your data set is, and then the names of the variables that you care about. We'll, we'll see that in a bit more... Uh, in a bit of a clearer sense by looking at some examples. So here we have some examples and actually we can run those examples directly by clicking on that button there, run examples. What does that do? It gives us this nice documentation where you can look at all of the examples having been run. So here it shows the example on this empty cars data set, table empty cars comma CYL. So what that seems to be showing us is that the way to actually call the janitor table function, if we follow the help file, is to first put the data set just like they have there with empty cars, okay, then a comma, and then the variable of concern, so district. So this is the proper way to call the janitor table function. It gives us a nicer output than the other one, because in the other case we have this Ebola Sierra Leone a dollar sign district, but here we just have district, which is a bit easier to read. But the other beautiful thing about that is that it gives us a nice way to do what are called cross tables or cross tabulations, like you see here, table, empty cars, Sale and gear. Let's look at it in the context of our data set. It'll become clear. So table Ebola Sierra Leone district and six. Let's run that and it should be easy to understand the output. So this is a count of uh, the population or the sample by both sex and district. So we have zero uh, women from Bo. Let me zoom in there. Zero women from Bo. Uh, two men from Bo, right? 91 women. F stand for women. 91 women from Kailahu, uh, 64 men from Kailahu, and so on and so forth. So a nice way to do a, a two-way tabulation. Now let's look at how to visualize a categorical variable. So we make a new section, and we call it uh, visualizing. Visualizing single variables categorical. Now we get back to the question of ggplot versus base. We're going to focus on ggplot, but I'll quickly show you a way to plot this in base R. So you could grab this vector again and then put it inside of the table function. So what we're going to do is create a visualization of this table output by passing that into bar plot or nesting it in bar plot. So if you run that, then you can see a plot of the uh, table, <laughs> but you can't see it until you uh, expand your plot view window. So you can see the bar plot that shows the distribution of uh, respondents or rather patients across the different uh, districts. But again, we don't recommend using base plotting. We recommend ggplot, but in your case, esquisse. So we're going to pull up a esquisse, or rather the esquisser function from esquisse, and then put Ebola Sierra Leone in there. Okay, before I run that, I will need to zoom out so that I can actually see the esquisse output. And again, what we would like to visualize is the distribution of the sample across districts. So we can drag the district variable or the district column into this X box here for the X axis, and as you can see, it gives us a nice bar chart, as we might expect. If you want, you can go ahead and try playing with some of these other variables. For example, if you try dragging the district into the fill section, you'll get each of the bars filled according to the district, or you could drag it into color and see what that looks like. There you have the outline of them is colored according to district. I encourage you to go wild with your explorations in Esquisse. Every now and then though, you should come and look at the code that is being generated here so that you can start to get an intuition for what ggplot code looks like because very soon you're going to have to write this code on your own. So for now we can copy this to clipboard and put it in our script and this is an example of what we were trying to do here which is uh, visualizing single categorical variables. We can comment out the esquisser there and all we want is this piece of code, this fully reproducible piece of code that creates our nice plot there. As we can see it's not so so nice because there is a uh, an overlap there. I invite you to play with Esquisse sufficiently to figure out how to get rid of that overlap. So now we're basically done covering all of the topics we set out to cover. So let's see if we can jump back to those questions I had asked you to keep in mind at the beginning of the lesson. So I'm going to copy them and paste them in here. Okay. 
and let's see how to answer those. Hopefully you have tried to answer them. If you haven't, try and pause the video now and see which of these you can answer on your own. So the first one says, when was the first case reported? Well, technically we don't have a date of report in this data set, but we can use maybe the date of sample as a proxy for that. The date of sample is when the test sample was taking, taken. We can assume that's when it was reported. So uh, let's try that. We'll do the min, the min of the date of sample uh, variable or the date of sample column. So mini bullets here alone, dollar sign, and then date of sample. And we can see that the minimum there is uh, May uh, 23rd of 2014. So that's when the first case was reported, or rather, the first date of sample. How about the median age of those affected? This is quite simple. We actually did it in the, in the course of the lesson. So it will be the median function, okay? And then in Bola Sierra Leone, dollar sign age. But of course, that won't work. You need the na.rm. So na.rm equals t or true, okay? And now we can see the median age is 35. Had there been more cases in men or women, how could we answer this? Actually, we already answered it. You do table, either the regular table or janitor table. In this case, I'm using janitor table. Um, Ebola, Sierra Leone, and then um, the sex column, right? We run that, and we can see the percentages there. If you want, you can instead create maybe a bar chart. Let's do that very quickly. We do Esquiser, Ebola, Sierra Leone, okay? And, uh, and it's going to be too hard to use that at that zoom level, so let's zoom out and quickly drag the sex column onto the x-axis. If you want it to be colorful, you could also drag it onto the fill. So now we have the men and women, and we can clearly see that there are more women. We can copy that code there, copy it to clipboard, close that, zoom back in, and now we have a nice way to answer that question with both a table and a plot, and we can run that just to make sure that it works. That's wonderful. Which, which district has had the most reported cases? This is beautiful because what we can do actually is just copy this code and it's the same question but for districts. So instead of sex we can just replace this with districts okay and run that okay and we can see that the Kailanghu district of course has had the most cases but we've already kind of seen this before. Similarly here we can replace the x equals sex with x equals district, fill equals sex with fill equals district. We run that and we have our nice plot there of the distribution by districts. And the last question, by the end of 2014, was the outbreak growing or receding? How do we answer that? Well, we want to create some kind of um, diagram showing the number of cases in each day. Do you have an idea of how to do that? We can actually do that with uh, the esquisse. So let's, let's open up Esquiser again and open up Ebola Sierra Leone. Let me zoom out, Sorry. okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to drag the date of onset, that's when the person got sick, into the x-axis. And that will give us a sense of how many people were getting sick in each, uh, on each day. Okay, so we can copy that code. All right, copy it to clipboard. And we can paste that code in here. All right, and let's run that and see what the output is. So it's asking us by the end of June, which is kind of towards the end of that, uh, that bar chart, is the outbreak growing or receding? I would say it's not that clear, actually. You might say it's growing, but I think you would need a sort of longer trend line to be sure what's happening at the end. So, so I would say unclear. That's actually my answer. Okay, so it's a bit of a trick question for you. Um, although you might say it, it is growing. It's, it's, not, it's not super clear. All right, so, all right, so we're basically done with the lesson. However, if you feel like you haven't had enough, I'm going to give you another data set which you can import and try this whole process again. So if you're feeling like you want to get some additional practice, you can try this with this new data set I'm going to paste in here. Or of course you can try this whole process with your own data set. You import it, you visualize it, you get a sense of what the distribution of key variables are, and see what sorts of questions you can answer about that data set using these functions that we've learned about. But I've pasted in this link here of the uh, Yaoundé COVID data set, bit.ly slash view Yaoundé COVID data. If you go to that link, you can download a different data set. This will actually be an Excel spreadsheet. So when, you, when you're trying to upload it, or uh, import it rather, you should go to import data set and then from Excel, as opposed to from text, okay? And if you want to learn more about that data set, you can go to this link here, go.nature.com. This is a data set you're going to run into uh, later on in our courses. 
It's covered in quite great detail in the wrangling course. Now, the very last thing I want to talk about is uh, why not Excel? Why not Excel? I was teaching this lesson a while back to a student, and, uh, and he asked me, uh, why don't we use Excel for this stuff? It seems so uh, basic. And I really didn't have a good answer for him because it really is the case that for these small data sets we're using in this intro session, uh, the benefits of R are not super obvious. Because we're using small data, and Excel works pretty well with small data, and also the workflow is pretty simple, the plots are pretty simple. So for now, there's no good answer because we haven't reached the level of complexity and really the level of beauty that you're going to come to experience uh, working with R eventually. So for now, you're just going to have to trust me that the kind of analytic power you're going to get by working within the R ecosystem will be orders of magnitude greater than what you can get working with a graphic user interface uh, like Microsoft Excel or, uh, or Google Sheets. Okay, so we're mostly done with the lesson. Let's quickly do an overview of our learning objectives and see if these were achieved. First, we were hoping that you'd be able to use RStudio's graphic user interface to import CSV data into R. Hopefully you remember how to do that, file import from text and so on. Next, I wanted you to be able to explain the concept of reproducibility. Hopefully you can explain that. Next, I wanted you to be able to use a number of functions to get some summaries of your data. N row, N call, dim to get the dimensions, for example, and the summary function to get an overall summary of the data set. Then we wanted you to be able to use a range of functions to get visual summaries of your data set. Things like visdat, inspect num, and inspect cat. Hopefully you remember those in combination with the show plot. Then I wanted you to know how to extract and inspect a numeric variable with functions like mean, median, max, min, length, and sum. And hopefully you remember the na.rm part of that. And also with basic uh, esquisse generated uh, ggplot graphics. And I wanted you to be able to do the same thing for categorical variables with functions like table and the table from janitor. And again, with a schisa generated ggplot graphics. Hopefully you're feeling confident in all of these. If not, that's an indication maybe that you can rewatch some portions of the video. Well, congratulations. You have now taken your first baby steps in data analysis with R. Of course, we've only given you a sneak peek of the data analysis workflow. Soon we're going to go on to more complex things, but I hope you're feeling already excited by the sneak peek, and I hope you're feeling confident enough to take some of the things we've learned and apply them to your own data sets. I'm excited to keep showing you the wonderful world of R for data analysis. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes, and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello and welcome back. Previously, you walked through some of the essential steps of data analysis, from importing data to calculating basic summary statistics. But we skipped over one crucial step, and that is setting up a data analysis project folder. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to use RStudio's projects functionality to improve the reproducibility of your workflow. So let's get started. So now let's talk a little bit about what a project is, small p, and what an RStudio project is, capital P. So like I mentioned, Project setup really should be the first stage of your data analysis. And a project is basically a folder that contains all the files associated with your specific piece of analysis. This folder usually contains a number of uh, subfolders. Typically, you have the input data folder, you have a scripts folder, and you have a folder for your outputs. And the RStudio projects functionality, capital P this time, makes working with these project folders significantly easier. So what we're going to do in this lesson is replicate some of the Ebola data analysis we had done previously, but in the context of an RStudio project. And you'll see some of the benefits of working in this way. So here is a simple pictorial representation of the project folder you're going to create. As you can see, you'll have three subfolders, a data subfolder, a script subfolder, and an outputs subfolder. And then you also have this .rproj file inside of the folder that identifies it as an RStudio project we're going to put into the data subfolder our Ebola Sierra Leone CSV that we had used before. 
into the script folder, some script that's going to analyze this CSV, and then into the outputs folder, any outputs that we create with this script. So here's what the final thing will look like. We'll have this Ebola analysis script import data from the data folder, and then write any outputs such as plots into the outputs folder. Hopefully this seems intuitive to you. This is just a basic workflow of a typical data analysis project. So let's go ahead and actually implement this structure. Now the process of setting up a project differs depending on whether you are on RStudio Cloud or on a local computer. If you are on the cloud, you technically cannot do any analysis outside of projects. So RStudio Cloud forces you to put your analyses into projects, which means you have created a project before. But let's go ahead and create a new one anyways. We click on that button there at the top right for new project. We're going to name this project something like Ebola Analysis, or maybe Ebola Analysis Project if you like. I'll just keep it as Ebola Analysis. And now this project thing that we've created is just a folder on the virtual computer that RStudio Cloud owns. So if we go to our Files tab here and we click on Cloud, we can see that there is a folder called Project, and that is where your project lives. So let's click back into that. And now this empty project already has some files in it. It has this project.rproj file. That is what identifies this folder as an RStudio project. And it also has this .r history file, which stores some of your R history. But we don't care too much about that for now. And so what you'll be doing in this lesson is creating subfolders inside of this main project folder and organizing your data analysis into those subfolders. So now I'm going to show you how to set up an RStudio project on a local computer. Here I'm demonstrating this with a MacBook, but if you're on Windows, it should look more or less the same. So you open up the RStudio application, of course, and then you go to the File menu at the top left and click on a New Project. And then you click on a new directory here. New directory just means new folder. So should you put the project in a new folder or put it in an existing folder? Here we say new folder. Okay, so we create a project in a new folder and click on our uh, new project there at, at the top. All right, and we're going to give it a name. Let's call it Ebola underscore analysis. And it says create project as subdirectory of. This is just asking you where to put the project. Where should we put this project folder? For now, I'm leaving it there in my desktop, but put it wherever it's easy to find for you. And then we click on Create Project. So what exactly is this project that you have created? Well, if you go to the Files tab of our studio, you can see that we are now inside of a folder called Ebola Analysis 2. And that folder has this file in here, Ebola underscore analysis 2.rproj. So the project you have created is a folder. And the thing that marks that folder as an RStudio project is this .rproj file in there. You also have this .rproj.user file, which stores some uh, user-specific preferences. You may not see that because uh, your hidden files may not be shown. To show your hidden files, wait, let me zoom in a bit. To show your hidden files, you click on this button here in the Files tab, and then I click on Show Hidden Files. Uh, most of the time, you don't need to look at these hidden files, so I'm actually going to uncheck this. Now, another thing that also occurs to me is that for some of your computers, you may not actually see this .rproj extension. Some computers hide the extension of any documents that they recognize. So if you don't see .rproj, just look for that RStudio logo beside the file, and you know that it is an rproj file. Now, what's the usefulness of this rproj file? The most common way you'll interact with this file is actually just to open up your project. So now I'm going to close this uh, RStudio window, and then I'll go to my desktop folder, and I see this Ebola Analysis 2 uh, folder that I created, and inside of it, we have uh, this .rproj file, and I can open that, and that will open up my analysis. So it brings us back to RStudio, and if we had created any uh, scripts or any folders inside of this project, we would be automatically returned to where we left off in that project. Hopefully that makes sense. The .rproj file indicates that your folder is an RStudio project, and you can click on it from your computer's finder or file explorer to open up your project. To make that super duper clear, let me just create a new script and call it a test script. Test script, and I'll put some comments in it, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll close the fo this, uh, this RStudio window again, and then I open up uh, Ebola Analysis 2.rproj one more time, and it's going to open up my RStudio project to its previous state, 
and show me the test script. So this is an easy way to get back to your analysis. Now the following steps should look the same whether you're working on RStudio Cloud or on a local computer. So we go to our Files tab. Let's expand that a bit so that we can see the actual menu options. Then you click on a new folder. We create a new folder, first one for data. So type in data, press OK. Data is where we're going to put our CSVs and our Excel files, any source data for our analysis. Then we create another folder and call it scripts. Okay? And scripts is where we'll put our RMD files, or rather our, our script files. Later we'll talk about RMD files. Okay? And then a final folder for outputs, so any uh, plots or other kind of outputs uh, which you will see soon. Now note that this is just one way of organizing your data analysis projects. There are other ways you might choose to do it. There are other uh, folder structures you might choose to use. Now the next thing we'll do is put in our data set into this data folder. This looks different if you are on a local computer or if you are on RStudio Cloud. So I'll show you first how to do it on RStudio Cloud. So on RStudio Cloud what you're going to do is first um, open up your RStudio Cloud window. Then we're going to actually use this button here, Upload, to put the data set into a specific folder. What data set are we using? It's the data set you used last time, the Bola Sierra Leone data. If you want to re-access it, it's at bit.ly slash Ebola data, Ebola hyphen data, okay? And you can download it there from Google Drive. Once you've downloaded it, you come back to your uh, RStudio Cloud, you open up the data folder there, and then you click on Upload, and then you click on a choose file and you locate the file in your downloads folder or wherever else you have it. So I've gone ahead and done that and I can click now on OK. And now I've uploaded that data set into uh, the data folder. Now if you're working on a local computer, let's see how to grab your data set and put it inside of this data folder. Our studio at the moment doesn't have the functionality to drag a data set and put it directly in a folder here to drag and drop. But hopefully they will add that one day. For now, you have to use your computer's finder or file explorer for this step. So what data set are we going to put in the data folder? It's the same Ebola data set we had used previously, but if you want to get it again, you just need to go to uh, bit.ly slash Ebola hyphen data, okay? And that'll bring you to this uh, Google Drive uh, stored file, and you click to download it, and then once you've downloaded it, then you can transfer it into your data folder. So now I'm going to transfer that data set from my downloads folder into the data folder of um, the Ebola analysis project. So I just click on it here and I press Command C or Control C on a Windows to copy it. And I click into the data folder and just paste that uh, in there. Now, of course, if you're on Windows, the process will look a little bit different, but I trust that you can figure out how to move a file on your computer from one folder to another. I believe in you. Now the next thing we will do is create a script inside of the uh, scripts folder. So we're going to open that up and then click on a new blank file and click on our script. So this is an alternative way of creating an R script. Usually you would use the file menu at the top and clicked on new script from there. But using uh, this option within the files tab helps you specify exactly where you want that script to go. So here we're going to click on uh, our script and then give it a name. I might give it a name like a main underscore analysis. So now we have the basic setup for our data analysis. This process of creating these subfolders may seem a little bit painful, but it is worth it to keep your project structure coherent and make it easy to share with others, as we will see later. So now that our folder structure is set up, we're going to go ahead now and do some data analysis. We're going to replicate some of the things we did in the previous lesson on the Ebola data set. So uh, go to the following URL, tinyurl.com slash Ebola hyphen script, and that'll bring you to this uh, gist where you can just copy this code snippet. So this is some of the stuff we did in the previous lesson. It will also be available in the uh, lesson text or the lesson manuscript, which if you, if you are on our website, you should be able to see. So go ahead and copy that and then paste that into your uh, main analysis script here. So let me go ahead and do that. Paste that into my main analysis script. So let's go through uh, this script. The first thing you start with is uh, the header where you can put your name and your date. So change it from John sample name Doe to your actual name. And then we have this line that loads packages. So it checks if the, the package Pacman is installed. If it's not installed, it installs it. And Pacman is a package manager that lets us both load and install any of those uh, packages there. So we run these lines. 
Okay. Okay, then in the next section, we're going to actually load our data set. So I've already put a bit of a snippet here about what data set uh, uploading will look like, or data set loading rather. So we're using here uh, the read CSV function, which comes from the readr package. So if you type a uh, readr, readr, uh, dot, dot, uh, sorry, colon, colon, I mean, then you have here the read CSV function coming from a uh, readr, as you can see. Readr is one of the packages that comes loaded with the tidyverse. The tidyverse, remember, is a meta package which uh, loads several other packages. In any case, we're using the read CSV function from readr, okay? And then we open up our quotes, and now here's where the magic happens. Here's where it becomes such a wonderful thing that we have set up a nice uh, RStudio project. Because we're working with an RStudio project, we can simply put our cursor into those quotes and press the tab key, and RStudio will show us all of the files and folders that are inside of our project folder. Okay, all the files and subfolders inside our main project folder. So we can see the data subfolder and we can see some other things there. So let's click on data for now, okay? And then we can press tab again and it would normally list the files that are inside of this subfolder. But in this case, there's only one file. So if we press tab, then it just fills in that file, okay? And notice also that you can get to this file directly by just pressing tab uh, here again and then clicking on Ebola Sierra Leone CSV, which it tells you is in the data subfolder. So we can click on that directly and load in uh, that data set. So now if we run this line, then we're going to import the uh, Ebola Sierra Leone data set and we can look in our environment and see that indeed we have imported uh, that Ebola Sierra Leone data set. Now this very short file path, the short path to the uh, data file that we have used is what's called a uh, relative file path. And the term relative is used in contrast to the term absolute. So you have relative file paths and absolute file paths. What is an absolute file path? I'm gonna paste one here. So the absolute file path for this Ebola Sierra Leone CSV is actually on my computer, user slash kendavidn slash dropbox slash max slash desktop slash blah, 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 all the way to Ebola Sierra Leone dot CSV. The relative path uh, defines this path relative to the home folder, the folder for the project. And the folder for our project is Ebola, Ebola Analysis 2. Okay, so it only starts from Ebola Analysis 2. So just to say that again, the uh, relative path defines the location of your file relative to the folder of your project. Okay, in this case, the folder of our project is Ebola Analysis 2. So the relative file path starts after that. Okay, data slash blah, 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 blah. And the reason we're able to use this relative file path successfully inside of this script is because we're working with an RStudio project. We could have imported the data set with this absolute path. So we could have written read underscore CSV and then that full path to the file on my computer. And then let's call that maybe Ebola 2. All right. We could have done that. And if we had done that, uh, you, would, you would successfully import the data set. Yeah, you can see Ebola 2 there. But if we tried to send a script that just had this line here, this absolute path to someone else's computer, it won't run obviously because they don't have this exact same folder structure. With the relative file path on the other hand, we can send this script, or rather not the script, but rather the whole uh, project, the whole project folder, we can send that to someone and this, um, this script will run because they have the same path. They have the same relative path because you set up the project folder that way. Hopefully that makes uh, some sense. Now let's talk a little bit about the here package. So the here package has this function which is called here. If I type here and then colon colon, we can see there's a function inside of the here package called here. Very nicely named uh, packages and functions from these developers. In any case, what we should do with here is uh, wrap, use it to wrap around our um, path. So rather than put just read CSV like that and then the naked path, it is generally a good idea to wrap that in here. Why should we do this? I must confess that at the moment, for an R script, it's not really necessary. But for an R markdown file, which we'll show you later, it will be useful to use here. So for now, just try to use it, even though it's not actually necessary. If you forget, that's fine. We'll remind you when we get to the R markdown chapter. In any case, just to show you that that works, I'm going to remove the, the old Ebola Sierra Leone data set from my environment and then re-import it with here. Okay, and we can see that it still works out fine. So now that we've seen how to import data in the context of RStudio projects, let's see how to export data in the context of RStudio projects. So we have this section here called uh, cases by district, and we have this function table, 
which if you recall, creates a one-way or two-way tabulation of variables in your data set. I'm going to uh, run that function and let's see what it gives us. It gives us this district tab thing. If I expand my console a little bit, we can see what the district tab is. It's basically a count of the number of cases in our Ebola Sierra Leone data set that uh, belong to or pertain to each district. So you can see all the districts there, the count, and the uh, percentage uh, proportions there. Oh, those aren't really percentages, those are just proportions. So that thing is mislabeled, as I think I've mentioned uh, before. In any case, this is the kind of thing that you might want to send to some other collaborators or communicate to the public. It's a nice nugget of data that you might want to output out. And so, in order to do that, what function might you use? You might use the write CSV function. So there's a function called write CSV, and that's going to write a CSV file. You can think of a CSV file as a kind of a simplified Excel file, if you are not already familiar with CSVs. In any case, um, we're going to write a CSV, and let's take a quick look at the help file for uh, write CSV so we can know how to use this function. So we type question mark and then write CSV, we can see that the write CSV function lets us write a data frame to a delimited file. You don't need to know what a delimited file is. Basically, we're saving our data set, we're saving our data frame, okay? And if we scroll down a bit, we can see what the main arguments are. The main arguments are X, which is the data frame that you wanna save, and file, which is the uh, path to where you want to save it. And if we scroll down a bit more, then we can see some examples of how this is used. You have here write CSV, and then the data object that you wanna save, and then the name of the file, the path of the file that you want to save. So now let's go ahead and use this write CSV function. The first argument, like we said, is x. So x equals district tab, this tabulation that we want to save. And then uh, what is our file? What is our file path? So the file path is actually going to be the relative path of where we want to save the file. What does that mean? So we open up a pair of quotes, and then similar to when we were importing a data set, we can just press the tab key, so let me move that away, and press the tab key, and our studio will show us the folders in our project. So now I'm going to click on outputs here, because that's where I want to put this output file, and then I'm going to type what I actually want to name this file. So I might want to name it something like a district tabulation, district tabulation, okay? dot uh, csv remember to put the extension there since we're saving it as a csv file you need to put the extension there dot csv and now we can run that line and how do we know that it has, it has worked we need to go to our files tab so i open up the files tab here and we can see here inside of outputs that we have the district tabulation um, file and if you want to make sure that it's working, you can rerun this line and make sure that the uh, time modified or the date modified column there changes. So I'm going to give it a few seconds and then I run this again. And notice that it's going to go from 642 here to 643. Okay, so that means that the data set is updated. We can open up this CSV by clicking on it directly and then clicking on view file. And we can see it in this uh, a raw text format. Or if you're working on your local computer, you can open up that file by clicking on it from your uh, file finder or your file explorer. Let me show you what that looks like in my case. So I go to the Ebola analysis 2 uh, folder, I open up the outputs subfolder, and then I have here district tabulation.csv. I can open that up, and if I zoom in a bit, you can see that this is that data frame that we had outputted uh, from our script. If you're working on RStudio Cloud, you will need to, of course, export that data set from RStudio Cloud before you can open it in Excel or some other similar software. So I, here I have my RStudio Cloud window. I'm in the Files tab, and then I go to Project, Outputs, and I can click on it, uh, or check, click on that checkbox, and then this uh, gear icon there, and then click on Export. And that will let me download that file and allow me to work on it on my local computer. Now the beauty of this setup is that whenever the input data changes for some reason, maybe the people on the field send you updated data, then you can just rerun the exact same script and you'll get also an updated output. We can test this now by changing slightly um, the output of the district tab. We're going to arrange it in descending order of the number of cases. What I mean by that is we're going to wrap this district tab object in the arrange function. I haven't shown you the arrange function yet, but the arrange function does what it seems to suggest it does, which is arrange the uh, data frame or the table in terms of a specific variable. The variable we're going to use here is the n variable. 
Let me just show you what district tab looks like first. So I just run district tab. Re recall that this shows us the counts of cases by district, and it might be useful to arrange that in descending order of um, cases. So if I run arrange district tab N, it gives us the table in ascending order, but we want it in descending order, so we just put a negative N there, okay? And we can save that uh, as the object uh, district tab arranged. So I'm gonna save that as district tab arranged, okay? And I'm going to save, I'm going to overwrite this district tabulation with this new object, district tab arranged. So I take this, I copy that, and I replace the, uh, the X argument there, okay? And so I'm gonna run these lines. Let's run district tab arranged, and then the write CSV function. And now the district tabulation has been updated. We can open it and see now that it is uh, arranged in descending orders, first with Kailahu, then with Kenema, and so on and so forth. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned, but this only applies to people working on a local computer, is that if you want to um, open up the folder you're looking at in your files tab in our studio, if you want to quickly open that up with your computer's file finder or file explorer, there's an RStudio option for that. You can click here on more and then click on a show folder in new window and that will open up this folder in your computer's file finder or explorer. So let's go ahead and try that. And so what that did for me is open up the exact same folder I can see here in my file explorer and that obviously will come in handy in certain cases. So now that you know how to export a data output, let's look at how to export a plot output. I switched over to RStudio Cloud because my regular local RStudio was being a bit finicky. But here we have this section, Visualize Categorical Variables. And uh, if we run this, we will see that it gives us a plot which you should have seen before. And this is the frequency of the categorical levels across your data frame. Um, it shows you the counts of districts, the counts of sex, the counts of status, and so on and so forth. This is the kind of plot we might want to export for a paper or to send to a collaborator or for some other reason. To export this, this is actually a ggplot, this thing. Um, and so we can use the ggsave function to export it, okay? So ggsave, and if we're not sure what the uh, arguments for ggsave are, we can either consult the help file or we can just press tab inside of ggsave and it'll show us those arguments. So here we can see the first uh, argument is file name, which is the plot to save, okay? And so we're going to save this one, the catic vars plot, which stands for categorical vars plot. And then the next argument is uh, the file name, that is the file path that we want to export to. In our case, it will again be the outputs folder. So let's uh, shrink this section a little bit so we can see more of our script. So it's again inside of the outputs folder, output. And what should we name this file? We could name it something like a categorical plot, categorical plot. Okay. And the extension you put after this is going to determine what type of uh, image you save. Are you gonna save a PNG or a PDF or an SVG and so on? ggsave supports uh, many different formats. If you look at the help file for ggsave, you can see all the formats it supports. In our case, we're going to export a PNG file, which is just one type of image. So we run that line, and it gives us some outputs in the console. It says saving 1.51 by 1.82 inch image. Okay, and if we, if we look now into our files tab, all right, then we can see that that categorical plot has been saved. If we wanted to export a PDF instead, we could just uh, duplicate this line. Okay, or maybe in addition, we want to export a PDF. We duplicate that line and put PDF, and we run that. And now we have also a PDF. Maybe. But if you actually open up those files, you might notice that they're a bit mangled because they don't have the right sizing. So if we open this one, for example, categorical plot PDF, we can see that the size is just not right. So we should look at the help function for ggsave to see how this sizing argument works. We could do question mark ggsave, or I will introduce you to a new shortcut, which is just a function f1. Function f1, when you put your cursor anywhere in the function, will pull up the help file for that function. So we can look at the help file here for um, ggsave, and we see that we have a, a width and a height argument. So we wanna replace um, whatever the default was with our specific width and height. In my case, I'll just try to do a square plot. So let's go and do, um, instead of size units, which I was trying before, I'll do width equals um, 10 and height equals 10. And the default unit is inches. So let's see what that looks like when I run that one. So I reopen my categorical plot PDF, okay? And that is starting to look uh, much better. It's much more reasonably sized. Now we can repeat the same thing for this uh, numeric variable plot. So the numvars plot, let's uh, pull this up to the center of our screen. If we run this and we look at what the numvars plot looks like, it is the um, histograms of the two numeric columns in our data set. 
Our data set actually has just one main numeric column, which is age, but ID is being misinterpreted as a numeric column. We'll talk about how to avoid that later. So we can just copy this line and just replace the object, the catic vars plot here, with the nums, num vars plot. And instead of categorical plot PNG, we could call this numerical plot PNG. Okay. And maybe we should also use the width and height argument so we can get a reasonably sized um, document. And so that's basically it. We have reproduced some parts of the analysis that we did on the Ebola data set, but in the context of an RStudio project. And you have seen that this allows you to easily import data sets and export any outputs in an organized way. This setup will also make it very easy to share your data analysis with other people. So you can take this folder, this project folder that we have created, and uh, zip that up, or you don't even have to zip it, you can just share it directly in an email or with a service like Dropbox to someone else. And when they receive that folder, they just need to double click on the .rproj file, and that will bring up the RStudio project, and they'll be able to run all of the scripts that you have written. And because you've used those relative file paths, then everything will run just as though it were on your computer. So this is full-fledged reproducibility. However, for long-term collaboration, sending uh, folders back and forth or using a service like Dropbox might have some issues. So most developers and most data scientists will actually use a service called Git or a tool called Git and a service called GitHub and GitLab, which let you work with Git. But the topic of Git is a bit too advanced for this short course. If you really want to look into it, the resource I would recommend is uh, the book Intro to R. So search intro to R, uh, dot com, intro to R dot com. And here there is a chapter on Git. If you scroll through here, there is a nice chapter on a version control with Git and GitHub. And I think this is the best introduction for beginners that I've seen. So if you really uh, need Git for maybe your collaborative workflow at the moment, this is what I will recommend. We will eventually do a course on Git and GitHub but just not here right at the start. So congratulations, you now know how to set up and how to use our studio projects. Hopefully you see the value of organizing your analysis in this way. Projects give you a coherent structure for your data analyses and they make it easy to revisit, to revise and to share your work with others. They're going to be a foundation of much of your work as a data analyst going forward. But that's it for now, I will see you in the next video. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. R Markdown is one of the most amazing parts of working with R. It lets you combine free text and code into a single reproducible document that you can output to a variety of formats. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to work with this wonderful tool. So let's get started. So here are some of the learning objectives we have for this lesson. If you like, you can pause the video and read through these, but we're going to come back to them at the end of the lesson. So as always, you want to first open our studio and then create a new project. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project now by going to the File menu and then New Project. This will look a bit different if you are on RStudio Cloud, of course. And then you click on a New Directory. And I'm going to just put this one on my desktop. So I leave it on desktop there. And I can call this something like a R Markdown, R Markdown Intro. Okay, Intro and then uh, create project. And then now I'm going to create two folders inside of my project, two subfolders. I go to the files pane and I click on this new folder button here and I create one called data and then I create another one called uh, RMD. So now that I have my two folders, uh, data and RMD, I'm going to go ahead and create my first R Markdown file. So to do this, you go to the file menu here at the top click on a new file and then R Markdown. If you've never used R Markdown before, you may be prompted at this stage to install a number of packages. That's fine, go ahead and install those. And once you're done, you should get this dialog box here. You can leave all the defaults the way they are and just click directly on OK over there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Now let me expand my source pane a little bit so I can see a bit more of this document.
And now if you scroll through this document, you'll notice uh, two main parts of the document. There are these sections where you have a uh, free text, and there are these uh, small chunks here where you have R code. So it's composed of free text and R code. Go ahead and uh, change some of the text here just to see how this works. It works like a regular document. So I'm going to go ahead and change this from this is an R, this is an R markdown document to this is an amazing R markdown document, just so we can see what it looks like when you make a change. Now that you've done that, go ahead and save this file with Control S or Command S, depending on your system. And I would recommend saving it in the RMD folder of your uh, project. You can save it with a file with a file name like uh, my first R markdown. Okay, and let's put some underscores there just so it looks like a very a clean name. And now we can go ahead and render this document. There's a special word for render in the context of R markdown, and that is knit. And there's a button to knit this document there. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. And after a little while, you should see this pop-up window that shows you a knitted uh, HTML file. As you can see, the free text that was written here has been rendered almost the exact same. And some of the code has been evaluated. So for example, summary cars was evaluated there. And we see the actual summary of the cars data frame. You may also note that some formatting has been applied in the output document. For example, here you had these uh, pairs of asterisks surrounding the word knit. And when uh, that is rendered, you have knit in bold there. That's an example of markdown syntax, which we're going to see very soon. Now go ahead and close this pop-up window. So I'm going to go ahead and close this pop-up window now. And go back to your Files tab and observe now that inside of the RMD folder, you actually have that output HTML that you just created. So this R markdown was knitted into that HTML. And if you click on that HTML, you can actually open it in your web browser. So here I have the document in my uh, Google Chrome web browser, and you can open that in any other web browser. This HTML file is a portable file, so in theory you could send it to someone, and they would also be able to open it in their own web browsers. If you're on RStudio Cloud, you may need to first download that file, of course. Hopefully you remember how to do that. You click on the checkbox, then you click on the More icon, and then there should be an option there to export any file that you're working with. So now we can go back to the R Markdown file and observe its parts. The first part is what is called YAML, Y-A-M-L, which stands for uh, Yet Another Markup Language. It's a bit of a funny name that a bunch of programmers came up with. And what this is, is it defines some of the options for your document. So we're going to go ahead and change this one specifically here, this output, in order to show you all the different outputs or some of the different outputs that our markdown is able to create. So the first thing I'm going to try is a Word document. To get a Word document, I just type instead of HTML document there, I'm going to type Word document. And then I click again on the Knit button. And as long as you have a copy of Microsoft Word or LibreOffice or something else that can open a docx file, you should see the output docx file. You can see our, this is an amazing R markdown. You can see the same outputs and the same plots there. So let's go ahead and close that. We can also see that in our files pane now, we have that docx file. The next format we'll try is a PowerPoint slide presentation. For this, you're going to type the following, PowerPoint underscore presentation, and then click on knit again. And you get an output like this with the title on a separate page, and then each section on a separate slide. As you can see, it's not perfect in this case, but you can work on it and perfect it by changing some of the formatting options, which maybe we will see later. Another common output format you're going to want to use is a PDF. So we can change this output now to a PDF underscore document. But if you try to knit it right now, you're probably going to get an error message because our markdown requires something called LaTeX in order to render PDFs, and most computers don't have LaTeX installed by default. So you're going to have to install LaTeX. LaTeX is a very big application. There is an R package that will let you install a smaller version of LaTeX, which is called a TinyTech. So type into your console install.packages TinyTech. It looks like text, but it's really pronounced tech. Data science people like to judge each other based on whether or not they know the right pronunciation for TinyTech slash LaTeX. So make sure you pronounce that right. And you run that line of code. I won't run it because I already have TinyTech installed. And once the TinyTech R package is installed, now you can install the real TinyTech application on your computer. So you type in TinyTech, 
And then you see there's a function here that is install tiny tech, and you just run that directly in your console. Although it's called tiny tech, it's still a fairly large file, about 100 or 200 megabytes, so it might take a while to download and install. Well, once that's done, you can clap your hands in glee because now you can actually uh, knit a PDF document. So go ahead now and click on knit again at the top of your R Markdown file. And you should see a document that looks like this pop up with your uh, PDF uh, output. Now those are some of the most common outputs for R Markdown. I'll show you a few more though that come in extension packages. The first one is called Pretty Doc. So go ahead first and install the package called Pretty Doc. Okay, so you can type this code in, install.packages, and then uh, pretty doc. And then once you've run that, you can change your output here to the following. You can change it to pretty doc, and then colon, colon, HTML pretty. Hopefully you remember uh, the colon, colon uh, indicates that you're getting this thing, this function, from that package. So put that in there, and then click on knit again. And now you should have a slightly more attractive uh, HTML file. Now there are many different themes for Pretty Doc that you can use. I'll show you one particular one that I like. So I'm going to paste in this code here, okay? And uh, let's get rid of those spaces. So it says uh, output Pretty Doc HTML Pretty colon, and then here you have another tab theme Leonids, okay? Make sure you get the tabbing right. Here you have one tab, and there you have two tabs. Otherwise, uh, this uh, YAML won't work. So then you can click Knit. And you should see an output uh, that looks like this. The beauty of this output is that if you zoom out, then it gives you a nice sidebar so that your page is not too wide. Generally, if your page is too wide, then uh, it's hard to read. Now the last format I'll show you, and possibly the most exciting, is called Flex Dashboard. So go ahead and run this code to install the package Flex Dashboard on your computer. And once that is done, you can use the following output here, Flex Dashboard colon colon Flex underscore Dashboard. And it'll give you this dashboard looking uh, output, but the dashboard doesn't have any tabs at the moment. A key feature of dashboards is that they should have tabs. So let's go ahead and change something very quickly so we can get tabs. We're going to change this uh, hashtag hashtag to a single hashtag. That'll change it from a second level header to a first level header. And the first level headers indicate uh, tabs for the flex dashboard output. So now that we've knitted again, we now have uh, two tabs in this document, and you can click between them. This is a very simple dashboard, but they can get arbitrarily complex, and they can get very cool looking. So if you're creating dashboards, or you need to create dashboards, this is a tool that I would recommend you investigate further, Flex Dashboard. Now there are two main ways to look at your R Markdown file while you are editing it. There's the source mode, and there's the visual mode. So far we've been looking at the source mode. But if you click on this button here at the top, you can switch over to visual mode. And visual mode will give you a nice looking uh, Microsoft Word uh, type document with the actual formatting um, applied on the text. So it's much easier to read and much easier to uh, look through. If you have an older R Studio, rather than the uh, visual button being there, you might have a little A button that lives somewhere here that you might need to click on in order to get into this uh, visual mode. So what's the main difference between these two modes? In source mode, you have to write everything with markdown. So for example, if you want to make this bold, you have to use the markdown syntax for that. But in the visual mode, you don't really need to use the markdown. What can you do if you want to make something bold? You can just highlight it and then click on the toolbar there for B. And you have a number of other familiar looking things on the toolbar there. Bold, italics, code, uh, headers, and so on. But although this visual mode is much easier to use, we will spend a little bit of time talking about the source mode the markdown syntax for a few reasons. One is that often the visual mode can get quite buggy and you have to return to the source mode to understand what's going wrong. The second reason is that knowing markdown syntax is useful in general outside of our markdown. And lastly, you might be forced to use an RStudio version that doesn't have the visual mode installed yet. For example, RStudio collaborative mode on the web doesn't have this uh, visual mode yet. So now let's talk a little bit about some of that markdown syntax. The first thing you might want to think about is the headers. So there are a number of header levels. I think there's six header levels. You can either put uh, one hashtag there and that'll be the top level, header level one, or you can put two hashtags. Let's do that now. Two hashtags. That'll be header level two, three hashtags, header le level three, and so on. Let's go ahead and look at this in visual mode so we can see what that would look like. Okay. 
as you can see, the header level size is decreasing. So this is similar to what it will look like when you output it to any of those formats, the PPTX, the DOCX, and so on. Now let's go back to the source mode. And actually, I just remember that there's actually a quick reference that you can consult uh, in, our, in our studio. If you go to the Help tab or the Help menu option, and you click here on Markdown Quick Reference, over here in your uh, Help tab, you will actually see some of the stuff we're talking about here. So we just talked about the headers. It goes from header one to five, but here you only see the first three. The next thing we'll talk about is how to italicize and bold things. So if you want to italicize a, um, a piece of text, you just wrap it in a, a pair of asterisks. If you want to bold it, then you wrap it in uh, two pairs of asterisks. So we're going to do that for markdown there. Okay. And when you go back to your visual mode, you will notice that uh, amazing is now uh, italicized and markdown is now uh, bolded. The last thing we'll talk about is how to make bullet points in our markdown. So it's very simple. You just put a hyphen and then tab, and then you type your bullet. So this is going to be bullet one, okay? Then a hyphen tab and bullet two. One thing you have to be careful about is when you're writing in the raw markdown mode, you need to leave, leave spaces between uh, different sections of your text. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I try to type here, um, these are bullets, these are bullets, and I go back now to the visual mode, uh, this section from lines 17 to 19 will become squished together because it's interpreting all of this as just one line. So if I go there, you can see here it says these are bullets, bullet one, bullet two. That did not work. So I have to go back now to my source and actually separate the text from the bullets. And then it should now work. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's put the tab back there. Okay. And now if we go back to visual mode, now we should have the actual bullet. So you need to make sure to leave in the necessary uh, spacing when you're working in that source uh, markdown mode. Another thing I'll quickly show you is how to add hyperlinks to your document. So in our source mode, here's how you do a hyperlink. Let's say you wanted to link to uh, the Graph Courses uh, website. You would say uh, visit our website here. And we want this here to be a clickable link. So we put it in square brackets. Okay. And then in uh, parentheses, we put in the uh, URL we want to go to. In our case, it is HTTPS and then slash slash the graph courses, uh, dot org. And when we go back to our visual mode, we can see now, we should be able to see that this is now a link, okay, that is clickable, and that will take us to uh, the graph courses website. Next, let's look at how to put an image into your R Markdown document. So for this, I actually recommend you first test it out in visual mode. So I'm going to go back to visual mode. And then uh, we're going to put the image here. So to put an image in visual mode, it's as simple as dragging and dropping into the file. So I'm going to go ahead and drag a file that I have here, an image that I have here, okay, this one. And I drop that there, and now we can see that the image has been embedded in the document. And we have this uh, option here, or this little button, that lets us uh, drag that to resize it. Now to observe what the syntax for embedding that image looks like, we can go to the source. And what we see is that it's a bit similar to the syntax for the link, with the exception that uh, you have first a, uh, an exclamation point. So let me go ahead and type that from scratch. So this is not so necessary for now. So all we have is a, um, an exclamation point, and then square brackets, and then in, uh, in a pair of parentheses, you have the path to your, um, to your image. And in the square brackets here, you can put uh, the caption for the image. We can say this is an image, okay? And let's delete this other one. And now go back to the visual mode, and we'll see that that image is embedded. So when you resize the image, it adds on that additional piece of a markdown that tells us, uh, that tells it the document what size to make the image. Now what actually happened when you dragged that image into your RMD file is that our studio created a new subfolder inside of the folder where your RMD lives called images and put that picture there. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if we go now to our files tab, okay, and look at that, um, RMD, so look at this RMD folder that we created where we put our R markdown. We can see that a new folder there has been created by our studio called images, and it puts that sample image there. So you can see that now how the, this address comes about. So the address is images sample.jpg. Uh, so this is a relative path as you might uh, have intuited. So, so actually right now we can open up that folder in our computer's um, file explorer or finder by clicking here and then um, show folder a new window. And we can see that uh, folder with images. So if I dropped another image in there now, so let me just drop one of my random screenshots in there, okay? 
then we can actually reference this image in a similar way to the way we reference the other one. So let me quickly do that. I'll call this one a sample two, okay? And I can go back to my uh, our markdown in source mode, and I'm going to put in the second image here called sample two JPEG, okay? And if I go now to visual mode, you can see that that other um, image has been uh, added to the document. That is as far as I'm going to go in teaching you markdown syntax. You're going to learn a lot of it as you go along. So usually what I would recommend is first you try out the feature in visual mode, and then you go back to the source mode to see what the actual markdown uh, looks like for that particular uh, formatting feature. One additional thing to note about this YAML metadata section is that you can actually customize it with the output options uh, graphic user interface of RStudio. Specifically, beside the knit button, you have that gear icon, and if you click on it, there's this option here called output options. And here you can select the format. So for example, if we change this from HTML here to a word, and we click on OK, then it changes the actual uh, YAML there. Okay, And we can uh, customize it with a bit more um, specificity. So for example, with HTML, we can choose to include a table of contents. And then we can decide how many, uh, what's the depth for that table of contents. Do we want just first, second, and third level headers? Or do we want all the headers and so on? We can change the syntax hi highlighting. We can apply a CSS file. Again, we can't really go too much into depth because that will take uh, 20 hours. So you're just going to have to go ahead and um, play with these and see how they work. So next thing we're going to do is look at uh, code chunks. But uh, before we look at that, let's actually clean up this document a bit so we don't have too many uh, extraneous things. So I'm going to get rid of most of these things which we don't need. Actually, I get rid of all of it for now, but you don't have to do all this deleting. I just want our document to be very clean and smooth. So now I'll show you how to insert a new R code chunk. So to insert an R code chunk, you need this weird syntax. You need three back ticks, and then a pair of um, braces, and then R, and then you press a bunch of enters, and then you close that code chunk with uh, another three back ticks. And this is an R code chunk where you can type uh, R code. Of course, that is very painful to type, so you should never do that by hand. What you should do instead is either use the menu option there. You have that button there, that C, that C, uh, that green C. And if you click on that, you have uh, the R code chunk option. You can use other languages, as you can see there. So if you click on that, then you get a code chunk. But I really do recommend that you use the shortcut for this because you're going to do this many, many times. So the shortcut for this is uh, on Mac, Command Option I. Okay, and you do that. And on Windows, I think it's um, Control Alt I. And so you get your code chunk that way. So as you can see, the code chunk is usually a slightly different color from the rest of the document. And if you want to run code that's in the code chunk, you can either put your cursor in the code chunk and just press a Command Enter as you normally would uh, in an R script. Or there's a little green play button at the top right of each code chunk, which you can click on, and that will also uh, run the code that's in that chunk. Now, as you've noticed, by default, the output of that chunk, that code chunk, is being put right here inside of your R Markdown file. Some people like that, but some people like me hate it, so we prefer to just show it only in the console. So to do that, you're going to click on this uh, gear icon here beside your knit button, and over there, there's an option to change from chunk output inline to chunk output in console. So I prefer chunk output in console, but it's really up to you what you prefer. And I'll click on our remove existing output. And now when I run this code, it won't show up in the uh, RMD itself. It'll show up only in the uh, console, as you can see there. Now the next thing we're going to talk about are uh, code chunk options. But before that, let me just go ahead and knit this document so we can see what it looks like at the moment. So I get rid of these uh, extraneous chunks. And let's put some uh, free text just so we have something to contrast with the chunks. So I put this as some free text, okay. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and let's also change the title so we have a nice title. We can say my first our markdown document, okay. And now we can knit that and see what it looks like. So here is what that document looks like at the moment. Now let's think about some ways to modify the output of this code chunk, this R code chunk where we just added two and two. Now the first chunk option is a name for your chunk. You can name your chunk, and the way to name it is after this R um, letter there, you just type any name, so something like chunk name, okay? And uh, in general, I would recommend you only use letters here for your chunk names because other characters tend to give errors, so I recommend just letters. There we're using the camel case to give that chunk a name. 
Uh, the main usefulness of chunk names at the moment will not be obvious to you. I'm just showing you that it exists. It's used for a cross-referencing between chunks um, later on, and it's also helpful for error debugging, but those are intermediate things which I won't talk about. Just know that you can name your chunks in case you see it uh, somewhere. The next parameter or option for your chunk is the echo option. Echo can be either true, which is on, or false, which is off. Let me show you what that looks like. The default uh, for echo is true. So what we're going to do now is change that to echo equals false. Okay, notice what I did there. I just put a comma after the chunk name, and I put echo equals false. I could also have, uh, in case I didn't want to name my chunk, I could also have something like this. Okay. Now, uh, what is going to happen? First of all, let's look at this in visual mode and notice that it won't make any difference. It will look the same. Okay, echo equals false. And now if I niche that, this code chunk is not going to be echoed in the output. I will only see the result of the code chunk. So let's uh, knit that and see what that means. So as you can see, we only see the result of the code chunk, that is 4. We don't see the actual code that was evaluated, the 2 plus 2. That's because code echo is turned off. The next option I'll show you is eval. Eval stands for evaluate. So I'll stay here in visual mode. And I put a comma here, and eval equals, oh, it even gives me the option, eval equals false. Okay. And when you turn off eval, you're going to basically not evaluate your code. Now, if we, if we knit this document at the moment, it's going to give us no output. And I'll explain why in a second. So it gives us no output. But if we turn off, uh, if we remove this option, echo equals false, which brings us back to the default of echo equals true. And now we knit it. Let's see what's going to happen. So what we can see now is that the code is echoed. The code shows up, but it's not evaluated. And therefore, we don't see uh, the result. Hopefully, that makes sense. Now, you can also use the option include equals false. Include equals false just means don't echo and don't eval. So it's the same thing as putting those two together. And when you knit this, you'll get, again, no output. You're not going to see the code, and you're not going to see the output of the code. You just see this as some free text and nothing else in that document. The next option I'll show you is the message option, message. And what message does is it tells R whether or not to show any messages generated in the code. This code doesn't generate any message, so it's not uh, relevant here. I'll put in code that I know generates message, uh, a message, and that's a library tidyverse. Okay. So if I run li library tidyverse without any chunk options, let's see what's going to happen. So I knit that, and we have a bunch of ugly package startup messages. As you can imagine, this is probably not something you want to show your audience, so you're going to want to hide that. In order to hide that, you use a message equals a false. And when we knit that now, all those messages will be hidden, and we won't see that, that output. As you can see, this is much neater. Now, for all of these options that I've showed you, there's actually a trick to getting them, and that's so you can click on this gear icon here in the uh, our Markdown chunk, and it will show you all of those different options, whether to show warnings, messages, uh, whether to show the output, uh, just the output only, the code and output, and so on. If we try something now like uh, show output only, it will update our document with echo equals false, and so uh, you don't actually have to type out the parameter yourself. You can use that option, but it's helpful to know what exactly uh, those are. The next thing I'll show you are what are called uh, global options. These are options that you can set, which will apply to all of the code chunks uh, below. And the best way to um, get to these is by opening up a new R Markdown. Whenever you open up a new R Markdown with the File menu, so File and then New File R Markdown, in the very first code chunk, we're going to see here how to access those global options. So it's inside of the knitter package, you get this ops chunk op object, then you get the uh, set component of that, and then you set the uh, global um, option. So here we're setting the global option echo equals true. Let's bring that into our first R markdown here and make a new, um, a new chunk, and I'm going to put that code in there. And we're going to set now, um, let's say we wanted the global option here to be echo equals false. Echo equals false. That means don't show the R code, only show the output. Then for any code chunks below, for example, this one here, 2 plus 2, and then this next one here, 3 plus 3, we're only going to show the output because we've set the global chunk option to echo uh, equals false. So let's go ahead and knit that and see if that worked. So as you can see, we only see the outputs. We don't see the actual code, which means echo equals false worked. But usually, you don't want to show this global chunk option in um, your output. So for that option as well, 
Uh, for that chunk as well, you're going to want to set echo equals uh, false. Okay. So now that you knit that, then you have the kind of output that you probably want. There's one more button at the top right of these code chunks that we haven't talked about, and that is this one in the middle here. What that one does is it runs all code chunks above. So if I click on that there, it's going to run this chunk, this chunk, and any other chunks that we had above, but in this case, we only have two. So as you can see, that actually runs that code chunk there. Just to make sure you're, you are aware or you believe me, let's do that again. And now you can see that this updates to seven because it's running this code chunk and giving us seven there. Now let's talk about something called inline code. Inline code is going to be very helpful when you're creating any kind of report. So what is inline code? So let's take the example of the women data set. So imagine that in the women data set, we wanted to calculate uh, the maximum or find the maximum height in this data set. So remember this data set here, is what, this is what it looks like. You have a bunch of heights and a bunch of weights. So imagine that I wanted to get the maximum women height, okay? And I wanted to output that into my R markdown. I might want to write something like this. The maximum women's height is, height is, okay? And put the value there, that maximum there, okay? So what I could do is I could open up an inline R code chunk by clicking on the back, back tick or by pressing the back tick and then uh, putting in that code there, all right? So maximum women height and then closing that back tick there, so closing that small uh, code section. And if I run that now, let's go ahead and first of all delete this. Okay, now I'll leave that in actually. So let's knit that right now. Okay, and it seems it didn't work because I missed a crucial thing, so I'll leave in this mistake in the edit just so it reminds you of how to do this because this is a common mistake. Uh, so instead of just putting this uh, in just back ticks, you actually have to put first the R letter somewhere in this chunk here or somewhere in this uh, section. So you put first R and then the code, and now uh, knitter or R markdown will interpret it as R code, and now it should give us the maximum woman's height is 72. And if you want, you could predefine a variable. So I'm going to predefine a variable here that is max height, okay? And I can give that variable here, okay? And that will also give us the same output. As you can see, it gives us that same output. The maximum woman's height is 72. This feature is obviously going to be super useful when you're creating papers or uh, any kind of report because you don't have to type in your um, numbers manually. You can get those numbers dynamically from your actual data. So if your data changes because of some error, for example, you don't have to go back and change whatever you wrote before. You can just re the document and all of your numbers will be automatically updated. Now the next thing we'll talk about is uh, how to output tables into your R Markdown document. So I'm going to make a new section uh, in this R Markdown and just call it uh, tables, okay? And uh, there are three main packages that we recommend for outputting tables in your R Markdown. So the first thing I'll show you is how do tables print if you just uh, put the table directly. So remember that women is that table, okay? This is an example. Usually your tables would be slightly more uh, interesting than that. So now I click on knit and you'll see that it outputs the table as just a raw text like that, which obviously is not very pretty if you're creating a report. So there are three packages that we recommend for printing tables, and I'll just paste in this code here that will uh, help you install and load all of them. There's the uh, flex table package. Flex table we recommend for very, simple pa for very simple tables that you want to output to many different formats. So this supports uh, PowerPoint, DocX, PDF, basically all the different formats. So this is what we would recommend for a simple table, many formats. GT I recommend for a complex table, but one that you mostly want to keep to uh, the HTML format. You'll see that the HTML format is the, the most uh, flexible. And finally, Reactable, uh, you, you, you want to use if you want to output a large table that you want people to be able to uh, scroll through. So I'll quickly show you what each of those look like. So run that code to install those packages. And I'm just going to um, uh, print the women data set with those three different uh, packages. Flex table. Flex table package has a function in it called flex table. Okay. So we'll put flex table, flex table women. Then a GT has a function called GT. So we do that as well. And then reactable also has the um, eponymous function uh, reactable. So we do that as well. And now I'm going to uh, knit this document, and we should see those three tables uh, outputted. So now we can see them. This is the uh, flex table table. It looks quite nice, quite simple. You can make this uh, quite complex. 
This is the GT table. It also looks simple, but you can make this very, very complex. I'll show you some examples in a second. And this is what the reactable looks like. As you can see with the reactable, you can actually um, go through the different rows. So it shows you the first 10 rows, and you can click on this button to advance to the rest of the rows. So you could put like a data set that had 500 or maybe even 1,000 rows into your HTML file and just send that to someone, and they'll be able to access that data uh, that way. Now, to learn how to use the table making packages is beyond the scope of this course, but I recommend you spend some time uh, looking at the help files for these or looking at their websites. So just Google Flex Table R package, go to the website, the help website, and there'll be some wonderful walkthroughs there that show you how to make some beautiful tables. One thing you can use to inspire yourself for table making is actually uh, the RStudio table making contest. So if you Google RStudio table contest, uh, a bunch of nerds on the internet um, apply to this table contest. And let's look at the 2021, for example. They all submit tables made with different R packages, and a bunch of people in um, RStudio judge which are the best. And you can see what some of these look like. You can see this is an example table. As you can see, that's pretty, uh, pretty nice looking. Or here you have a dynamic table that's created, I think, with Shiny. And uh, here you have a table that has some radial plots. So you can really uh, go wild with these uh, table packages. Uh, now let's quickly talk about plots. The main thing you might want to know about plots is how to customize the size of your plots. So I'm going to make a new um, chunk here, and um, or first a new header actually, a new header and plots, okay? And then I'm going to make a new ggplot. So first let's load the ggplot package, or maybe the whole tidyverse. Actually, let's take this pacman pload and put it at the start of our markdown. Sorry about this very uh, scattered markdown. Generally, you should put your package loading functions at the start of your um, of your script. So let's add to that tidyverse, okay? And let's run that. And ggplot, as you may recall, is a package that comes as part of the uh, tidyverse me meta package. So I'm going to do a very quick ggplot. ggplot, um, let's say women, and then plus geom histogram. And then let's do aesthetics. Let's just plot the heights of the different women um, on a histogram. Actually, I changed my mind. Let's do a geom, um, geom point and do a scatter plot uh, with height and uh, weight. Okay. So if I just run that code here, we should see what our plot looks like. So this is a scatter plot of weight against height. Now, if I knit that document, it's going to show us that uh, plot output inside of our output HTML. Let's see what that looks like. You can see that plot output there. Now to customize the size of that output figure, I recommend using this button here, options, and then clicking on use custom figure size. And you can customize the width and the height in inches. So we can put something here like uh, maybe we want a, a very um, a very squeezed up plot. So we do width of three, width of three and height of seven. Okay. And I press enter. I think I need to zoom out a bit more. Okay, but it gives us the options there. Fig height equals five, fig width equals three. If I knit that again, you have a much more squeezed um, figure. Okay, as you can see, it's quite horizontally uh, compressed. So that's how you can modify the plot options in your uh, RMD. So that is as far as we're going to go in terms of the fundamentals of our markdown, but we've really only touched the very surface. So if you want to dig deeper, one way you can inspire yourself is by going to the uh, gallery. Our studio has a nice gallery. If you go to this link here, which I'll paste in here, uh, tinyurl.com slash rmd hyphen gallery, and you click on there, you'll see a bunch of different uh, output formats that other people have used um, that our markdown or our studio has compiled. So you can see a bunch of uh, interactive documents with cool maps, HTML widgets. Um, you can see some cool dashboards using that flesh, flex dashboard tool that I showed you. You can see different presentations. You have PowerPoint presentations, but you also have a bunch of different um, HTML format presentations that let you do very cool things. Uh, you can use R Markdown for books. Uh, many people uh, write books in R Markdown, specifically an extension called uh, Bookdown. You can use R Markdown to make very simple websites, as you can see there. Uh, you can use reusable templates. For example, if you're writing your thesis or if you're writing for a specific journal, you can use some of the templates that exist for those. Uh, you can use it to create a package vignettes, as you can see here. A vignette is just a small compilation of how the package works. Most of the uh, HTML files that we're using as part of this Graph Courses course are also created with R Markdown. So as you can see, R Markdown is really an incredible tool that's very uh, versatile. One small thing that comes to mind now that I'm talking about the beauty of R Markdown is uh, what is Quarto. 
So because our markdown has been so successful, the R Studio team is trying to bring the beauty of R markdown to many other uh, programming languages like uh, Python and Julia and Observable. And so they're creating this new thing called a uh, Quarto. And Quarto is really going to be the next version of our markdown. So at some point in the next uh, one, two, three years, many people are actually going to start switching from our markdown to Quarto. But the good news is that it is extremely similar. So 99% of the things you learn with our markdown will apply uh, to this new uh, format called Quarto. So don't worry too much. You are not going to go obsolete. And one resource that we definitely recommend as you continue to learn our markdown is the official cheat sheet. So if you go here to help and then uh, cheat sheets, you'll see that there's an option for our markdown cheat sheet. And there's also, there's also the our markdown reference guide. You can try both of them, but the, the most nicely formatted is the cheat sheet. If you click on that, uh, it will trigger a download to your computer of the following cheat sheet, which I'll show you here. Okay. So you can go through that in your own time and see which of the things from there you already recognize and which things are new to you, and try playing with uh, the R Markdown files based on what you see here. So now the last thing we're going to do is we're going to reproduce some of the analyses we've been doing on that Ebola data set in the context of an R Markdown file. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a new R Markdown file. I think I already have one here open, the untitled one. Okay. And I'll delete uh, much of this. I'll leave the setup chunk in. And uh, let's go ahead and give it a title there. We can call it uh, Ebola Analysis, Ebola Analysis. And um, instead of HTML document, we can use that pretty format. We can use a pretty doc um, HTML pretty. Okay. And we can go ahead and save this as well in our RMD um, folder. So uh, Command S or File and Save or Save As. All right, so let's go ahead and save that inside of the RMD um, folder and call it uh, Ebola Analysis, Ebola Analysis. Okay. What you should then do is go to the following URL. So you're going to go to this URL, a tinyurl.com slash Ebola hyphen scripts. Okay. And that will bring you to this GitHub gist. You're going to copy, copy this code from the GitHub gist. Okay. And we're going to pull that into our RMD. And we're going to see how to make that into a bunch of our RMD sections. So let me zoom out a bit more so I can see more of my code. Uh, so I put a new chunk and I paste in all that code. And we're going to break this up into a bunch of separate chunks. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but the first thing we should do uh, now is uh, put the data into the data folder. You can see here in line 28, if you recall, here's where we um, imported the data set, Ebola Sierra Leone, with the read CSV function. So we need to actually get that data set. Where do you get it from? You get it from the same link we've been using before. You go to, um, let's open a new one here, bit.ly slash view hyphen Ebola hyphen data, okay? And it'll bring you to this uh, Google Sheets thing, and you download that. Once you download that data set, you can drag and drop it into the data folder of your R Markdown intro project. Okay, so I'm going to do that now. Here it is, Ebola Sierra Leone. I drag and drop it into the data folder specifically. And now that that data set is in the needed data folder, we can run through some of this code to make sure that it all works. And after we verify that it works, then we'll split it up into separate chunks and put in some nice headers and some nice uh, contextualizing uh, text. So let me go ahead and run some of this now. I run this sets of lines to install uh, slash load the needed packages. Okay. Now in order to load data here, as you recall, I can put my cursor into those, um, those quotes and press tab. But now we're going to get a problem which uh, we warned you about. So now that I press tab, normally what I should see here are the, um, the subfolders and files that are inside of my main project folder. So let's go to the main project folder here. What I should see here are data, RMD, and then inside of those, the other files. But I can't see the data folder from here. So data doesn't show up. And this is due to a weird behavior of RMDs where the RMD always takes as its home folder the um, whatever folder the RMD itself resides in. So the RMD does not respect your project folder. What that means is, I know this is a bit confusing, what that means is when you're working in an RMD, you should generally copy this code out here into your console. And from your console, you can press tab. And now from here, we can see the actual uh, data folder. So I'll say that again, when we're inside of the RMD, 
the RMD can only see the things that are inside of the folder where the RMD itself lives. Okay, so the RMD is a bit uh, selfish. It's a bit uh, nationalistic in that sense. So you have to pull out that code, put it in your console, and then we can access uh, data, all right? And then from there, we can get the Ebola Sierra Leone CSV. All right, now I'm gonna take this code, put it back here. And now there's an additional problem, which is that because this is still inside of an RMD, if I try to knit that, let's go ahead and try to knit that. I'll remove all of this stuff here. And then I'll try to knit this. And as you can see, it says uh, error, data, Ebola, Sierra Leone, CSV, blah, 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 does not exist because the RMD is still looking inside of its own folder. The jingoistic RMD is just looking inside of where it lives to see where to find the data. It's not looking outside. So what you have to do now is use that package called here, which I had introduced you to before. So if we go back now to our script, okay, we can still remove that. We're going to wrap this now in here, and here we'll force the RMD to respect our project folder. And now finally we can actually run this code and it will uh, import that data set. So let's put, let's put some of that code that I got rid of, let's put some of that back just to make sure that this works. So I'm going to init this now, and it seems to work without any errors. So you can see now that we load the Ebola Sierra Leone and we run this district tab and we have that district tab uh, output there. So now that we have verified that the data importing code works, we can go ahead and try to neaten up this RMD. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this uh, load package code and put it up there in that uh, setup chunk above, okay? And because the setup chunk has um, include equals false, uh, it won't show us any of that code because we don't want that in our report. I'll also turn off a message, so message here equals false as well. So we don't get those package startup messages, okay? Then uh, I'm going to get rid of all of this. I think the load, the load data can also go into the setup chunk. Okay, it makes sense for load data to go into the setup chunk. All right, then instead of these R code headers for cases by district and visualized categorical variables, we can make those actual uh, markdown headers. So I'm gonna pull that out here and call that uh, cases by district, okay? And I'll say this uh, table shows counts of cases by districts maybe, okay? All right, and I'll put that in the chunk there. Okay, wonderful. And for this, I won't want to echo this um, output. I don't want to show the code, I just want to show the output. So I said echo equals false, all right. Then to break up this chunk, I press again a command option I, and then I'm going to make a new section, a new header, and call it a visualize categorical variables, all right, visualize categorical variables. And I'll make a final uh, section, a fi final header that's called a visualized numeric variables. So visualize numeric variables. And I get rid of this comment because we don't really need it anymore. So now we are ready to uh, knit this document. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to click on knit and let's see what the final output looks like. So hopefully it will uh, look quite neat. All right, so there you have your title, your date, each of your sections and your outputs. Well, now I realize we didn't use our table package, so let's go back and do that. And you have each of the different uh, plots that we created. Let's go back and quickly do uh, the table. So for the table, let's use, let's say, the uh, flex table package. So I'm going to add flex table to the list of um, packages that are loaded. And I will wrap this one here, this district tab object, in the flex table function. That way we can output it instead of as just a text table, we can output it as an actual a nicely formatted table. So let's see what that looks like now. And there you go, you have that nicely formatted table. It's not really perfect, but it's good enough maybe for sharing internally within your department. So congratulations on getting through this fairly long lesson. Here are some of the learning objectives that we had set out at the start of the lesson. See if you can recall these. If you can't, then you may wanna go back and rewatch the relevant sections of the video. So hopefully by now, you feel like you can create and knit an R Markdown document that contains code and some free text. Hopefully by now, you know the different output formats, including a HTML, PDF, Word, PowerPoint, Flex dashboards, and a bunch of others. Hopefully by now, you understand basic R Markdown syntax, or basic Markdown syntax, rather, for bold, italics, bullet points, and things like that. Okay. Hopefully now you know how to use R code chunk options, including eval, echo, and uh, message. All right. Hopefully you know the syntax for inline R code. Remember that uh, when we put the maximum height of women inside of the actual text. Okay. Hopefully you recognize some useful packages for table formatting in R Markdown, Flex Table, GT, 
and the others, okay? And hopefully you understand how to use the here package to force our markdown files to uh, use the project folder as the working directory. So you remember that uh, our markdown likes to use only the folder where it itself lives as the working directory. So if you have your data folder outside of that, then you have to use here in order to access that. If you don't, if that doesn't make sense to you, you might want to go back and rewatch the video and actually try uh, playing with the folder structure, playing with the code by yourself to make sure that that makes sense. So welcome to the beginning of the rest of your life. Now that you know the essentials of the Swiss Army knife that is our markdown, you are empowered to go forth and share your work in rich and reproducible formats. I wish you the best of luck on this exciting journey. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website, where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello, this is a short snippet lesson introducing you to the concept of pipes in R. I was about to send you off into the next course, and then we realized, whoops, you don't know how to use pipes yet. So this is a bit of an emergency lesson we're trying to record very quickly so that you can get introduced to the concept of pipes. I will start by copying and pasting the line uh, that installs the package Pacman if you don't have it. This is something you can copy and paste from your previous scripts. And now we can actually um, load some additional packages using Pacman. Remember that Pacman is a package manager. So I'm going to type Pacman pload. Okay, Pacman pload. And then the packages we're going to use are tidyverse. Remember that tidyverse is a meta package. It's a suite of packages. And in particular, we need it for the pipe. So tidyverse is actually going to give us the pipe. Then we're going to use the package GT, which gives us some cool tables. I think you have seen this in a previous lesson. And we're going to use also the package outbreaks, where we're going to get some important uh, data sets. So we run those, and that will load those necessary packages. Now let's look at the data we're actually going to be working with in uh, R. So the data set is called Quakes. This is our first example. So Quakes, if we uh, take a look at the Quakes data set, it's built into R, so you don't actually have to load any package. You can just uh, look at the Quakes data set. And it has the following columns, lat for latitude, long for longitude, the depth, this is how deep the earthquake came from, the magnitude, I think that's the Richter scale, and then the number of uh, stations that recorded that earthquake. And we have the following task um, from this data set. We would like to show the top five earthquakes in this data set. Top five earthquakes uh, by magnitude. Now let's see how we would do this based on what we have learned so far. So far you have learned the arrange function. So we could arrange this data set in order of magnitude. Let's try that now. We do arrange. And then the first argument for uh, the arrange function is the data. So we put the data in there. Okay. Comma. And then the, the column we want to arrange by. In this case, that's going to be magnitude. So if I run that, this will give me an arranged data set. But as you can see, it's arranged in a ascending order of magnitude. So the smallest magnitudes are at the top. So we want to flip that. We can just put a negative here, and that will give us the uh, descending order. So now we have arranged in increasing order of magnitude here. Sorry, in decreasing order. And we have the top five um, earthquakes uh, shown. But uh, what we would like to do now is instead of printing the whole table, we would like to only just look at the top five. And to do that, remember the head function that we had taught you. So if you do head quakes, all right, that will give you the first uh, six rows of the quakes data set. And if you do head quakes comma n equals five, that will give you the first five rows. So now what we would like to do is run the head function on this arranged quakes data set, on the arranged quakes data set. And if we run it on the arranged quakes data set, we will get the top five rows, all right, by magnitude. So how do we do this? The way you would typically do this if you haven't learned about pipes is you would assign the output here to a new object and you might call it something like arranged data. And then instead of taking the head of the raw quakes, we would take the head of the arranged data. I hope you're typing this along with me because if you're not, you will be 
unlikely to understand everything. So now that I've uh, assigned that, I can run this head on arranged data and I can see the top five quakes. So this is what I would call um, option one for how to achieve this task. Now it is clear, but I would say it's a bit long. There's lots of typing that we had to do to achieve this uh, simple task. Now here's what option two is uh, for this task. Option two is a not so clear option, and it involves a function nesting, which I have shown taught you about function nesting. And so what we could do there is we take this line arrange quakes mag, and we just wrap uh, the output in the head function. So remember again, the output of this is this arranged data set. Okay. And if we just wrap that in head, that will essentially mean take the head of this arranged data set. Okay. But we only want five rows. So we can now put a comma here. So we can just put here n equals five, and that will achieve the same, the same output. But I would say this is not so clear. In particular, when you start to have many functions, this will become even less clear. So here we only have two functions. So you could see it's, it's pretty clear. But let's look now at option three, which is uh, using pipes. So notice that if we type out these two functions here, arrange quakes, and then let's take this one here, uh, the head of arranged data. Um, in fact, I'm going to change this from arranged data to quakes. Notice that for these two lines here, the very first argument for the two functions is the quakes data set. So this gives us an idea, right? What if we could just uh, take this quakes data set, let's say we put it up here on the top, okay? And then delete it from each of those uh, functions from the internals of the functions. What if we had a way to just take this thing and plug it in uh, this space here, okay? then take the output of all of this and plug it in this space here. So some way to take this and make it the first argument of this function, then take this and make it the first argument of the head function. And indeed, we do have a way to do that. And it's called a, it's called a pipe. So the way you type a pipe is you type a, a percent sign greater than and then percent sign. It's a bit painful to type. So instead of typing that manually, there's a shortcut in our studio. And that is shift command M, which I just pressed. Or if you are on Windows, I think it should be shift control M. Okay, so we just write that. And then now we can get rid of the space here, we put another pipe, okay. And uh, we get rid of that space there. And if we run those, uh, those lines, we can just uh, put our cursor anywhere and run those lines, we can see that we have done the following, we took the quake data set, we arranged it in descending order of magnitude, and then we took the first five rows. We can read uh, this this pipe as meaning as meaning and then and then take the this line and then let's say plug this output as the first argument of the next line or of the function of the function <laughs> on the next line. Okay, that's kind of a mouthful, but you can really just think of it as and then. So take the quakes data set and then arrange in descending order of magnitude and then take the head uh, with the first five rows. Okay. One small thing about the pipe is technically after you have um, typed the pipe, if you press an enter on R studio, it'll give you an indentation. So generally we type this with an indentation. Okay. Another um, way to write this instead of putting the quakes up there alone, you could also just do arrange quakes, uh, in descending order of magnitude, pipe, head, n equals five. So those are two options. All right, now here is a practice question for you. Okay, I would like you to try the following. So take show the four deepest quakes, okay, then pass the output of that to GT. Oh, I forgot about GT. Now that we have the, uh, the the top five rows of the this quakes data set, we may want to pass it into a nice looking table, maybe you are working in R markdown, you pass it into a nice looking table for your audience to see. In order to do that, we can just type a pipe here, and pass it into the GT function from the GT package. I think I've shown you this before GT has a, a function called GT. Okay, you can see it there. And if you 
pass it, if you pass all of this stuff into GT, you will get a nice looking table like that, which if you're working in R Markdown will get printed in your document. Uh, technically, you can just write, you can run GT on a single um, data set. You can type, for example, GT Iris, or what I mean is you can run GT on a data set simply like that, okay. or you could put it at the end of a pipe chain here. So now we have these three functions in a nice pipe chain, and it's easy to see what they're doing. Let's put it here as well, GT. Okay, so now back to your practice question. I want you to show the, the four deepest quakes that is going to be using the depth column, um, and then pass the output to GT. So pause the video and uh, think of how you would do that. And in three seconds, I will come back, but make sure you pause the video and think for yourself. Okay, I'm assuming you have now paused the video and tried that. So now I'm going to show you how to do it. So you take the Quakes data set. We're going to pipe that into an arrange call and arrange in descending order of depth. Okay. And now we can see if we scroll to the top of this big data set that we have the deepest um, earthquakes at the top. Okay. And we want to show the top four of those. So we do another pipe, head n equals four. Okay, and then we want to pass that into a nice looking table with GT. So I pass that into GT and we can see what that looks like there. Very nice. Let's look at one more example of piping with a new data set, just so you, we make sure you have this fully down. So in the second data set we're going to use is called a, is, is data from a varicella simulation. Varicella is an infectious disease. This data set comes from the, uh, the outbreaks package. Okay, so once you load outbreaks, you will have the following data set in your environment, Varicella Sim Berlin. Now this data set is quite large with many rows and it's a bit hard to, to get a sense of what's going on here as you can see. Uh, there's a nice function that we haven't showed you yet which is called as tibble and it also comes from the tidyverse and what we can do is we can say as tibble Varicella Sim Berlin and what this does is it prints the table in a nicer way. It prints the data frame in a nicer way. As we can see now, it's easier to see the number of rows, the number of columns. We can see what each of the variable names is fairly easily. Some of them are summarized or shortened here, and you can look below and see what the full names are. So it's a nicer way to print a data frame. So generally in R, uh, when when things are printed like this, uh, I don't like to work with objects that are printed like this, so I like to print them as tibbles, all right? So that's a nice tip for you, which you're going to see in later lessons. Now, our task using this uh, this tibble varicella is the following. We're going to try to show the names of the five youngest people in the data and pass to GT, okay? So this, this isn't practice for you yet. Uh, this will do together, so just type along with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my varicella sim Berlin data. And because I don't like how it prints, I first convert it to a tibble. Okay, a tibble. All right. And next, I'm going to want to arrange in order of age. And that will get me the youngest people at the top. So now we can see the five youngest people all have ages of zero. That is very convenient. And we want to uh, just take the top five here. So head n equals five. And uh, the last thing we, we want to do is show just the names of these young people. So here we have so many columns and it's a bit confusing. We only want to see their names. To do that, there's a simple function also coming from the tidyverse, which we haven't taught you yet. So I'll just quickly show you what it is. It's called the, uh, the select function, select. So select basically helps you uh, select columns. So if you have, for example, the women data set, this is another built in R data set. It's a very simple data set. And we want to select from that data set the height column. We can just type select women height and run that. Okay. If we want to select the weight column, we can type select women weight and run that. If you want to select both the height and the weight, you can do that. All right. And we can use this in the pipe notation as well. So we can do women pipe select weight. And we get that. Typically, you would want to put this on the next line and indent it. Okay. Or you can do women select uh, weight height. Hopefully this makes sense what a select function does. So now let's look at how we can add this to the pipe chain just to show the names of these youngest people. So I put a, a pipe here, select, and we just want to see their first name. Okay. 
and their last name. And since we're looking at their, the, the youngness of this population, it might make sense to include also the age. So now we have this nice table uh, for us there. And as a last step, we may want to pipe that into GT. So pipe that into GT. And we will get now a nicely printed table that shows these data. Now notice how beautiful this code is and how easy it is to read and to understand. It reads kind of like an English sentence. Take the varicellus in Berlin, then make it into a nice tibble, then arrange in order of age, then take the top five rows, then select the following columns, then pass it to GT. How beautiful. The alternative to this, that is either this thing where you assign intermediate objects, would be quite long and painful, in this case where we have five functions. Or even this option where we function nest would be very painful, uh, where we have five functions here. So hopefully you appreciate now the beauty of pipes. Uh, as, a, as, as a closing section, let's give you one more practice question. So the practice question I'm going to give you now is the following. Show the sex of the four oldest people. Whoops, sex of the four oldest people. I've forgotten how to type in the, uh, in the data, in this varicella sim Berlin data. So again, pause the video. I'll give you uh, three seconds to pause. Then I'll show you the solution. Okay, I'm assuming you're paused, so now let's go through it. So I'll just copy this line here. Uh, whoops, varicella simberlin. Pipe first into as tibble, even though this is not really necessary. It helps us see the remaining steps. Then we want the four oldest people in the data. So pipe into a range. And instead of just age, which would give us the youngest people at the top, we can do a range negative age. So now we have the oldest people. We wanted the top four, so we do head n equals 4. And then uh, what else do we want? Let's pass that to GT. Or let's see, it says show the sex. We only want to show the sex. So instead of uh, uh, just um, stopping at head before we pass to GT, we should also put a select function there. So select the sex and maybe also the age since we're showing them in terms of their oldness. Okay. And then now we can pass this finally to the GT function to get the beautiful output. Okay, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you use the pipe function. Technically, the pipe function comes from the uh, Magritte package. Magritte, Magritte, I think it's a French word, but um, the tidyverse has imported that particular um, function into the tidyverse. So you don't have to load Magritte, you can just load tidyverse. A very final thing to talk about, maybe, is the base pipe. So ever since, I believe, R4.1, uh, the, the our version 4.1, there's actually been introduced a base pipe, which works similar to this one that comes from the tidyverse slash Magritte. And the base pipe is actually a bit uh, nicer looking, but um, it has some features which I don't quite like. So I haven't switched over to the um, base pipe. And I think most people haven't switched over. But here is the base pipe. It is a, um, a horizontal bar and then a greater than sign. So instead of this percent, we have this. And it works mostly the same way as the pipe we've been using so far. There are a few uh, differences that make me prefer the old pipe. But if you want, you can use this one. All right, so if we run that, it gives us the same output. It's just basically the same thing. All right, so that's the base pipe. And that is the end of this lesson. I wish you the very best of luck. And uh, hopefully I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress access interactive quizzes and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone. Welcome back for a new course on the Dipler verbs. Today, we are beginning our exploration of the Dipler package. We are starting with the select verb, which is used either to keep or to drop variables. When you're doing your data wrangling, it's important to know which variables you want to keep and which variables you want to drop. So now, ready? Let's go. For this course, we have multiple learning objectives. Let's go over them one by one. 
So our first learning objective is that you can keep or drop columns using the select verb. Our second objective is that you can use a range of combinations of columns uh, through operators such as the colon, the exclamation mark, and the C function to select your variables. The third is that you can select columns based on patterns in their names using different helper functions such as start with, ends with, contains, and everything, which we will go over one by one. And then our last learning objective is that you can rename your columns using either the rename function or the select function. Now, you may wonder, what data are we going to use for this course? And the data we'll have the pleasure of using today is the Yaoundé COVID-19 dataset. This data is a COVID-19 serological survey conducted in Yaoundé, Cameroon in the late 2020. And it covers how many people have been infected with COVID-19 in the region. So let's start by loading our data. As you can see here, we'll be reading in the CSV associated. And our data has 971 columns and 37 variables, which is a lot. Each line corresponds to one patient survey, and there are some demographic, socio-economic, and COVID-related variables. The COVID-related variables being specifically, so that you become familiar with them, the um, IgG and IgM results. And these are antibody tests that were used and collected by the team that I'm about to show you. So this is real live world data of these courageous people that went out and gathered the data that you're about to, an to analyze. And it's very important to keep that in mind. So let's start with the heart of our lesson, introducing the select verb. And if you want a nice little illustration of what the verb looks like, this is our select verb where you take certain of the columns and you keep only those. So the first way that you can use the select verb, you can select by name. So what does this look like concretely when we code it? If we take our Yaoundé dataset and we want to select only the age column, then we write select age, simply the name of the column. If we look at this, it gives us only the age variable. The other option we have is that we can select a column by its position. So how does this translate into code? Well, if we want to code it, it would be that if we wanted to select age through the, its position as a column, we would select column number three by inputting three here. And once again, we see that our output is the same thing as before. It's only the age variable. However, usually you don't want to select just one variable. You want to select multiple ones. And how do you do that? Well, to select multiple variables, you're going to just put a comma between each variable that you want. So it's going to look something like this. Here, we select age, sex, and IgG results. Maybe because that's what we want for our analysis. If we run this, then we get a data frame which only has now still all our rows, 900, 971, but only three variables, which are age, sex, and IgG results. To test how much you've understood a little bit what we've been going over, it's time for you to do your first practice question. So I'll read it over for you before I give you some time to do that. And it's that I would like you to select the weight and the height variable in the Yaoundé data frame. Then in the same manner, I would like you to select by position, to, so to select the 16th and the 22nd column in the Yaoundé data frame. All right, take a pause and try it out. Okay, I hope the practice questions went well. Take your time in doing them and you need to do them because practice makes perfect. So don't forget, if you haven't done them yet, if you're already back, don't forget to do them at some point. 
So now, moving on to the next part of our lesson. For the next part, we are already going to use select extensively because we're going to work with a subset of our data. So here, we're going to work with Yao, which is a small part of Yaounde. And it has different variables, such as age, sex, education, occupation, if the person is a smoker, if the person is pregnant, um, the IgG results and the IgM results. And the reason is that it's easier to work with only a few variables rather than work with a huge data frame. Also for the operations and the manipulations, it makes your code a lot faster. So let's run and let's create our Yao. So ta-da, we see it's much smaller, only eight variables compared to what we initially had. And now, now that we have this, let's look at how we select different variables using different operators. So we'll start with the colon. It's really useful to select a range of consecutive variables. So what's important in that is the term consecutive. So consecutive variables, if we wanted, for example, to select all the variables between age and occupation in our data frame above, it would look something like this. So here we would run this little piece of code and we see that we now only have four variables, so all the ones between age and occupation in our data frame. You may also once again want to do this, but using the column numbers instead of the names. So what would this look like? It would look something like this. So you would select from column one all the way to column four. If we look at this, it yields the same result as previously, all the columns between column one, age, and column four, occupation. So now that you've seen your first operator, it's time for another small practice question. So it's time to, to try that out. So the question reads, with the Yaoundé data frame, select the columns between symptoms and sequela inclusive. So inclusive means that you also want to select symptoms and sequela. And I just want to bring your attention to one thing. It's that here we're talking about the Yaoundé data frame. So the whole data frame, not just the Yao subset that we just created. That's quite important because we didn't select sequela and symptoms and all the columns in between. So remember to use the Yaoundé data frame. Welcome back. I hope the practice question went well. Let's continue with our list of operators that allow us to fine tune how we select variables. So the next one on our lists is how do you exclude columns? How do you drop columns? How do you just say, I don't want that variable, but I want all the other ones, things like this. Well, for that, we use the exclamation mark. So the exclamation mark negates a selection. Imagine, for example, that you would want to disregard age, then you would write the code as such with an exclamation point put right before your age variable. If we run this on our Yao, we now see that we have only seven columns and that the first one has become the variable sex because the age one has been dropped. So you can combine this with the previous operator that we have seen. So for example, imagine that now you do not want to select the first four columns, but you want to drop them. So here you would put an exclamation point in front of the range that you have defined with the colon. If we run this, we see that now we've only kept four variables, which is is smoker, is pregnant, IgG results, and IgM results. And we've dropped the first four columns of our data frame. But you might think, what if I want to drop columns that are not next to each other? Well, do not worry. This is also something you can do by combining the exclamation point and what we call the C function. So it allows you to give a list of the columns that you want to drop. What does this look like in the code? In the code, it looks like this. So we still have our exclamation point, which means we are dropping the columns. And this time, the columns we want to drop are age, sex, IgG results. 
age and sex are next to each other, but the IgG result variable is all the way at the end of the data frame. Since we are putting all of these in the C function, we are telling that we want to drop age, sex, IgG results. Let's verify that this is what we obtain. So what we see here is indeed that we no longer have age and sex. Our data frame starts with highest education. And we see that we no longer have, at the end of our data set, the IgG results. So we've obtained what we wanted, a data frame without these three variables. And now let's try with a practice question. So your next practice question is going to be that from the Yaoundé data frame, you want to remove all the columns between highest education and consultation. So once again, bringing your attention to the fact that this is happening in the Yaoundé data frame, not in the subset Yao. Okay, give it a try. So welcome back. I hope the practice question went well. Now we're going to look into some of the helper functions for select. So these helper functions, they've been created so that you have an easier time using select. And they allow you to select columns based on the patterns in the names of these columns. So this may seem a bit strange to you, so let's start with some very intuitive ones. And these would be the, ver the helper functions starts with and ends with. So it would be selecting columns that starts with a certain name or selecting columns that end with a certain word, for example. Let's give some examples. In our data set, what we can see is that we have several functions that start with is. So is pregnant, is smoker. If you wanted to select these functions, then we can use starts with is and we would select those two. We also have several variables that end with result. So IgG result, IgM result. So if we wanted to just have those antibody test results, then we could use the ends with helper function to select those directly. It's very useful and very intuitive to use, and it's very dependent on how the variables in your data frame are named. So let's run this code. This is our ends with result. So we see that we are selecting IgG result and IgM result using the helper function ends with. And this is our so starts with result because both of these variables start with is. So this is really intuitive and it will really help you in selecting in an easy way. Now, what if the naming that is repeated in your variables is not at the start or the end? Well, this has also been addressed with the verb that is called contains. So contains is a helper function that helps select columns that are contained that contain a certain string. So if we go back to our big data set, we see that the, there are many, many variables that contain the word drug because these are the different drugs used to treat COVID-19. And if we want to select all of those columns, maybe to, to like uh, sort them out or see how many there are, how many different drugs, well, we would use the helper function contains. When we run this, we see that we have in total 11 different um, variables that are related to the different drugs used. So this is a very useful way, again, of selecting columns based on the naming of these columns in your data frame. Then another helpful function is the one everything, which simply matches everything that has not yet been selected. How is this useful? Well, it's useful because it allows you to reorder easily your data frame. An example would be, imagine you want to put at the beginning of your data frame, the variable is pregnant and not age. Then you would write that you want to select is pregnant, so that variable first, 
and then you would put everything else behind it using the helper function everything. So this is a very neat way of bringing structurally to the front of your data frame a certain variable, such as this pregnant, which is now here in front of age and all the other ones. And what you can see is that the alternative to using everything just for the Yao subset that we have is to code out something like this. So if you look at this, this is okay because Yao only has a limited number of variables, but already if you wanted to code this out for the Yaounde data frame, the full thing, it would be really, really intense. So everything is a really useful helper function which you should think of if you want to reorder things or move things around. And then you can also combine these different helper functions together. So if we wanted to, we could combine the helper function ends with, with the helper function everything. And this would look like that. So you see that here we're going to select first the um, different columns that end with result. So these are our antibody tests, IgG results, IgM results, very, let's say, important data collected. And then we're going to put behind that everything else. So this could make sense, for example, if you want to highlight that we've collected this data and just to, to say that these are our main data collected elements. So what does this look like when we run the code? It looks like now in the big Yaounde data frame, we have the IgG results, IgM results first, and then we have all the other variables. So it highlights that we've collected this data and that's usually a very good thing. So now that you've seen all of these different helper functions, I think it's time for some practice. So let me present what will be our practice for this section on the helper functions. So our, our practice questions for now will be to select all columns in the Yaounde data frame that start with is. So normally you should know how to do that. And our second one will be to move the columns that start with is to the beginning of the data frame. So I know you can do it, go for it. Welcome back for the last part of today's lesson. So now we are gonna see how you change column names with rename or select. So renaming is as intuitive as on this image. You have the name of a variable and you want to change it. Maybe you want to change it because you want to make it more clear. Uh, maybe you want to change it because you realize that it's just hasn't been named correctly um, or that it hasn't been named. That's also possible. Well, this is how you would go about it. So for example, in our data, we may want to rename the age and the sex to indicate that we are at the level of a patient. So we would rename it patient age and patient sex. If we run this, we would now see in our Yaounde data that we have no longer the age variable, but the patient age variable. We no longer have the sex variable, but the patient sex. So this has been an efficient renaming to indicate that we're working at the patient level. Now, something I just want to highlight is that you need to be careful how you write the rename verb. The syntax for it is that you rename by putting that the new name is equal to the old name. So this is something important because if you write it the other way around, you should get an error, but you could also just mix up the way you're renaming, which is never good. So keep the structure in mind, rename, new name equals old name, and you'll be fine. And then the last thing that I wanna show you in this lesson is simply how beautiful a verb select is because you can already rename when you are selecting. So for example, imagine you want to select the age variable and the sex variable, but you want it to be clear that it's for patients. Well, you would do so by selecting and at the same time that you select, you would write new name equals old name. So a combo of select and rename without having to even call the rename verb. 
which is very nice, very elegant. So there you go. You've done your selection and your renaming at the same time. We have a small data frame, two variables, with patient age and patient sex, ready to go for, through further data processing or maybe ready to be shown, re ready to be shared, because it's clear and it has been wrangled. So thank you everyone for following this first lesson. I hope it helps you to see how intuitive and useful the Diplor verbs are. This is the first verb of a series of basic data wrangling verbs that I am really enthusiastic to present to you. So I hope to see you right away, or maybe tomorrow, in the next lesson about our next verb. See you soon. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone. Welcome back for the second lesson of this chapter. Today, we're going to explore the filter verb. Last time, we saw how to drop variables, so columns, using the select function. And now we're going to see how to keep or drop different rows, so your data entries, using the filter verb of the Diplor package. Being able to make subsets of your data or to drop any abnormal data is a really important step of data wrangling. So let's start. For today, we have a series of learning objectives. The first one is to be able to keep or drop rows using the filter verb. The second one is to be able to specify conditions on different numbers based on operators such as greater than, less than, equal to, and not equal to, combined with the verb filter. The third is to be able to filter rows based on different conditions. So it would be either with an AND logical operator with the ampersand or with the vertical bar representing the OR operator. More on this, more on this later, no worries. Then we will also be able to negatively filter out, so that, it, that means we will drop rows using the exclamation point, just the same as for select. And then finally, we will also see how you handle rows that have missing values. And so for anyone who's already done data wrangling or who has already heard of it, you know how important this is. So our data for today is the same as last time. We're going to be working for, throughout the entire course with our Yaoundé COVID-19 data set. So let's start by loading it in and making a subset of our data set using the select verb that we saw in the previous lesson. In code, this means that we're first going to read in our CSV and then select the different variables that we want to keep to have a smaller subset easier to work with. So here we go. So how do we use the filter verb? Well, we use the filter verb and the condition to keep or to drop rows. So a very classic example is to, for example, only keep the mail records. So in our code for a Yao subset, this would look like this we would filter to only keep the records where the sex of the patient is equal to male. And if we look at the results of this, we see that now we still have our 10 variables, but we only have 422 
data entries instead of roughly 971. Something important that you need to that I need to highlight for you in this example is that we are using an equal sign, which is equal equal, rather than the classical assignment equal sign, which is a single equal. A useful thing that we can do is that we can chain filter with n row to know how many rows in our data set are fulfilling this condition. So, coming back to the example above, if we look, at, if we want to know how many of our data entries correspond to mail records, we would change with n row, and we would see the same thing as what I explained before, that there are 422 data entries, so 422 rows, that correspond to male patients. So now it's time for your first practice questions on this chapter. I hope you're excited to use this new verb. And your two practice questions are, so the first one will be to filter the Yao data frame to respondents who were pregnant during the survey, and you store it in Q1. So you would be using potentially the is pregnant variable. And then the second question is, how many respondents were female? And for this, I suggest that you try and imitate the code above with the filter function and then the nrow function. Give it a go. See you in a bit. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your first interactions and hands-on practice with the filter verb. Now we will move on to the part of our lesson which is about relational operators. So actually, you've already seen a relational operator. It's the one with the double equal. And I can now present you a more in-depth list of the different operators that you can find. I would suggest that you take your time and you pause the video and you have a read over them because there are many of them and I can comprehend that uh, you need maybe to kind of integrate them. You, some of them are intuitive, you may have already seen them before, so greater than, uh, smaller than, um, not equal to. You may have the in operator which is a bit more enigmatic, let's say. And then for, for those of you who maybe need um, a more visual representation of some of them, I invite you to have a look at this. So this is the fact that we want to select not A. This is the fact that we want to select A or B. This is if we want to select A and B. Um, this is if we want to not select A and B. It's things that you, it's useful to have under your elbow when you're working. That way, if you have a doubt about what you want to do, you should visualize it and you can look at this and understand what it is you want to keep, what it is you want to drop, and think about this red area, where it is and how to write it up with these different relational operators. But now, enough with uh, tables and visuals. Let's see how we can use these on our data. So, I will give you a bit of a multiple examples of how you can do this. You can filter using the not equal to male, so this will keep all the data entries for females. You can filter using the fact that age is smaller than six, that means you keep everyone who is younger than six in your data set. You can filter with the age superior or equal to 70. So there you will only keep the old people in your data set who are older than 70 or who also are 70 because you have the equal that is included. And then you can also have the in operator which allows you to select different levels of a variable. Here, for example, you want to keep respondents who have their highest level of education that is equal to either primary school or secondary school and nothing higher. So for this, 
you would use the in operator here combined with the C function listing the different things you want to keep. Now, after this uh, prolonged demonstration, it's your turn to put this into practice with two more practice questions, which I'm delighted to present to you. So, the first one is that from the Yao subset, you will keep only respondents who were children. So that means under 18 years old. Then you will also use the in operator to keep only respondents who live in the Tsinga or Mesa neighborhoods. So keeping only those that live in those different neighborhoods. Welcome back. I hope the practice questions went well. I hope that you feel a bit more familiar with the relational operators and that you might feel confident, maybe try a few others, a few more, and uh, really try to just play around with your data. That's usually the best way to start to understand how these work. And um, if you have any other issues, don't hesitate to ask questions. Now we're moving to another way of using filter, which is combining the filter verb with different conditions using the ampersand or the vertical bar, which are more commonly known as the and, the and, and the or operators. So this, the reason for this is that a single filter verb can incorporate multiple conditions. And if you were to classically write this out, you would write these conditions separated by a comma. In the code, this would appear as so. So here, from the Yao subset, we would filter for the is pregnant variable equal to yes, and the is smoker variable equal to x smoker. So keeping people who were pregnant and who used to smoke or who qualify themselves as ex-smokers. You can see that here there is a comma between them and the comma is going to be replaced automatically by the ampersand, so the and condition. It's better practice usually to write the and operator because it's clearer what you intend to do with the data and how you're formulating your condition. So for good practice, even though it's not necessary for the code to run, I would suggest that you rewrite the code above, so these two conditions of pregnant and ex-smoker, with the ampersand. This way, it's really clear that you want to filter and keep only the data entries that satisfy these two conditions. After this clarification about the ampersand, we can move on to another relation, relational operator, which is the OR operator. So when you want your condition to be that either condition A or condition B is satisfied. You don't want it to be both, you just want one of the two. So if we take once again our example from before, if we were to write our filter but with an OR condition, which you can see here with the vertical bar, instead of the AND, which we had previously, this means we want to keep people who either they were pregnant, so is pregnant, yes, or they were ex-smoker. And once again, I can only encourage you to have these little diagrams underneath your eyes to remind you of what it means. And let's do a few practice questions because we're introducing a lot of new content, so it's really important to practice it out step by step. So our two questions for this section will be to filter Yao to only keep men who tested IgG positive. So there are two conditions in there. I'll let you think about it. The second question is to filter Yao to include just children, so under 18, and those whose highest education is primary school. 
So once again, two conditions, I'll let you think about it. Let's move on to the next part of exploring our filter verb, which consists in negating conditions using the exclamation mark. So this should be familiar to you because it's similar exactly to select. So it means that when we want to negate, we wrap the condition with the exclamation point and the parenthesis to say we want the opposite of this condition. It's called negating. So let's see how we would write such a condition to, to basically drop respondents who are children, so who are less than 18 years old, and or respondents who weigh less than 30 kilograms. What does this look like? How do we negate this or condition? Well, in the code, you will be writing up something like this. So you will have the two conditions that I just read out. So the age inferior to 18 for children and the weight inferior to 30 kilograms. It will be an or condition, so with a vertical bar, but you're adding the exclamation point and the parenthesis around both of these to show that you actually want to drop people who satisfy these conditions. Let's look a bit more into how we use this. You can combine the exclamation point with the in operator to get a not in functionality. So this is very interesting. If we want to filter the highest education variable and we want to this time exclude people who only went to primary school or secondary school, then we would write our condition, the highest education in primary school, secondary school, and we would exclude these people using the exclamation point. So once again, it's the same thing. It's writing the condition and then negating it using the exclamation point in front of it. So one thing that I now want to get into, it's that it's easier to read filter as a keep statement. So if you want to keep respondents who are, let's say, below 18 and who weigh less or who weigh less than 30 kilograms, then this is what, how you would write to keep it. But then if you, if you want to actually drop them, well, you know that dropping means negating the condition. So as we just discussed, it is the idea that you would then wrap this condition in the exclamation point and the parenthesis. And this would make that you would drop respondents who are under 18 or who weigh less than 30 kilograms. So, it brings us to the code that I explained above, which is to have this or condition encompassed in the parenthesis with the, with the exclamation mark. Take your time to digest this and to understand how it works, and then have a go at it with our question number seven, which is, Please drop the respondents who live in the Tsinga or Mesa neighborhoods. Think about this, let's say, dropping, keeping logic and have a go. Hello again. I hope that your attempt for using uh, this negation of conditions went well. It's time for one of the last parts of our course, which is about NA values. So um, everything you've seen up to now does not work for NA values. So um, let's make a little data set to illustrate this. We're gonna make a Yao Mini where we're going to select only certain patients. 
So we're going to select the patients 1, 11, 50, and 2. And the reason for this is because it gives us many different variations of the variable sex and is pregnant. So as we know, women can be pregnant or they can not be pregnant and men cannot be pregnant, whatever happens. So either the response for females can be yes, it can be no, or it can be that they do not reply. So we don't know. It's a bit like an NA. And then for men, it's automatically indicated as an NA. Now let's see how we're going to manipulate this Yao Mini. So what if we try to select the NA row using the double equal operator? This is something that we saw at uh, the beginning of the lesson. And this is how we selected male respondents. So let's try two different things. Let's try to select the NA row. So for the man here, either by putting is pregnant equal equal to NA or is pregnant equal equal to NA as a string. Let's see, let's see what happens. Well, you'll see that both, they don't generate an error. This is really important. They don't generate an error. They generate you an empty data frame. So this is a bit the worst situation because you don't have an error message, so you don't know that something went wrong. And uh, you get this empty, empty data frame. So basically what you tried to do didn't work and you weren't alerted. And this is okay because we're looking at what comes out. But what if you're in a hurry and you go through everything and you don't look and then later on you get bugs and you don't understand why? Well, this is really something that it's important that we stop and we address what goes on with this. So why do we get this zero size data frame? Well, the reason is that NA is a non-existent value. R cannot evaluate NA as equal or not equal to something else. It just doesn't understand what NA is. So that's why we have the special isNA function, which comes to our help. So let's look at this now. If we apply isNA to our mini Yao dataset, what, are, what will be our result? Well, here we get what we want. We get that row of the male subject, which has NA as a value for is pregnant. This is the correct way of extracting them. And then on the other hand, if you want to negate, so the condition, meaning you want to take all the rows from Yao Mini, which are not NA for is pregnant, then you would type up your code as such. Here, you see that we're negating the condition with the exclamation point, and we want all non-NA for is pregnant. When we run the code, well, we're very happy because we can see that we only have the different entries for is pregnant, which are non-NA. So now, it's your turn to practice what you've just seen. Let's, uh, let's do a practice question. Number eight, I will ask you to keep all the responders who had missing records for the report of their smoking status. So I'll let you think about what this means, about which variable you want to use. Uh, it's about missing records, so that means NA values, so remember to use the right function, and see you in a bit. Wow, you can be super proud of yourself. Today, you have learned a lot in this lesson. We've looked at different, let's say, relational operators like equal, equal, above, greater than. We've looked at logical operators, so the ampersand and then the vertical bar and how those are represented as and and or conditions and how those work. So you are all settled in to know now how to select your variables, how to filter for your different rows. But what if you want to transform some of your data? 
What if you want to create new data? Well, that's where another basic data ranking verb comes in. And this is what we're going to see in the next lesson. So see you there, see you soon, and thank you so much. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website, where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone and welcome back for a new lesson. You now know how to select your variables, how to filter your data entries, and today you are going to discover the mutate verb, which we are going to use to create new variables and modify existing ones. This is an extremely important verb for your data wrangling journey, so I hope you're excited and let's go! Let's start as per our usual with the learning objectives. Our learning objectives for today is that you will be able to use the mutate function of the Diplor package to either make a new variable or modify an existing variable in your data set. You will also be able to create different types of new variables, whether they be numeric, character, factor, or Boolean. So, the packages we'll be using will be here, janitor, and tidyverse. So, all pretty familiar to you. And in our data sets, we're going to have some originality because we're not going to use only the COVID-19 Yaoundé data set that we've been using in the past two chapters. We're also going to introduce a new data set, which is a cross-sectional study coming from India about sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a condition most common in the elderly population, so superior to 60 years old. And it consists in a generalized loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength. Let's start by loading our Yaoundé data set. So as per our usual, we're going to read in the CSV. Then we're going to subset some variables that we're interested in. Alrighty, so our classical data frame that we're used to, 971 data entries and six different variables that we'll be using in our different examples today. Our second step will be to load the sarcopenia data frame. So, sarcopenia data frame, we're going to read in the CSV. And this data set has 239 data entries, so less than uh, our other data set, but it has more variables, which you'll be discovering bit by bit through the practice questions. So now, moving into the heart of the subject, the introducing mutate verb. How should you conceive mutate? Mutate is a bit like this image. So anytime you want to change or construct something new in your data set, you should think of this uh, verb. You should think about this moving of columns and variables to get what you want. So mutate is really your constructor changer verb. Mutate is going to be written up as your data frame pipe mutate, the new column equal to what it contains. So the new column name will be also defined at the same time as you create it. And what it contains can be many, many different things. We're going to start off by an example using the height centimeter column from the Yaoundé data set. We're going to first start by making a subset of our Yao subset data set so that we are only keeping the height centimeter column. That way it will be easier for us to see what we're doing. So there we go. We now have all our data entries, but only with one variable. That way we'll see how we're modifying it. And the plan is going to be to create a new variable. So what are we going to do? Well, if we want to create a new variable using the height centimeter column, we could, for example, convert it to the height meters variable, which means that we're going to apply to it an equation, which is the height centimeter column divided by 100. So in the code, we would write mutate height meters is equal to height centimeters divided by 100. Let's run this. 
and we see that now we have two variables with one of them in centimeters, one of them in meters. So mission accomplished. Now, onwards for a new example. We are going to do another example, but this time we're going to modify a variable that already exists. Our scenario is that it's like there has been a small error in the equipment that we use to measure the heights. And what we want to do now is correct this because all the heights are five centimeters too small. So we're going to change this variable while keeping the same name, so modifying in place variable. And we're going to do so with the mutate function. So in the code, this is going to look like this. Mutate height centimeters equals to height centimeters plus five, because we're correcting it for five centimeters. And now we only have a single variable output because we are changing an in-place variable and all the values in every single data entry have been augmented by five centimeters. Now, it's your turn to try the mutate verb out. I hope you're excited for this first trial of this new verb. You're going to be using the sarcopenia data frame and you're going to be using the weight kilogram variable inside this data frame. You're going to do something similar to what we just did. You're going to create a new variable called weight grams where you're going to store the respondent's weight in grams instead of kilograms. So your answer should go in Q weight to grams using this template. And you should remember that one kilogram is equal to 1000 grams. Good luck for the conversion. Good luck for using mutate and see you in a second. So welcome back. Hopefully you now see how user friendly the mutate function is. And concretely, you've used mutate, you know how it works, you know how the syntax is, so we can end the lesson here. Bye-bye. Okay, just kidding. This would be wonderful, but the truth is that the devil will be in the details, as says the expression. This means that what's complicated is not the mutate verb by itself, but how you combine it with other helper functions which allow you to change and construct things in different ways. So let's start with one thematic. It's creating a variable from scratch, which is a row index. As you saw previously, most of your variables are going to reference an existing variable. So your height meters reference the height centimeter variable. Height centimeter was modified in place by adding five centimeters. But you can also create a variable that we call from scratch where um, it's not referring to any others and it's independent. And such an example would be the row index. To get such a row index, you would be combining the use of mutate and then the, the, um, a sequence of numbers which you will have generated using one to n. The n function is a function from Dippler which returns the number of rows in your data frame. So what this would look like in the code would be something like this. All right, let's create a row index. We're going to call it row index. So it has a representative column name. And we're going to write that it's equal to 1 to n. So 1 to the number of rows. What does this look like? Well, we get a data frame with two different variables. And this row index, it allows us to have a unique identifier per row. Now, you're going to add a variable to the sarcopenia data frame called respondent ID, so the unique ID identifiers we were talking about. You're going to make it using n or n row, whatever you think is appropriate, and you're going to store the result in Q sarcopenia respondent ID following this template. You should just understand that if you're working in your console, maybe the new column you're going to create, respondent ID, won't appear because the new columns are always placed at the end. So you would see it in the list of columns here. And then if you wanted to make sure you really have it, you really had created it or even visualize it, 
then you have two options. You can either use the view function to see your entire data frame in a separate tab, or you can use the select function where you would select respondent ID and make sure that you have actually created it. All right, have a go and see you in a second. Welcome back. I hope you had an easy time making that respondent ID column. Let's now move on to another example. We are now going to see how to create a Boolean variable. Boolean variables are used to categorize a population. That's why it's useful to create Boolean variables. Here we're going to create a very simple example of a Boolean variable, which is called isChild. It's either true if the subject is a child, or false if the subject is an adult. Let's first start off by selecting the age years variable and then performing mutate on our data frame. So select age years and now let's mutate, let's create is child equal to and this is where we're going to input our condition age years inferior or equal to 18. So let's run this there we go. Now, instead of having to kind of visually look and identify in the numbers which, one is, which ones are below 18, so these two, we have a variable which tells us in a very visually easy way which ones are adults, so all the false, and which ones are children, so these two, the true. It's very useful to binarize and to categorize your population, and that's also very essential if you want to get maybe some counts out of your population. So if you want to learn about the children that are within the Yaoundé data set, you can use janitor tabil to see how many there are. So let's write this up in the code using our new variable is child. So we define it in the same way as we did before and in tabil we write is child. And you see, it's already there. Ta-da! And there we go. This way, we see that we have 662 adults, 309 children, and so that we have 31.8% of the data set, which, con which is composed of children. It's a very easy way of getting percentages and proportions out of your data set. And it's really important that you know this little trick so that you can quickly look over different variables that are interesting to you. Alrighty, let's see one more example because the Boolean concept can be a bit challenging sometimes. So, this time we're going to use the symptoms variable to report about people who had different respiratory symptoms and people who did not. So we're going to create a Boolean variable called has no symptoms, which is going to be set to true if respondents didn't have any symptoms and set to false if they had any kind of symptom, a combination or a single one, doesn't matter. So we'll first start by selecting the symptoms and then writing up our mutate. So we're going to select symptoms and then we're going to create our has no symptoms new variable and it's going to be equal to the following condition so this condition we're going to use will be symptoms equal equal no symptoms this way those that have no symptoms are, are evaluated as true and those who have any other input, which is not no symptoms, will be evaluated to false. When we run this, we see that someone who has muscle pain is evaluated to false, someone who has no symptoms, like these two people, are evaluated to true, and then any kind of combination of symptoms is also evaluated to false because they do have symptoms. So, your practice question will be to now use the grip strength variable in the sarcopenia data set. So you're going to 
work with the grip strength because we know that women with a grip strength below 20 kilograms are considered to have low grip strength. And we want to categorize the population based on low or high grip strength. So you're going to make a new variable called low grip strength that is evaluated to true if women have a grip strength inferior to 20 kilograms and false for others. The second question is going to be what percentage of women surveyed have a low grip strength? So take your time to find out how you want to write that up. Remember to put in a numeric value. Remember that there's tabule, which is quite useful from janitor. So, um, and give it a go. I'll see you back here in a minute. Welcome back. I hope that practice question went well. We're now moving on to a new way of using mutate. And this will be to create a numeric variable. So I kind of spoiled this for you earlier on in the lesson. We are going to be using what we did with the height in meters to now create a new health indicator called BMI, which is the body mass index. It follows the following formula. So the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. We're first going to start by selecting the weight in kilograms and the height in centimeters. Then we're going to make the conversion we did before. So height in meters is equal to the height in centimeters divided by 100. And we're going to write our BMI formula. So we're going to call our variable BMI equals to what we saw just above. So the weight in kilograms divided by height meters, which is squared. So let's look at that. There we go. For all of our data entries, we took their weight and their height. We converted the height to meters. And then using height in meters and the weight in kilograms, we created the BMI index. Let's also save the BMI variable now. That way we can use it later. So the way we save it is that we call it Yao BMI. Ta-da. Now we're going to save this new variable. There we go. And then we're going to get to your next practice question, where you're also going to implement a mathematical formula to make a new variable. So you're going to implement the appendicular muscle mass, because this is a useful health indicator for the sarcopenia data set. It's the sum of the muscle mass in all four limbs. So it seems a bit more impressive than the BMI formula, but it truly isn't. It's just numbers and multiplications and additions. So it uses the weight, the height in meters, in meters, the sex, and then the age in years. What you see here, this minus 4.5 at the end, that's, um, let's say, a calibration to also include Asian populations. Then, as a reminder, the sex variable is going to be encoded either 1 or 0 for male or female responders. So keep that in mind. And then I invite you to calculate the ASM value for each individual of the sarcopenia data set. And then come back for the last part of the lesson. See you in a bit. Welcome back. All right. Last part of the lesson. We're going to learn how to change a variable's type using mutate. So for this, there are many helper functions which you can use as integer, as factor, as character, as date. And then you will put them inside the mutate call to do this data type change. It's super useful because there are so many times where you get a category which is not encoded as a factor. You get numbers that are encoded as characters instead of integers or doubles. So it's really, they will save your life so many times when you're doing data wrangling. So you'll get very familiar with these. All right, let's take our Yao BMI dataset and let's convert the BMI to 
an integer instead of a double. So we're going to make our new variable called BMI integer, and we're going to equal it to as integer. You see, it even finds it. Ta-da! BMI. So this is going to look like that. We now have a fifth column where we see that 33.26214 was converted to simply 33. So this is what as integer does. All right, but then if you're working with numbers, there are some specificities, specificities that you should know about as integer. So it truncates your integers and it doesn't round them. So your 22.8 becomes 22, not 23, as we would expect. So for that, if you want to correct it, you can use the round function. What is this going to look like? Well, let's see it in code. We're going to, after making our BMI integer, we're going to make our BMI round. We're going to say round BMI. This way, we can see the difference. Alrighty. There you go. Here, what we see is that this is our original BMI. It doesn't change anything for the two first columns, but for here, our 22.8, we see that BMI with as integer is 22, but then the right rounding up is using round, which converts it to 23. So this is useful to know. On this note, it's your turn to do your last practice question. So. This last practice question is going to be using the Sarcopenia data frame as usual. So you're going to use as integer on the age variable of the respondents. And don't care about this whole rounding business I just explained here. Just use as integer. It's going to truncate the years, but that's fine um, because we usually care about years truncated. Maybe it doesn't change that much. And well, I invite you to put your answer in Q age integer, and after this practice question, I'll see you for the wrap-up. So, see you in a bit. So congrats, you have already learned so much. You know how to select, how to filter, how to mutate, and you know how to start using so many different helper functions along the way with these different verbs. Now we're just going to continue going in depth, learning more, becoming better data wranglers. And for the next lessons, we're going to see another very important helper verb for mutate. And then we'll get into even more complex wrangling, such as grouping the variables, summarizing them. So you have already mastered these verbs. So select, filter, mutate. Now let's continue on our journey. Let's reach the next level together and see you soon in the next lesson. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone, welcome back to, for this new lesson. We're going to pick up where we left off with mutate. That means we're going to continue using this amazing verb. And this time we're going to use mutate to transform variables, but not in a global sense as we've been doing. So global means that we take our variable and we change it in a uniform manner. Now we're going to do it in a conditional sense. So basically there are different criteria and this makes that there may be like four different ways that we can change our variable, that we can transform it. So for this, there's a special additional verb that we'll be using within mutate, which is called case one. So we're going to explore case one today and I hope you're excited. Let's go. Welcome to this lesson. So as per usual, we're going to be starting with our learning objectives. What are our learning objectives of today? Well, the idea will be that you can transform and create new variables using case one. This seems pretty obvious. Then uh, the idea will be that you know how to use the true condition in case one to match unmatched cases. 
This is going to make more sense once we look a bit into it. You, can all, you will also be able to handle NA values of case one, within case one, which is always important. You'll be, you will be able to understand how to keep the default value of a variable if you're only changing just a few variables using case one. You'll be able to write case one conditions that are is using multiple comparators and multiple variables. You will understand the case one condition priority order. This is pretty important and I hope you'll enjoy it. And then finally, we'll be seeing another verb, which is if else, which is very similar to case one, but which is used for binary conditions. So you might want to use it once in a while. All right, let's start. So we are going to be using packages that you are familiar with today. And then in our data sets, we'll be seeing once again our COVID-19 data set that we've been using a lot from Yaoundé, Cameroon. And then for your practice questions, you'll be using the flu data set coming to us from the outbreak in 2013 in China. Um, and so we will start by loading both of these. So for our Yaoundé data set, we've done a bit of a transformation here using case one, actually. So introduction to case one, it's right into the, the, like, the heat of the subject. Um, but um, I will not be detailing it, this too much for you because we're going to see it bit by bit throughout the lesson. So case one here is used to introduce fake NA values into our age variable. And this will be so that we can do a, the demonstration that I mentioned in the learning objectives about using NA within case one. We're also going to be renaming our age variable and then we're going to drop our age category variable using select and the minus sign. So let's run this. Alrighty, we have our Yaoundé data set that we are very familiar with, with 971 rows and then almost all the variables it contains, so 52 variables. We're going to load the flu line list. There we go. We have our smaller data set with only 136 data entries and then eight different variables. So we're going to start by talking about relational operators, comparators, because that's quite important in this lesson as we're going to be defining a lot of conditions. So these relational operators test the relation between two values. They return true, false, or NA. And here I've compiled for you a bit of a resume of a lot of different operators. So, whether so I would encourage maybe saving this or um, taking a pause of the video and having a look at it now. Introducing case one. So we're going to start with a simple conditional transformation. We're going to, we just removed the age category variable from the Yaoundé data set. Well now, using case one, we're going to make it again. And we are going to call it age group. All right, so we're going to start by selecting just the age years column so that we see what we are doing. We're going to call this new data frame Yaoundé the age. There we go. So we have only selected one variable. So we have a, a data set with one column. And you can see that we have our artificial NA values that we've introduced into our data frame with our initial transformation. So we have an NA here, fifth row, an NA here, tenth row. Let's define an adult group and a child group. So we are going to write this using the case one statement. So basically, case one is within mutate. And then our condition is to be an adult or a child. So we are going to write that the age in years, if it's inferior to 18, then the person is labeled as child. However, if it's superior or equal to 18, then the person is labeled an adult. Let's run this and let's see what happens. Ta-da! First use of case one. I hope it's pretty intuitive, pretty clear. Um, here we now see that we have all of our first rows, for example, that are adults. They're all above 18. And now we have 
two here which are categorized as children and what you can already observe initially is that if you're looking at numbers your brain is going to spot a lot more slowly which ones are children while having a categorization variable will kind of make them jump out at you you'll see okay three values adult and a child it's just the way that your brain is capable of perceiving information it's also very useful to make categorizations to do further data analysis if you want to, instead of having this, these uh, data entries, have categories to work with. All right, so let's go a bit more into the case one syntax, which might seem a bit foreign. So you have this little wave sign here. It's called a tilde. And then you have two components to your case one statement. The first is you have the left hand side of the tilde where you are going to put your conditions. So if we come back to our example here, our condition on the left hand side of the tilde, the tilde is here, it's here. Well, these are our conditions, the age inferior to 18, the age superior or equal to 18. This is our condition, it's on the left hand side. And then if we go, we have a second component, which is the right hand side, where you have the value you want to put in if the condition is true. So coming back to what we had for us, we have that if this condition is true, we input the value child. If this condition is true, we input the value adult. You can also read it as if the age is below 18, input child. Else, if the age is greater than or equal to 18, input adult, if you really want to formulate it. So this is the, the first step in the case one. And usually, as case one is quite a complex transformation, it's a good idea to inspect case one. So there are multiple ways of doing so. You can either create your new column with case one and then put it into view, which is going to open it in a separate spreadsheet. Or you can also check the proportions using table, which we already used previously. And if we run this, we would see, now see that we have a certain proportion of adults, a certain proportion of children, and a certain proportion of NA. So we can kind of check, also to, important to highlight, um, you have two percentages, one here which takes into account in the denominator the NA values, and one here which leaves them out. So very smart. It's now practice time. So your first interaction with this case when verb. You're going to use the flu lineless data and you're going to make a new column called age group within it. Sounds familiar, right? And so you're going to have an age group which is a bit different than adult and child. This time you're going to define an age group below 50 and, also, and then another one which is 50 and above. Then you have a second question which is going to require that maybe you use table because you are going to be asked what percentage of individuals in the data set are below 60. And I will see you back here for the next part of the lesson in a little while. It's now time to learn another part of the case one statement, which is this kind of maybe initially a bit obscure true default argument. So what is this true default argument? Well, it's something that is going to match any row not yet matched. We're going to kind of look at it as a default value. So if we're going to take the example we were using before, so to categorize people as children or adults, it's at this time we're going to drop the adult categorization and we're just gonna categorize people as children or not children. So the adults and the NAs will be in the same category. Let's illustrate this right away. So you have same setup as before, age group is equal to case one now, Let's write our case one statement. So age years is inferior to 18, inferior to 18, tilde, so now the right hand side, we input the value child. Now this is where it changes. Instead of having a second condition, we're just going to write true tilde and then not children. When we run this, you're going to see something a bit different from before, which is that now you still have all, all the adults 
that are categorized as not children. But now you also have the NA, which are categorized as not children. And the children are still categorized as child. So this is where you see that the first condition is going to match the children and then anyone else, everything else, whether it's NA or adults or whatnot, if it doesn't give true for this condition, it's going to be categorized as not children. Very importantly, true should always be the final condition in case one because it matches all unmatched cases. Let's kind of look at what this would look like if we're going to run a similar code here. If we run this, then all of a sudden, well, it doesn't really matter that we put this condition as a second condition because this is going to override everything else. So here, the children that were 17 and 13 here, they're also categorized as not child. This is a brief introduction to the priority order of the conditions. We're going to get back to it in just a second. Now, onto another important thematic. As mentioned in the learning objectives, we're also going to see how to handle NAs within case one. Probably, unsurprisingly, if we're talking about NAs, this beautiful function isNA comes into play. So isNA is going to be, once again, our best ally to handle NA values. And we can write conditions targeting NA values using this function. So if we're taking, once again, what we've been working with, our condition about child, about adults, maybe we don't want the NA values just to be also labeled again NA, but we want them to be labeled missing age. Let's see how we would write a condition on the NA. We would write is NA age years tilde missing age. When we run this, we now have a new age group variable which has very, three very distinct categories. So this is really important if you want to maybe highlight that the NA values correspond to missing values and it's sometimes better to have your NAs categorized rather than just floating NAs. So now it's your turn to practice. We're going to do something similar to before. That means that um, we're going to have this, categorization, this categorization below 60 and 60 and above. But this time we're going to also account for the missing age. So you have to add a condition about the NA values. The second one that you are going to handle is that you are going to look more into the gender variable of the flu line list. So if we quickly run this, we'll see that you have these genders that are defined as F for female, M for male, and then NA values. And this is a bit unclear as a codification. So your goal will be to recode them from F, M, and NA to female, male, and missing gender using a case one statement. Welcome back. We are now going to hand to tackle another aspect of using case one. And this aspect will be that we are going to learn how to keep the fault values of a variable. So this is concretely that on your right hand side of the case one formula, you will have a variable. This may seem a bit obscure. We're going to get to examples in literally 10 seconds. So this is quite handy when you want to change just a few values in your variable and not too many. And so let's see an example with the highest education variable in the Yaoundé data set. So we're going to start by making a subset with just the variable of interest. That way it's easier to see what we're doing. So there we go. We have a single variable with the highest education. And now we're going to create a new variable called highest educ recode. And we're going to recode the university and doctorate entries as post-secondary. So we're going to do this as so. Highest education, we're going to use the in comparator. And we're going to list the two that we are interested in. So university and then doctorate. And then we're going to say, oops,
oops, I realized, forgot my case when statement. This is a classic. So case when, let's even put it here, case when, when the highest education is in, is either university or doctorate, then we would define it as post-secondary. So, and we close it with another parenthesis. So, this is how we would write highest educ recode. There's a case one statement that is saying that if highest education is in university or doctorate, then we give it the value post-secondary. When we run this, this is what comes out. So, it worked. We have the people that are encoded as university, basically that who have done university or a doctorate as post-secondary. But now the issue is that we've changed just a few of these variables in highest education. We've recoded just a few, but all the other ones are set to NA. So this is pretty problematic. We want to recode, but we don't want to lose information. Well, there's a very simple way to handle this. It's that we want to keep all the other rows with their default value. So now let's write this again without forgetting the case one statement. All right, it's a case one. And then we have our highest education in, so once again, same thing, university, doctorate. And then this will be coded as post-secondary. And then our true condition argument will be highest education. And this is going to keep the default variables. All right, if we run this, there you go. There you see that this is what we want. We have kept all the information about secondary, primary, um, but we have also recoded university and doctorate into one category, which is post-secondary. And so this is how you put here a variable on the right hand side of your true statement and this in this manner you keep all the other values all the unmatched values remain the values by default all right your turn to try it out we're going to do something a bit similar in the flu data set so we're going to take the outcome variable and we're going to replace the value recover by recovery and i'll see you back here in a bit. Let's now see our next thematic, so our next topic, which is how to write a case one statement that is using multiple conditions on a single variable. This time it's our left hand side of the tilde which is going to be affected, so it's going to be writing a condition that has multiple parts, so basically a multi-condition. Let's have an example with the BMI variable, which you have previously encoded in the mutate lesson. So this should bring back some memories. We're going to create um, a Yaoundé BMI, where as we have done in mutate, we're going to convert the height in centimeters to meters, and then we are going to also define the BMI variable. Then we're going to apply case one to this new variable. All right. So the height in centimeters divided by 100 for meters. And then the BMI is, so the weight in kilogram divided by the height in meters power square. And then we're going to select just the BMI because we want to just have a look at this for the rest of our tree. So there we go. We have our BMI here that has been de defined, when which we will be using for what comes next. The BMI is a health indicator and you can really define different states of health using it. So a healthy BMI is defined between 18.5 and 25, so the person has a normal overall weight for their height. Um, the BMI is considered as underweight, if the person has a BMI which is inferior to 18.5. The BMI is considered an, 
an indicator of overweight if it's between 25 and 30. And then finally, people are considered obese if their BMI is above 30. What you can see is that usually this is going to imply multiple conditions on the BMI values. So how are we going to write this? Well, we are going to take the case one statement to make a classification. So we're going to start with the first condition, which is that people who have a BMI between 18.5 and 25 have a normal weight. So we are going to use the BMI variable and we're going to say if it's basically superior to 18.5 and the BMI is inferior to 25. Actually, let's make that an inferior equal. That way we account for all the cases. Then this person has a normal weight. Then if we have our second condition, which is for people who are underweight, it's a BMI that's inferior to 18.5. And this is categorized as underweight. What am I writing? <laughs> Now, the next one is about people who are overweight. So once again, it's a dual condition. The BMI has to be superior or equal to 25, and the BMI has to be inferior to 30. So it's two conditions once again. And this, we would input overweight. And finally, if the BMI is superior to 30, well, superior or equal, to 30, then we are going to input that the person is obese. So here you have different kinds of conditional statements. Here you have single conditions for underweight and obese. And then for the other two, you have dual conditions. So two conditions that are defining your overall condition for inputting that value. So now if we run this, we see that we get a very fine grain categorization of people. So some people are obese, others are overweight, normal weight. And in this manner, we can learn very interesting things about our data set. Here we're going to use Tableau to have a look at what we get once we are looking at the application of this health indicator. And what we see is quite interesting. So we see that we have no NA values in our variable. It's a good way of having a quick look at your data set because you make categories that make sense to you and then you can quickly look at the proportions that you have inside your data set. It's your turn to have some practice. So we're going to use the flu line list data and we're going to make a new column called adolescent that has the value yes if the person is in the age group 10 to 19 years old and the value no for everyone else. Have a go at it and see you very soon. Welcome back. I hope that went well. So as I spoiled earlier, after multiple conditions on a single variable, what was going to come naturally is that we're going to do multiple conditions on multiple variables. So this is going to be once again impacting the left hand side. We have at the moment involved a single variable at a time, but you can have multiple variables in your multiple conditions that are going to define an, a, some kind of case classification. We're going to see an example that is using age years and sex, and we would see how we combine conditions on these two variables to make um, what we will call recruiting groups. So let's start by selecting both of these variables, so age years and sex, and we're going to make a subset called Yaoundé age sex. There we go, we have our two variables here and here. We're going to imagine that we want to basically subset our existing data into women and men who are between 20 and 29, and we want to subset this into two different studies. So we're going to make a new variable called recruit that has the following definition. We're going to code women who are aged between 20 and 29 as recruit female study 
men who are between 20 and 29 as recruit to male study, and then everyone else will be coded as do not recruit. Let's make this new recruit variable. So let's create our case one statement. We are going to have, so the age years is always going to have the same condition. So it's going to be superior to 20 and age years inferior to 29. So let's actually make these inclusive. So let's add equals. There we go. That way we're taking people who are also 20, also 29. And then for our first one, we're also going to put a condition on the sex. So we're going to want the sex to be female. And then if all of these three conditions are filled out, so a dual condition on age and then a condition on gender, then we are going to define this as recruit to female study. There we go. That's our first one. Then for men, we have the same condition on age years. So there we go. Older than 20 and also younger than 30. And then the sex is this time equal to male. And this we recruit to male study. And then for everyone else, we use true. And we set do not recruit. We get a very clear categorization of people who we want for our studies and people who we do not. So we do not, you see that here we have a 45 year old female, which we will not recruit. Same for the next line, who is a 55 year old male. We will also not recruit someone who has missing information. So for example, here it's missing the age. So this person will not be recruited. And then for anyone who is matching our conditions, so a 23 year old male, he will be recruited to the male study and a 20 year old female will be recruited to the female study. Now it's your turn to practice. You will be making a new column also called recruit. So very similar task, which will be following us the following definition. So individuals that are aged between 30 and 59 and that are from the Jiangsu province will be categorized as recruit to Jiangsu study. And then individuals who are aged 30 to 59 from the Zhejiang province, apologies for pronunciation, um, will be categorized as recruit to Zhejiang study. And if anyone cares to write to me in the comment how this is pronounced, please do. Um, and everyone else will be categorized as do not recruit. So very similar to what we just did, just this time, instead of using information about gender, you'll be using geographical information. So have a go and see you back in a minute. So welcome back. Now we're going to touch upon something that we already kind of looked at using the true argument of case one. It is the order of priority of conditions in case one. But if you have these types of conditions, you may have an issue with the order. Let's have a look at first this example where we have our categorization, which is people inferior to 18 as child, people inferior to 30 young adults, and people who are younger than 120 years old, which are older adults. 120 is quite old. And we get our categorization. Everything is fine. We have our older adults as older adults, our young adults, our children that are categorized. Everything is perfect. But you may notice one thing, and it is that the age conditions overlap. That means that technically anyone between 0 and 120 should be categorized as older adult, even a baby. But this does not occur. And the reason for this is that case one is like a series of branching logical steps. So this is an illustration. We wrote first our condition about child. So everyone got categorized as child who is below 18. Otherwise, it went to the second condition. People who are below 30 were categorized as young adults. And those remaining kind of were the last ones to whom this condition was applied. So it's really this branching where if you have the first condition that regroups people, 
then everyone else that's remaining gets the second condition applied, and then again, everyone else remaining has the third condition applied, and so on and so forth. So whatever condition you put first will be applied to everyone, and then the condition that you put second will be applied to anyone who hasn't been matched by the condition. Let's see a bit more about this. Now imagine we change the order. We now have older adult first, then young adult, then child. Well, if you've understood this branching phenomenon, you'll see that basically in this situation, everyone gets, ca gets categorized as older adult. And the reason is that everyone does match this condition. So the first thing that is applied to everyone is to check if they're below 120 years old, which they are, because everyone is generally be below 120 years old. And so they all get categorized older adult. And then when it moves to this otherwise, well, it's simply that there's no one left here to categorize as below 30 because everyone already fit this first condition. So this shows you the importance of the order of your conditions. You can avoid this if you write closed bound conditions. So closed bound conditions will be writing out intervals of numbers. So it's what we did, for example, for the BMI. The BMI, we wrote closed bound intervals, which means 18.5 to 25, 25 to 30, and we didn't leave open-ended conditions. So let's rewrite our initial conditions as closed bounded conditions. So we have age years inferior to 18, which is child. That we agree. This is sufficient to define it. However, for young adults, we're going to write age years, that is superior or equal to 18, and age years that is inferior to 30. And this will be our young adult. And then for the older adult, we're going to have oopsie, age years, which is superior or equal to 30, and age years inferior to 120. And this will be older, an older adult. Now, when we run this, we get the same thing as before. So you may not see it right away, but the beauty of it is that we can kind of switch around our conditions. Look at what I'm going to do. We're going to put this condition first. So there we go. So we're going to take away this comma here, oopsie, and this is still going to work. There we go. Now we have put this older adult condition before, and we could have also maybe switched around the young adult condition. You can basically put them in whatever order you want if they are closed bound conditions. If they are open conditions, it's very important to keep in mind what is their order. The other reason that we need to know this is because there are case scenarios where you may want to use open-ended conditions. It's not always possible to write them closed bounded so that there's no doubt about your conditions. We're going to see an example of this with while using the COVID-19 symptoms variable. So the symptoms columns means that it's symptoms experienced by respondents during a six month period. We're going to define whether a person may have had COVID following their symptoms and following the guidelines of WHO. So what does this mean? We're going to define that someone who had a cough, it's possible that it's a COVID case. If someone had anosmia or agusia, so a loss of smell or taste, then it's a probable COVID case. And you have to keep in mind that probable is more likely than possible, which means that anosmia, agusia are more significant symptoms than cough. So this is kind of the rules, the definitions of how we are going to write out um, our categorization of if people are possible, probable COVID cases. We're also going to define um, a respondent of particular interest, and her name is Ozma. Ozma has both cough 
and anosmia agusia symptoms. So she has both symptoms that would label her as both possible COVID and or probable COVID. Now, how should we categorize her? I'll let you think on that, maybe even pause the video. Well, I hope you had the intuition that we should classify Ozma as a probable COVID case because this, um, the condition for probable COVID, so having anosmia agusia symptoms, takes precedence over the criterion for possible COVID, which is the cough, meaning the information about this symptom is more important than about this symptom, and it should have more importance. So let's see what this looks like when we're going to code it up. So we're going to start by selecting our symptom columns. So there we go, first one and second one. Then we're going to select only certain individuals which are going to illustrate the situation we want to highlight. So we're going to select four individuals that have the indexes that I'm typing out right now. We're going to create this object. There we go. We have very different cases. And now we are going to create our case one. And we're going to start by setting a condition on the symptom anosmia, anosmia or agusia. If this is yes, then we have defined that this is a probable COVID. And then if our symptom is cough, then we have defined that this is a possible, oopsie, forgot, possible COVID. So when we run this, what we see is that we get a correct classification. We get that someone who had a cough symptom is classified as possible COVID, but anyone who had anosmia or agusia symptoms are classified as probable COVID. As for people who had no symptoms, they're just an NA classification because we didn't kind of set up a situation on how we wanted to annotate them. We could, for example, set the true to, for example, not COVID if we wanted to label those instead of having them be NA. But now, what happens if we switch around the conditions? That means here, coming down to this part, we see that here, the only thing that has changed is that the the condition on cough being yes and defining possible COVID is before the anosmia or agusia condition. So let's see what this looks like. There, all of a sudden, we no longer have osma classified in the right way. Because once again, with this branching phenomenon, she fell into the classification of cough as possible COVID, so she wasn't even considered to be classified as probable COVID, even though this symptom anosmia or agusia variable is also set to yes. So this is very important to show why maybe in this situation uh, you should pay attention to the order of your conditions. Or you would have to add a condition to ensure that you are classifying rig rigorously. So imagine you want to first handle this possible COVID um, classification then you would set symptom cough is equal equal to yes and you would add a condition which would be that symptom anosmia or agusia is not equal to yes this way it says that if you have someone like osma who have both equal to yes then it will transit to the second evaluation where and it will classify her correctly as probable covid Let's verify this when we run this. There we go. Now we have our correct classification. This is a question of how you want to structure your code, how many conditions you want to have in there. The idea is always to have the clearest code. So if you ask me for my opinion, something like this, the more you add conditions, the more rigorous you are, will make that you will not have these errors. So it really depends on your level of confidence in what you are doing, it's, already, it's always better to be safe than sorry with your conditions. Now it's your turn to practice, where you're going to take the flu data set and you're going to create a new column called follow-up priority that is going to implement the following decision. So women should be considered as high priority. All children under 18 years old of any gender should be considered highest priority. 
and everyone else should have the value no priority. Have a go at it and I'll see you back here in a, in a little minute. Now we will be seeing the last part of the lesson. So we're going to actually leave aside case one. I hope you're not too sad. If else is structured that if the condition is true, then one operation is applied, else the alternative is applied. So it's very, it's only for binary conditions and it can always be written as a case one statement. So you don't have to know or use if else, but it's important that you maybe have seen it. That way, if you use someone else's code, you will know what it is doing. So let's see a bit. Let's take our example of recoding the highest education variable. This is something we did not too long ago. This is the version we explored with case one. So when we run it, imagine you want to do the same with if else. Well, this is how we would be doing it. So if else takes a condition, and then it takes two other um, arguments. It takes the argument of if it is true and if it is false. And for us in this situation, if it is true, we want to recode university and doctorate to post-secondary. And if it is false, we want to have the default variable, the default value of our variable. So let's look into this. Let's not forget the comma, very important. And then here we will put highest education as an example. So basically what this is saying is that if this condition is true, then we recode post-secondary. If it is false, then we keep the default variable. And when we run this, you will see that we get exactly the same thing as above using the case one statement. The last practice question of the day, you're going to be using the fluid lineless data and you're going to be making an, the age group column once again with below 50 and 50 and above. It's at this time, you're going to use the if else function. So it's exactly the same question as in your, uh, as the first practice question. Then you're going to write it with an if else statement. So congratulations, you now master within mutate the two additional helper verbs, case one and if else. It is such an essential part of transformations, this transformation on conditions, that it deserved its very own lesson. So really pay attention, take your time to become familiar with case one and if else is going to be extremely handy in your future data wrangling. And I look forward to treating our next topic very soon. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone, welcome for this new lesson. Today we'll be looking into two new Diplaya verbs. It will be group by to learn how to group our variables, as well as summarize to obtain summary statistics. Let's go. Welcome to this lesson. Here are our learning objectives for today. It means we'll know how to use in and out the verbs group by and summarize by the end. And we'll come back to these different learning objectives at the end of our lesson. Let's start by loading our data. So we will be using today mainly the Yaoundé COVID-19 data set. We'll be selecting a bunch of the variables of interest. So let's make our Yao subset. There we go. So we have a subset, our classical 971 data entries, and uh, this time we are keeping 15 variables. And we'll start this lesson off by a small recap as to what is exactly a summary statistic. Well, a summary statistic is when you have a sequence of values, such as, for example, one of our variables, like age, and that you summarize it into a single value, such as the mean. So you have 
many different kinds of ways of summarizing into a single value. It can be either the, so the counts, it can be the position, so first, last, nth. It can be the center, so whether it's the mean or the median of your sequence of values. It can be the spread, so the standard deviation or the interquantile range. And then it can also be different elements of the sequence of values in a, diff in a specific range, such as the minimum, the maximum, the quantiles. So the idea is to really capture an aspect of the sequence of values by summarizing it into a single value. So, why does this matter? Well, because this summarizing is one of the most informative manners of doing data analysis, and so in your data wrangling, you will often be asked or required to summarize variables. So that is one really important reason that you should become fluent in computing them. And for this, you'll see that there's no better tool than the summarize function that we are going to see. So introducing summarize. To kind of reinforce why Summarize is so beautiful, we'll actually start by computing summary statistics without using Summarize. And then we'll see why we should use it. So let's see how we're going to find the mean age of the respondents in the Yao data frame. So we're going to create a vector called Yao age, which is going to be just the age years variable, which we're extracting using here the dollar sign. And then we're going to go see the first elements of Yao age. Go Here we have extracted the vector Yao age and we're seeing its first six elements. Now, let's say that we want to get the mean of this vector. Well, we could do something like mean Yao age. And there we go. We have the mean of the age of the respondents over our entire Yao subset. So it's extremely easy. So we might wonder why we want to use Summarize. Well, let's first introduce how you would write, in, write it with Summarize. You would write Yao, then you would write mean age is equal to the mean of age years. There we go. We run it. And we now see that we get the same value as above. We get the same value using summarize than as doing it classically. The syntax, as I have just typed out, is quite simple, where you put your data frame, you pipe summarize, you define the new column name, and then here you input your summary function and the column, so the variable, that you want to apply it to. You can also compute multiple summary statistics. So let's compute the mean and the median of our age variable to see if they are the same. It's very similar. Mean age years. And then the median age will be defined with the median function, which we know. Let's run this. Nice and simple, super easy. This is where we see that we have a difference between the mean and the median of our age distribution. So always something good to keep in mind when doing further statistics. And we have gotten this very nice summary of our age variable with two lines of code and the summarize verb. But the moment where summarize becomes really essential and where you'll be happy you have this verb is when you're gonna be working on grouped summaries. So when you're gonna group your variables together and you're going to want to have your summary statistics by groups. We're going to get to what groups and summarizing over groups means in just a second. But first, it's time for you to have your first practice question about summarize. So you're going to use summarize and the relevant summary functions to obtain the mean, the median, and the standard deviation of the weights of the respondents of the Yao data frame. So your data frame output that you'll be submitting in this question should look something like this. So it should have the mean weight kilogram, median weight kilogram, and the SD, so standard deviation, weight kilogram. I will let you have a go, and then you can try the second practice question, which is use summarize and the relevant summary functions to obtain the minimum 
and the maximum, so this is a different kind of summarizing over your variable, of the respondent's height. So basically the tallest and shortest person. I will see you back here in a second after you've done these two questions. Welcome back. I hope that your first usage of summarize was a success. Now, let's get into these grouped summaries and how we are going to use summarize with group by. So I mentioned this notion of making your data into groups. What does it mean making your grouping your data? Well, a simple example is going to be males versus females. So these are two groups. They're both in your sex or gender variable, but within the same variable, you have two distinct groups. So two distinct categories, if you will. Let's group by and then let's see how group by does the job of splitting operations by group. All right. So we're going to group by the sex variable of Yao. And you see that nothing happens. Our table is still the same size. However, you see that here we have an additional little box that has appeared, which tells us that our groups are by sex and that there are two groups. But there is a change in the way it is perceived as a data frame. Now it is a grouped data frame. If you're working more in the console, you'll see something like this appear. And now let's see the power of it. Let's group by sex and let's get the mean. My apologies, let's get the mean age by sex. So we're going to do the mean age years and we're so the same thing as we just did before, but this time we're doing it by group. This is our difference and in this lies the power of putting these two together. It is that now we keep the sex variable and you have a mean and a median which is for each gender. So the mean age of women is 29.49, so the median age is 26. And for males, it's a bit older, well, it's, bit, it's a bit younger, my bad, it's 28.39, with a median age of 25. And this is how you start getting descriptive statistics by group. And a lot of the data analysis that you will have to do implies getting this. So it's very important to know and to be familiar with this. Let's see another example of this. So now we're going to group by neighborhoods and we are going to summarize to get the min and the max weight of the population by neighborhood. So the mean weight is equal to min weight kilogram and then the max weight is equal to max weight kilogram. So now when we run this, we see that we are getting a minimal and maximal weight per neighborhood. So this is really giving us more geographical relevant information rather than, rather than just having the minimum weight and the maximum weight over our entire data set. Let's see one more example for good measure. We are going to be using um, a variable you haven't seen yet, so we'll take a small look at it before we dive in. It's called n days miss work, which tells us the number of days that a respondent missed work because of a COVID-19 like um, phase where he had COVID-19 like symptoms. So if we just have a quick look at it before we manipulate it, miss work, there we go. We see that we have one variable with numerical values or NA values. And now let's see if we can summarize this variable. So once again, we're going to do it by gender and we're gonna have a sum of all days missed by gender. So we're going to sum over N days miss work. And when we run this, well, oopsie, we see that we get actually NA values as there are NA values in our column. So here you can add a little NA remove equals true within sum to get 
what you actually want, which is the total days missed per female and male. By adding this NA remove true, you're basically going to tell your, your summarizing operation to disregard the NA entries. So next practice question. I'm going to ask you to use group by and summarize to obtain the mean weight by smoking status in the Yao data frame. And then for the second practice question, you'll be using group by and summarize for the, and the relevant summary function to obtain the minimum and maximum heights of each sex in the Yao data frame. And then we even have a third practice question where you're going to use group by, summarize and sum and calculate the total number of bedridden days. So this is a variable you also haven't seen yet called n bedridden days, which is reported by the respondents of each sex. So your template data frame is this and you will submit it here. So I hope you're not too tired after those three practice questions. I hope that they went well, that you're starting to feel familiar with using group by and summary, summarize. <laughs> I had an interesting pronunciation there. And for an, our next part, so our next part is going to be even further intricate usage of group by because we're gonna see group by multiple variables. So in other words, it's also called nested grouping. The idea is that you're not only going to group by sex or by age, you're also going to group by more than one variable, so potentially by both of these. So we're going to give an example right away by grouping both by men and women in each neighborhood. So this means that we'll be grouping by sex and by neighborhood to calculate the mean age. So it looks something like this. We have grouped by two variables now. So this is a nested grouping. And now we're going to summarize to get the mean age of each of the groups that can be created by the different combinations of these variables. So there you go. You see that now we have our first entries here, which are for all the female patient respondents of the study per neighborhood. And afterwards, if we go further in our data frame, we have all the male replies for the different neighborhoods and as well as their mean age. So we're getting now a visual which is not only geographical but which is also gendered. So we're really getting to levels of information that is getting more and more precise inside our data frame. So for once we won't be having a part which is about order and how order matters because it does not. Um, it's the same thing to put neighborhood before sex or sex before neighborhood. The only thing that is going to change is uh, the presentation inside the data frame. So giving you a quick example of what this looks like. If we put neighborhood before sex, then just we are going to have first variable to be the neighborhood. And we'll see now that for the briquetry neighborhood, the female mean is Low, the female mean age is lower than the male mean age and so on and so forth. So maybe if your main focus is the neighborhoods and then the gender, then this is a better organization because it's easier to see in each neighborhood who, has, uh, who is older between the two different genders. But truly, it really depends how you want to look at it. So perfect. Practice again. Yes, there's a lot of practice in this lesson. So now, you'll be using the Yao data frame and you're going to group it by gender and by treatments. And you're going to be then using summarize to extract the summary of the mean of the weight. Then so your second practice question will be to group by age category in the variable age category three, gender and IgG results. And to then summarize to calculate the mean of the bedridden days. All right, I will meet you here after those two questions. Welcome back. After seeing so much about grouping, it's essential that we talk actually about ungrouping. There's a special verb in, dip, in Diplaya, which is ungroup, and which you should 
use because until you use it your data is still grouped it can have a lot of unwanted downstream effects you should remember to ungroup as soon as you no longer need the groups for your data wrangling it's good practice let's look at what happens when we have our data grouped by one variable so we're going to group it by sex and we're going to calculate the mean age so this is mean age years. So when we group it by sex, we get a table and we have no indication of further grouping. Now, if we group it by two variables, then we are going to see something a bit different. We see that the data still remains grouped by the first variable. If we were to switch around sex and neighborhood as we did before, then it would still remain grouped by neighborhood. So this means that when you're going to manipulate your data further, you are going to have results that are grouped by sex, which is maybe going to create problems. And I'm now going to give you an example of persistent grouping and how it's going to create weird behavior downstream. And I'm going to do so using the example of select. So we're grouping by two variables, sex, neighborhood. We're summarizing to get the mean age. And then we want to extract only the mean age variable. So let's do that. We would classically write this. And you agree with me that what would come out is one single column. This is what we expect when we're going to select just the mean age. Well, this is not what happens when you have a grouping. When you have a grouping, what happens is that you're going to still have the sex column selected and this column that you want. But it makes that you have an unusual behavior of select, which is still going to take in into consideration this variable because the data frame itself is grouped by this variable. So if you wanted to avoid this, you would have to use ungroup. So an example of this would now be to add ungroup after you're summarizing. Let's see what it looks like. All right, this is summarizing by the mean age. We get the same thing as before, but here we no longer have an indication that it's grouped by sex. And now if we take it to you doing select, we'll see that we have no weird behavior. So we ungroup because we're done with what we want. And now we want to select the mean age. And there we go. This is our normal select attitude when the data is not grouped. So this is a very small example. We will see further examples of group by and other verbs later on. And it's just very important that you keep in mind this reasoning that if you are done with your grouped operations, you ungroup. Now we come to a really interesting and great part of this lesson, which is counting rows. As said by Hadley Wickham, which is the chief scientist at our studio, you can do a lot of data science by just counting and occasionally dividing. So counting rows, you should really see it as a big tool in your arsenal for getting information from your data. There's different ways that we can count rows. We're gonna see several of them. The first one is going to be to count how many observations there are per group using group by and summarize. So we're gonna count how many individuals there are in each neighborhood group. So we're going to group by neighborhood. And then we are going to count by doing total equal n. So when we do this, we get a total per neighborhood. And we can see, for example, that the most populated neighborhood is Courier with 236 individuals. Another interesting aspect is that we can calculate another summary statistic at the same time. So let's group again by neighborhood. Let's count the same way we did before, so using n. And at the same time, let's get the mean age per neighborhood. So now we're going to get a data frame with three columns where we're getting 
the number of individuals and then the mean age. That way we can see, for example, that our most populated neighborhood has a mean age of almost 29 years old. So now it's your turn to practice. So I'm going to ask you using the occupation variable in the Yao subset to summarize and count the number of occupations as well as to calculate by occupation the mean number of work days missed. You should be careful of any values and I'll see you back in a little bit to see another way of counting rows. Welcome back. Now we're going to see how to count rows that meet a condition. Because the beauty is that we can place a condition within the sum function. So once again, we're going to count by neighborhood. Well, we're going to group by neighborhood first. Then we're going to count those that are under 18. So we're going to do sum age years under 18. We're putting the condition within the sum function and it's going to give us a specific count. And here we see we have all of a sudden our neighborhoods with the count of people that are under 18 within each one. Let's see another example. Now we're going to count the number of people who have a doctorate degree in each neighborhood. So we're going to do sum again and we're going to write highest education equal equal doctorate. So now we're going to get the sum, but only over those that have the value highest education equal to doctorate. So the number of people who have a doctorate in each neighborhood. The neighborhood with the most doctorate respondents is Nukum Kana. And once again, for this pronunciation, if someone wants to let me know in the chat how it is pronounced exactly, I would love that. And now let's see a final example. We're going to look at the treatment combination variable, which is showing the treatments received by people during the COVID-19 like symptoms. Uh, please note that no treatments is an NA value and we will count the people that have received no treatment. So first let's have a quick look at what this variable look like, looks like so that you get familiar with it. So there we go. So we see that we have people who get only one treatment, people who get no treatment, and people who get combinations of treatments. And so now if we group by neighborhood and we count the number of people who have not received a treatment or who have received unknown treatment, then you would do sum with is NA inside of treatment combinations. This way, we only sum over the number of respondents who have NA treatments. So for whom is NA treatments combinations is true. So we see that, for example, there are two neighborhoods where there's a majority of people who have, n where there's more people who have either not received treatment or have unknown treatments, which would be Ekudu and Carrier. So now, it's your turn to practice it, to practice this a bit. I'm going to ask you to group the Yao data frame by the respondents' symptoms and to count how many respondents have these symptoms only within the adult respondents. So that is, you're going to use the sum function and you're going to set a condition to only consider adults using, for example, age category three variable. That's a small hint. Your data frame should look like this, and you can input it here. And I will see you back in a moment to see a final way of counting rows. This is the last way that you can count rows, and it literally has the name count. So we're going to see an example of how to use it using the occupation variable. So we would say count occupation. And when we run this, we see that per occupation, we get an n variable which is created, indicating how many people have this occupation within our data set. If you have a look, you would see that it's the same output as for group by occupation and summarize with n. We get 
exactly the same thing. So it's reducing two lines of code into one single line because that way you get your information even faster as it's a very, very common operation in data analysis. You can also apply count in a nested fashion. So let's count by sex and occupation. And now you have your information by sex and by occupation with the number of respondents who are of that gender with that occupation. I will this time ask you to use the count verb to count rows and to do a count that is by gender, age categories and IgG results. And then you can get onto the second question which will be counting by age category as well as number of bedridden days. And now we move to a very important aspect of the group by, and it is that what do you do if you want to include missing combination in your summaries? Because you see, the thing is that when you use group by and summarize on multiple variables, it's going to create the summary statistic for every unique combination in the grouped variables that is actually present in your data. If there's a combination between, for example, as we saw before, between sex and occupation, and that for one occupation there are no men doing this occupation, then this combination of the two will not be present in your data. So let's see an example of this missing combination by creating a bit of an artificial example. So we're going to create a data set where there are no male children. We will start by dropping those children. So let's leave out all male children. So we're going to type up that TTD. We want age category three, equal, equal child, and sex equal male. And we do not want to keep this. So we are going to embody it in this manner. So this way we have a yao no male children. There we go. And now if we group by age category three and we summarize by the number of individuals and we group by sex, so by both, then you're going to see a missing combination. You're going to see that for all other age categories we have female and male with the number of individuals, same for senior, but for child, we only have female children, 155, but we do not have a row saying child male, zero. And for different manipulations, maybe also for the clarity of your data set, you may want to actually have that information, even if the resulting count is zero. So let's see how you would include these missing combinations. So, first of all, for this operation, you need to make sure that your variables are factors. So, we would write age category as factor, age category. You've seen how to do this very well in the mutate lesson. And then sex is a factor. When we write it like this, here we convert to factors. Then we're going to group by these two variables. So, let's start by age category grouping and then sex. And then we're going to summarize the count. We're going to do n. So there we go. And here we have this by adding here, drop is equal to false. So here you have the example of how you're going to add the missing combination right there. So now when we run this, Ta-da, it appears right there. So child, male, and there are zero individuals. So in this manner, what's important to remember is you want these two to be now factors. That way, R knows that these are categories, that they should really check all the different combinations of these categories. And then you need to add in your group by this drop is equal to false, meaning we do not drop any categories and we want to see all of them, even if the resulting count is zero. So let's see one more example. 
This time we will be using a real example, not artificially changed. So we're going to group by sex and highest education. And then we're going to summarize by the mean age. So mean age is equal mean age years. What we're going to see is that there are one, two, three, four, five, six rows for women and seven rows for men, meaning that there's a missing combination for this, for this um, grouping and it happens to be female other. So you could say maybe not that important to have it, but it's always nice to have the same number of categories. So either here you would do a grouping where you add this drop false argument, or you could also just drop from this, uh, this resulting summarizing data frame the male other. That way you have the same number of categories in both sexes. So this way we're going to see the version where we create the combination because that's what we want to work on. So we are going to do highest education as a factor. And then we are going to put sex as a factor. And we're going to group by, actually let's group by the other way around, that way we see it better. Highest education, sex, we set drop is equal to false. And then we summarize for the mean age with the command that you must be getting very familiar with. All right. And there we go. Now, when we look at the resulting combinations, there's seven entries for women, seven entries for men. And for the other females, we get a NAN value for the mean, indicating that this combination is not present in the data set. So, all right, your turn to practice this out. I'm going to let you calculate the median age with the grouping of neighborhood and age category and gender. Note that we want all possible combinations of these three variables. So you should keep in mind this drop argument. You also need to pay attention that you have two data wrangling imperatives. So it's converting your grouping variables to factors. And then you should also calculate your statistic, the median, while removing any values. There you go. You've seen how you keep missing combinations. Now, why would you want to do so? Let's see a quick example with some plotting. So no panicking. You may never have plotted before. So it will be a very simple code along. Here you see we're doing once again our example with the Yao no male children. This is what we have been doing before. We've ungrouped. Yay. And we're going to now give it into ggplot and we want to plot out the age category graph. So this is our resulting graph. And as you can see, what is very apparent is that for female we have three columns and for male only two because we're missing the children. And so this imbalance of three opposed to two usually is really not okay when you're presenting your graphs. You should have three columns for each one. So how would you remediate, it, remediate this? Well, you would add an empty space indicating that there are zero children in the data set. So when we run our alternate, here you see that because we added our drop false, it takes into consideration also the missing combination. And then when we feed our data wrangled data into ggplot, we get that now we have three different bar plots per different age category with an empty space here for the children that we have artificially removed from the data set. So congratulations for today. You really did a nice job of mastering group by and summarize. And let's take a look at our learning objectives and see how we've attained them. So you now know how to use summarize to extract summary statistics from your data set. You know how to use group by to group variables by single variables or multiple variables to perform grouped operations. You understand why and how you should ungroup after grouping. Remember, always do it. You understand as well how to use N 
with group by and summarize to count rows. You understand how to have a condition within sum to get a specific count based on your needed condition. And you know a final way to count rows using the beautiful count, which is a handy function to get quick results for counting rows. Thank you so much for following this lesson. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello everyone and welcome back for a new lesson. Today we are going to look at how we wrangle with data that is grouped. This is an approach which is called split, apply, combine. It involves using the group by diplaya verb combined with other verbs such as arrange, filter, and mutate. Let's go! Welcome to this lesson, everyone. Today we will have only one learning objective, which will be to use group by with different deep layer verbs. So it will be simple yet intense. Let's get started. Our data sets of today are data sets that you are already familiar with. So we'll be using the COVID-19 data set from Yaoundé, Cameroon. We're gonna select some of the variables of this big data set. And we're gonna make, to start with, a small subset which will be using only the sex and the weight variable. Let's go ahead and do this. So we select the sex and the weight variable, which gives us a very small yet concise data frame with all our data entries and only two variables. Then we'll also be using as another data set for our practice questions, the sarcopenia data set that you are already familiar with, which goes over the condition of sarcopenia, so generalized muscle loss, and which you will be wrangling as practice. And now we will start with the first verb, which behaves in a different manner, whether you're applying it over groups or by itself. So we're going to look at arranging by group. So the verb arrange orders the rows of a data frame by the values of a selected column. It's only sensitive to groupings if the by group argument is set to true. Let's illustrate this. First, let's remind ourselves of the small data subset that we'll be using. Then let's arrange this data by weight. So the way of writing this is using the, word, the verb arrange with the weight in kilogram variable. And what we can see here is, as we can expect, the lower weights have been brought to the top of the data frame. Now, what would happen if we were to group the data first before arranging it? We could expect a different output. So let's imagine we group by sex and then we arrange by weight kilogram. Let's do this. Well, actually, what you can see is that the arrangement is still the same. We still have exactly the way it's ordered in the same way, even though we grouped our data. And the reason for this is that if we want the grouping to affect our arrangement, we have to set the by group argument to true. So let's repeat the same thing. We're going to group by sex. Then we're going to arrange by weight in kilogram. But this time, we're going to set our by group argument equal to true. Let's look at what we get, which is going to be different. So now we have all females ordered from lightest to heaviest, then all males ordered from lightest to heaviest. The grouping has affected the arrangement. However, one thing that you may have already noticed if you've been playing around with arrange or something that I get to highlight to you now is that arrange can actually group 
automatically. So you may not even have to use this argument to reflect the grouping. You can simply directly put inside a range the two different variables. Let's see what this means in the code. We could also write a range sex weight kilogram. When we do so, we see that we get exactly the same output as when we were first grouping by sex and then arranging by weight, taking into account the grouping. Arrange does this already by itself. Now, another aspect that we want to maybe cover is um, if we wanted to order weights, but in the descending order. A kind reminder that we use descend function for the descending order. So the way we would have basically sorting by sex and then having the heaviest people first would look something like this. So we arrange by sex, but we say that we want a descending weight in kilogram. So you can see that you can put descending on either one of your arrangement variables, and this can control how you are arranging them exactly. So there we go, here we get a different output. So now our data set is the female's heaviest to lightest, then the male's heaviest to lightest. Now, it's your turn to have a go and have a tryout at this, uh, at this arranging call. So you will be using the Sarcopenia data set and you will first arrange by sex and then by grip strength. The second question that you will be addressing now to apply this arrangement verb will be to use the Sarcopenia data set and its age group variable which stores the age as strings. So it's either 60s, 70s, 80s. You're going to convert this variable as a factor with the levels in the right order, so ascending order of age. If you have a doubt about how to re-level or define the levels of a factor, I invite you to look back on the case one lesson when we went over this. And then I ask you with a nested arrange to arrange first by age group, so younger individuals first, and then by height in meters, so shorter individuals first. And I will see you back here to continue the lesson in a second. Now we will see some, another topic, which is filtering by groups. As a kind reminder, I'm sure you're now familiar with it, filter is used to keep or drop rows based on a condition. And filter, when it is applied on grouped data, is going to do the filtering operation separately for each group. So what does this mean? Well, imagine we first want to filter the data for the heaviest person. We would write filter weight in kilogram equal equal max weight in kilogram. This gives us one female individual, which is 162 kilograms. Now, what if we wanted not the heaviest person in the whole data set, but the heaviest man and the heaviest woman? Well, we would have to take the maximal weight per gender group. This immediately makes you think of group by. So we group by sex, and then we do the same filtering operation, but on group data. So once again, we do the weight in kilograms equal equal to the max weight in kilograms. And now we do not only have this female who is 162 kilograms, we also have the heaviest male in our data set, which is 128 kilograms. So now we have had a grouped filtering to find the heaviest man and the heaviest woman. We have seen that with groupings, we can do nested groupings, so groupings by more than one variable. 
Well, you can do filtering by nested groupings. So let's say we want to work on this example we have just seen, the heaviest man, the heaviest woman, but now we want them by age group. Well, we would group by sex and by age category. And we would perform the same filtering operation below. What is changing is the grouping that we are imposing on our data set. When we run this, we now see that we have many more rows and information. We actually have all in all 10 rows. And the reason that we have 10 rows is because we have two sex groups and five groups per age groups. And this makes 10 unique groupings. The 10 unique groupings with the heaviest individual per group are presented in this data frame. You might also notice that this is a bit scattered as an output. So let's see how we would combine group by, filter and arrange to have something a bit more readable. Let's now arrange by sex and age category. We now have something that's a bit more ordered where we have the females here, the five rows, and the males here, the five rows. Yet we're still seeing that there's a bit of an issue with the age category and the way they are ordered. So let's see how we would handle this. We're going to redefine the age category as a factor to make sure that this is in the order that we want. So we would write factor age category and then we would define the levels in a C vector by putting them as 5 to 14, which are the youngest, then 15 to 29, then 30 to 44, then 45 to 64, and finally 65 plus with a space there. We want to respect that, actually. We can see that there are spaces everywhere. And if we don't put exactly the same string, then we will not get a good conversion. So let's check our parenthesis. We see that we don't need this one, so we can remove it. And when we run this, we now have a very ordered data frame. We can be happy with this. It's very clear, very readable, where we have our first five rows, which are females, because we arranged first by sex, then by age category. And moreover, our age categories are in the right order. It's your turn to practice. So here is how you will be practicing this today. You'll be grouping the sarcopenia data frame by age group and by sex, and then you will filter for the highest skeletal muscle, mass, muscle index in each of these nested groupings. Welcome back. I hope you now feel comfortable with filtering on groups by combining filter and group by. We will now move to another combo, very powerful as well, which is mutating by group, which as you can expect is going to combine group by and mutate. As a kind reminder, although once again I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this by now, mutate is used to modify columns in place or to create new ones. With group data, mutate operates over each group independently. That's kind of the common song of these groupings. It's that when you apply a verb over them, then the wrangling is going to be applied by group. So let's first see a regular mutate call. We are going to create a new variable which is going to rank respondents by weight. So we have to do this we call mutate and we are going to call our rank weight variable which is going to be equal to rank weight kilogram. Here we have our initial mutated variable where we see that the first individual is the 901th lightest individual 
over our entire data set. To be honest, I, maybe it would actually make more sense to have the rank be in a descending order, meaning that we are talking about the heaviest individuals. Let's quickly change that. The way we would do that is we would do our rank weight is equal to rank descending weight kilograms. Now we have something that, may, that is maybe a bit more intuitive to read, which is that our first individual in the data set is the 71st heaviest individual overall, and so on and so forth with all the other individuals listed here. This also makes sense as we saw that our heaviest person overall was 162 kilos. So we also can do a sanity check that everything's good with our new ranking variable. We've done a simple mutate call. We're familiar with that. Let's see what happens when we do a group mutate call. We want to add this weight rank column per sex group in the data frame. So we're going to group by gender and we want to know each person's weight rank in their sex category. So not overall, overall individuals, but it's how are women ranked compared to women? How are men ranked compared to men? Let's see what this looks like in the code. We would do group by sex. Then we would do the same operation as above, which is mutate rank weight equal to rank descending weight in kilograms. Let's once again arrange this to get some clarity. So we arrange by sex. So we've arranged by sex to have a bit of a clearer view of the different ranks. Now, same as previously shown for filtering, well, we can do a mutating with nested groupings. Let's see this with a simple example. Let's group by sex and age category and then have the rank of each individual in their own group. So we group by sex, by age, category. If you look at the first individual, who is a female in the age category 45 to 64, we see that in her sex and age group, she is ranked as the 20th heaviest individual. So now we have a ranking which is even more tailored to different groups. So now it's your turn to practice. You'll be using the Sarcopenia dataset. You'll be grouping by age group and creating a new variable called the grip strength rank, which is going to rank per age group each individual's grip strength. So I'll let you try this out. We are going to take this last mini bit of the lesson to highlight the importance of ungrouping your data once you are done data wrangling over groups. So as written here in capital letters, it's super important when you do a group by operation to then think ungroup once you're done. We're going to illustrate this with the example we just saw where we created groups defined by the gender and age category of individuals and all the different combinations possible, and then created a ranking variable for each of these different groups. So let's run this code chunk to get our Yao modified. And now imagine that on this data set that we have kept, we want to filter to get the oldest person in the data. Well, we would usually do this very tranquilly. We would do so age years equal equal max age years. When we run this, uh-oh, wow, okay. Well, we don't actually just get the oldest person in the entire data frame. We still get the oldest person based on each of the groups and categories that we have created. So we get the oldest person for each combination of gender, and age categories. We get the oldest person for the males aged 45 to 64, we get the oldest person for the males aged 65 plus, etc, etc, etc. So in the end you'll have a data frame which you can see here has 55 rows and this is not at all what you intended. 
And this is okay if you're checking every single step of your data wrangling, but if this goes unobserved, maybe for a plot or something like that, well, it can really cause you some time to realize what's going on and what's wrong. So let's see. We forgot to ungroup. Now let's do this properly. All right, so we do our Yao modified based on this definition. And then we are going to add at the end, very important, right here, ungroup. There we go. So let's run this one. And here we do again the same thing as before. So filter age years equal equal max age years. And we want only the oldest person in the data set, not the oldest person per group. And this is what we get. We actually get two individuals, but this is because they are the two oldest individuals and they are both 79 years old. So there you go. See you in a second for our wrap up. So congrats for completing this lesson. You now know how to operate on groups with different verbs. You know how to combine group by and arrange. You know how to combine group by and filter. And you know how to combine group by and mutate. You are now ready for further data wrangling and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, you will be learning how to pivot data. Pivoting or reshaping is a data manipulation technique which involves the reorientation of rows and columns of your data set. As data analysts, this technique is essential to have in your toolbox because it enables you to transform data to be easily understood and analyzed. Together, we'll cover how to pivot data using the pivot longer and pivot wider functions in the TidyR package. Let's get started. So by the end of this video, you should be comfortable with the following learning objectives. If you'd like, you can pause and read through the bullet points. However, we'll also come back and review them at the end. And as always, we encourage you to follow along on R so you get more practice. Code along with me. So first, let's load in the packages that we'll need for this lesson. We'll need Tidyverse, Outbreaks, Janitor, Rio, Here, and NitR. At this point, you may be wondering what exactly are long and wide data. Well, perhaps it's best if we go over these terms using examples. Imagine a simple scenario wherein you have three patients from whom you collect blood pressure measurements on three separate occasions. Now, the data that you collect can be recorded in a number of different ways. For example, it can be recorded in a wide data format such as this, or alternatively, it can be also recorded in a long format such as the figure shown below. Feel free to pause and study the two figures to make sure that you understand the difference between them. In the first figure showing wide data format, you may have noticed that the observational unit, in this example, the patients, occupy only one row, with the measurements or blood pressure measured across different days in three different columns. This contrasts from a long formatted data wherein the observational units are now spread across multiple rows and the measurements occupy a single column. However, in the long format data, you may have noticed that the observational units, again, our patients, now occupy multiple rows with one measurement per row. Here's another example with mock data, but instead, our observational units are countries. Again, in the long format data, each observational unit, now countries, for example, 
occupy multiple rows with one unique measurement per row. For the wide format data, each country now occupy, again, a single row with multiple measurements across three columns. Now, it's important to note that the examples we've just covered are time series data sets. And this is because the measurements taken were spread across different periods of time, such as days in the first example, or even years in the second example. But this doesn't mean that the concepts of wide and long formats only apply to time series data sets. They're also applicable and relevant to other types of data sets. Take into consideration this example, which shows the number of patients in various hospital units. Now, this isn't a time series data set. However, the concepts of wide and long format data are still the same. In the first figure, again, we see that each observational unit, in this case, the hospitals themselves, occupy only one row with repeated measurements for that unit which are the number of patients in different rooms spread across two columns. But in the long data set, each hospital is spread over multiple rows with measurements occupying one column. Now that we've seen a few examples, it's time for a small practice exercise. Consider the mock data set, wherein we measured temperatures for the countries of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. When we run this code chunk, and we explore, are you able to identify if this is a wide or long data format? Take your time and answer. Given that you're now familiar with the general concepts of wide and long data, you may be wondering in which instances should we use wide or long data? Well, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. There's no straightforward answer on what format would be better, but it's up to you to decide. Wide format is generally better for displaying data because it's visually easier to compare your values. And long data is best for some data analysis tasks such as grouping and plotting. And since there's no straightforward answer to when long or wide data should be used, it's essential for you to know how to switch between the two formats easily. The technique from switching from wide to long format or the other way around is called, you guessed it, pivoting. In the second half of this video, we'll show exactly how to pivot between the different formats using functions we mentioned in the intro, which are pivot longer and pivot wider. Let's dive back in. Hello everyone and welcome back to the second half of the pivoting lesson. In the first half, you became familiarized with the concepts of wide and long data formats, as well as the importance of being able to switch between the two. Now that you understand these general concepts, we can finally cover how to practically apply these techniques. Let's jump back in. To begin, We'll first practice pivoting from wide to long formats using data from Gapminder on the number of infant deaths collected in some countries over the past several years. So let's begin with loading the data set. This is something that you should all be familiar with by now since we've done it quite a few times over the lessons. But if not, no worries, this is the perfect time to practice. So we're going to assign this data set with a name, Infant Deaths Wide and to load in the data from data gapminder excuse me we're going to read csv function here parentheses quotation marks and add in the link to the csv file we run that and that loads the data but to be able to visualize it we need to recall the data set once more infant death, deaths with an S wide. And you have your output, which is a table. In the output that we get when we run the code chunk above, we can confirm that this is indeed a wide format data set because of the following reasons. Our observational unit, which are the countries for this particular example, 
such as Albania, Armenia, Aus Austria, and so on, only occupy one row each. However, the measurements collected, which is the number of infant deaths for each country, are spread across multiple columns. And this is a definition for Y formats that we went over in the previous half of this lesson. If we want to convert this wide format into a long format, we can use the function pivot longer. And within this function, we can also use the Coles argument to specify which columns we want to pivot. Let's see that. First, so let's recall the data set once again and apply our pipe operators, which if you're in a Mac is Shift Command M and pivot longer because we want to pivot from a wide to a long format argument and specify which columns we would like to pivot. So we'll choose the years 2010 to 2015. In the table, we can see that the wide format data has now been transformed into a long format because our countries now occupy multiple rows with one row per year between 2010 and 2015. So 2010 to 2015. The years in this case are indicated in the variable names, which is not super clear here, but if you're following along with me, you should be able to see it. And all the death counts occupy the variable values in this column. Now, if you want to rename the default variables into something more descriptive, like I've mentioned, you can use the arguments names to to rename the variable into years because that is what that variable describes and values to something a little bit more intuitive, which are, which are the deaths count for each country. And here from the table, we can see that this renaming was successful. The variable names has been renamed into year and the variable values has been renamed to deaths count. If you want to make further adjustments, such as removing the X from the front of the years, this is also possible. To remove the X in front of each year, you can use the function parse number from the package read R in tidyverse, which extracts numbers from strings. So in order to do so, shift command M for our pipeline, and we're going to mutate, recall from the previous lesson, year parse number and year to remove again the X in front of each year. And to confirm, yes, this was successful. Again, it's not totally visible, but for this column, it's year and you should have no X's. And with this, we finally have a long format data set. The variables are intuitive. There's no annoying X's in front of the years and we can store this data for later use. And to do that, we just assign it into a different name, deaths long, option minus for the assignment operator. And when you run that code, you should now have saved your long formatted data. For now, it's time for a practice question. Using the Euro births wide data set from Eurostat, convert this wide format into a long format, applying the techniques that we just covered. Take your moment and check in when you've finished. So now we've gone over how to pivot from wide to long data formats using the pivot longer function. But before completely switching gears and learning how to pivot data the other way around, let's first consider in which instances you're likely to encounter data in a long format. First of all, wide data tend to come from external sources, such as the previous examples we went over from Gapminder and Eurostat. 
In comparison, long data is likely to be created by you whilst data wrangling. Now recall that you have done this somewhat in the previous lecture of group by and summarize manipulations. Let's now look at an example of a long format data set using patient records during an Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. So we'll extract this data from the outbreaks package and we'll perform some simplifying manipulations like extraction, um, the year from the date, as well as select and rename, similar to what we've gone over with the wide format. So outbreaks as tibble. Oops. And we're going to mutate the year from loop per date year on set of oh, date of onset there you go and select patient id d district year So to recap, this particular line extracts the year from the date. And this line selects and renames it. So if we run this, From the output, we can see that we have each patient's ID number, their district, and the year in which they contracted Ebola. And each row corresponds to one patient. And it seems like it's now in a long data format according to the definition that we went over earlier. But it's not a long formatted data quite yet. But now if we group the data set by district, which counts the number of patients recorded within the year, we can see in the output that this is now what we would consider a long format data set because our observational units, which are the districts, now occupy multiple rows, so two each specifically, and one row for each measurement which is the year. So as you can see, long formatted data is often obtained as an output of grouped summaries amongst other data manipulations. And now that we have a long data format, how about pivoting it the other way to a wide format? Well, this process is fairly easy. And as the counterpart of the pivot longer function, to convert from a long format to a wide format, we'll now use the pivot wider function. Now within the pivot wider function, there are two arguments that we need to specify, which are values from and names from. So values from will define which values will become the core of the wide data format. In our case, these values were in the variable n. On the other hand, the names from argument identifies which variable to use to define columns in the wide format. In our case, this was the year of onset variable. Now in the output, we can confirm that the long format data we originally had has been transformed into a wide format because our observational unit, which is the districts in this case, now only occupy a single row per district with the measurements, which are the number of patients that contracted Ebola within the year, now are spread across two different columns. It's not very visible, I, I understand, but this would be the column for 2014, 
and this would be the column for 2015. So now, there you go, we have transformed a long format data into a wide format data set. It was mentioned earlier that long formatted data sets are best for a majority of data analysis tasks. Now we can justify why that is by going through some common operations that you'll perform on long formatted data. And in each case, you'll be performing these similar operations on wide formatted data and hopefully observe why performing these similar operations is trickier on wide formatted data. First, let's talk about filtering group data, which is, again, very easy on long formatted data sets, but a little more complicated for wide formatted data. Once again, using the infant deaths data set and example, imagine that we want to answer the following question. For each country, in which year had the highest number of child deaths? So with a long format data, all we need to do is indicate the data set, group by the country, which is your observational unit, and you want to filter by the deaths count, which is the measurement in this case. And since we want to figure out um, in which year had the highest number of child death, we would indicate max and the variable, once again, deaths count. Now at the output, we can easily see that for each country, we'll take Afghanistan as an example, Afghanistan had its highest number of infant deaths in 2010, for United Arab Emirates, 2011, for Armenia, 2010, and so on and so forth for the other countries. Now you can see that with the long formatted data, answering this question is very easy and intuitive. Practically, to answer the same question with a wide data format, you can try an approach using a special dplyr function called rowwise. So with rowwise and mutate, you would have to specify the years. In this case, it would be 2010 to 2015, which is when data was collected. Now, when we run this data set, we see that the maximum number of infant deaths is shown in the last column, like here. But unfortunately, we do not know what year this number corresponds to. Taking, for example, Afghanistan, if we go to the last column, we see that the maximum number of infant deaths was 74,600. But to know the year to which this number corresponds to, we have to reference it back to the columns. So going through the columns, we see that this number occurred in 2010, which answers our question. But this is quite a hassle, as you can see, especially for large data sets. Now, there are solutions to this, but all are quite involved and somewhat painful, especially if you're just starting out. So we recommend that you simply pivot from a wide formatted data into a long formatted data using the functions that we covered previously here, which are group by and filter. Apart from filtering group data, summarizing can also be difficult on wide data formats. Consider again the infant deaths long data set. And now we want to ask for each country, what was the mean number of infant deaths in the standard deviation in deaths? Again, with long data, this is quite simple. So using the functions group by and summarize, we can figure out the mean and standard deviations that we're looking for. count and since this is for standard deviation similar deaths count now we see in the resulting output it's easy to infer the mean and standard deviation for each country for example for Algeria the mean is this value the standard deviation is this value for Angola, similar, mean and standard deviation, and so on and so forth for all of the countries within the data set. Easy.
But with wide formatted data, again, the solution is less straightforward. If we use the rowwise function with mutate along with this argument, in the following output, we have this. Similar to the previous example, we see that the mean can be found in the last column. However, you may notice that the standard deviation is nowhere to be found. And this can be quite difficult to calculate. And you may find solutions to code this. However, to be completely honest, even we haven't found a solution. So once again, we really recommend simply pivoting a wide formatted data to a long format data using the functions that we went over, group by and summarize for summarizing group data and so that you have a more intuitive, more simple output to answer the questions that you may have for your data set. Finally, one of the data analysis tasks most hindered by wide formatted data is plotting. And you may not yet be familiar with ggplot, so we'll continue and look at the figures without mentioning the code so much. But what you do need to remember is that plots in ggplot, or many plots within ggplot, are only possible with long formatted data. Consider again the infant deaths long data set, which we've been working with for a while now. If we want to plot the number of deaths for Belgium per year, we'll use the following code. Again, we won't get too into it, but we'll just look at the figure to explain. Here, the plotting works because we can assign the variable year to the x-axis. In a long formatted data, year is already a variable on its own. However, in a wide formatted data set, there is no such variable to pass on to the x-axis, which is why this plot would not be possible. Now, consider another plot that would not be possible using a wide formatted data. Once we run this code, we obtain the following plot. The reason why this figure is not possible with a wide formatted data set is the same reasoning we covered in the previous example we just saw. We need to tell the plot which variables to use for the x and y axes. Additionally, these variables must also have their own column. And this is only possible, if you can recall, in long data formats. In a wide data format, the measurements are spread across multiple columns, which is why for plots such as these is not possible. During this session, we've mainly covered simple examples of pivoting. However, in the real world, it may not be so straightforward. And this is because real world data can often have missing information or even errors to prevent you from accurately pivoting your data set. In those instances, we recommend looking at the official documentation, which was prepared by the TidyR team, linked here, as it's quite rich in examples. So we encourage you to default to this resource if you're having questions and are getting quite frustrated. Alternatively, you could also post your questions about pivoting on forums like Stack Overflow. By now, if you've been paying attention, you should know the difference between long and wide data formats. You should also know how to pivot between long to wide data formats using the function pivot wider. Alternatively, you know how to pivot from wide to long using the function pivot longer. And finally, you understand why long formatted data is much preferred for plotting and data wrangling in R. Well, that's it for me today. Thank you so much for paying attention. I'll see you in the next lesson. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Welcome to the Graph Courses Data Visualization course. Data visualization is one of the most important tools you will have in your data analyst toolbox because it's important for both exploring patterns in your data as well as presenting your findings to others. In this course, we'll be focusing on learning how to use the ggplot2 package in R to create high quality visualizations. So let's dive in.
By the end of the lesson, you should be able to do this list of things. I'm not going to step through them right now because they might not make that much sense until we've done the lesson. But you can pause here to read them if you'd like, but I will return to them at the end of the lesson to check off each item and make sure that we've learned these skills. The packages we need for this lesson are Tidyverse and here. Tidyverse loads in ggplot, so we don't need to load it in separately. And the here package helps us more easily reference and load in data and files. So if you run this code, these packages will be loaded into R. This RMD is available and the data is available too from the graph courses. So if you'd like to follow along, please download and code along with me in this video. So what are we going to visualize in this lesson? We're going to be looking at measles patterns in Niger. Measles is a highly contagious respiratory virus that spread in close contact. It mostly affects children and can be deadly if not treated. First of all, let's look at the geography and ecology of Niger to get a better understanding of how measles might be spread out. Niger is the largest country in West Africa by area. It contains seven regions and one capital district, the city of Niamey, which is the largest city. This is followed by Zinder in the southeast and Maradi in the central south. In fact, 95% of Niger's population is concentrated in the south. The most sparsely populated and largest is the Agadez region in the north. This has important implications for measles transmission. So now let's look at the data set that we'll be using for visualizations in this lesson. It is a data set of weekly reported cases from the different regions in Niger. It was collected by the Ministry of Health of Niger from January 1st, 1995 to December 31st, 2005, spanning 11 years. To get started, we'll load in this data frame into our R environment. If you run this code, you should see a data frame called Niger M appear in your environment. Let's now take a moment to look through the data. Now we print the Niger M data frame, you can see that there are four variables or columns and 4,576 rows. The four variables are as follows. The year variable shows us the calendar year in which the data was recorded, which ranges from 1995 to 2005. The week variable ranges from 1 to 52 for the 52 weeks of the year. The third variable, region, shows us the region in which the cases were reported. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, our fourth variable is cases, which tells us the number of measles cases reported that week from a certain district in a certain year. Several studies have analyzed this data set to look for annual patterns in measles cases. While these studies had done much more complex analyses than the simple data explorations we're going to do today, let's see if we can get hints about some of these patterns that agree with the findings of these papers. One way to get an idea of patterns in the data is to get summary statistics using the summary function. For this, we just type in summary Niger M. When you run this code, this gives us the maximum, minimum, and quartiles for our numerical variables, and for our categorical variable region, it gives us the total number of rows for each region. However, this summary omits a large amount of information contained in the data set. It just gives us a little snapshot. In fact, summary statistics can be highly misleading. And the best way to get a sense of patterns in our data is to visualize it. We can do this in R using the beautiful package ggplot2. So let's learn a little bit more about how ggplot2 works. The gg in ggplot2 is short for the grammar of graphics. But what is this grammar and how does it translate to R? The grammar of graphics is a theoretical framework that was first described by Leland Wilkinson in his book, The Grammar of Graphics. The creators of ggplot2 based their code on this framework. Now think about how we construct and form sentences in written and spoken languages by using different components, such as nouns, verbs, and adjectives. We can't just use them in any arbitrary order, there are rules for how to structure them. For example, I can say, I am joy, 
but I can't say joy I am. That is linguistically incorrect. Similarly to linguistic grammar, the grammar of graphics defines a set of rules for building graphics and it divides them into separate components called layers. These are the seven grammar of graphics layers and let's look at them a little more deeply. The grammar of graphics or GG layers have specific names that you'll see throughout the course. Data, aesthetics, geometries, facets, statistics, coordinates, and themes. We take these different layers and combine them in order to build a plot. And we go in order from the bottom up. The three layers that are absolutely required to make a plot are these three components, data, aesthetics, and geometries. Data is simply the data set that we want to plot from. Aesthetics are things we can see that visually represent the information in the data that we provided. The aesthetics that we will most commonly use in our plots are the x and y variables. Geometries are the shapes used to make the plot. For example, points, lines, or boxes. Points make a scatter plot, lines make a line graph, and boxes make a box plot. Don't worry if all of these terms don't make sense quite yet. It is a challenge to keep up with the ggplot syntax, but once you get practice writing this code in R, you'll become fluent in no time. Speaking of writing code, let's get to it. We're going to work through the three essential layers one at a time. Our first plot is going to be a scatter plot using data from the Niger Metasoles dataset. For easier plotting in this lesson, we won't use the whole Niger M data frame, but we'll subset it to a smaller data frame containing only the data from 1996. So let's create the Niger M96 data frame. If you run this code, it will filter the data to only 1996 and remove the year column. The functions filter and select are from the dplyr package, which is another core package of the tidyverse used for data manipulation. These topics are covered in our data wrangling course, which you can check out on our website, thegraphcourses.org. Let's take a quick look at Niger M96. If you print this, you'll see that the year column is no longer present since we're only having one year, 96, and we've gone from over 4,500 rows to just 416. Now that our data set is ready, we can plot our ggplot in increments. We're gonna add elements one at a time so that you know what each layer is doing. We can do this in three steps. Before getting to the first step, we're just going to initialize the plot. We do this by calling the ggplot function by simply typing in ggplot and adding the brackets after. Note that there is no two after the ggplot function. ggplot2 is the name of the package, not the function. Now, if you run this code, you will see that it simply results in a blank canvas. But not to worry, we haven't added any of our three essential elements yet. So let's get to the first of our three steps, which is to add the data. We supply the data frame to ggplot using the data argument. The way you do this is by typing in data equals the data frame name that we want to use into the ggplot function. So data equals, and the name of our data frame is Niger M96. Let's run this code. And you'll see that again, we get a blank. That's because we haven't given it the aesthetics or the geometries, the shapes to plot. Now we define our variables in step two, which is to add the aesthetics layer. We can look at disease incidence over time by plotting cases against weak, as we mentioned before. In ggplot speak, we are mapping cases to the y-axis and mapping the weak variable to the x-axis. So let's add the aesthetics layer and tell ggplot which variables to plot on which axis. So this is the code we used last time and I'll just add on to that. So comma and start a new line to add the next argument. On this next line, we type in mapping equals AES, open the AES function, x equals weak and y equals cases. So now we have two out of our three required layers. If you run this, it may look like a blank plot, but it's not. 
you'll see that the axes are titled with week and cases, and they are also scaled. So you can see that cases ranges from zero to almost 2000, and week ranges from one to about 52 for the 52 weeks of the year. Now we add the geometry layer to specify what kind of plot we want to create. Enter a new line and type in geom point. You don't need to add any arguments inside geom point right now. And now we have all the three essential layers. So if we run this code, we should get a plot. And we do. Points have been added with the geom layer and now we have a complete scatter plot. So you'll see that there are eight points for each of the 52 weeks representing eight different regions. Right now we can't tell which point is from which region, but we will add colors later on so that we can distinguish between them. So now it's time for you to practice plotting in R. For practice questions in this lesson, you won't be using Niger M96 anymore, but we'll create a new subset called Niger M94, which only contains data from 2004. For this practice question, we want you to use Niger M04 and create the same scatter plot that we just created with Niger M96. We want to plot cases on the y-axis and week on the x-axis. Plotting with a different data frame will also allow you to look at those patterns and see if the same seasonal transmission holds true for 2004 as it did for 1996. So since this is the first lesson in this course, and if you haven't taken the TGC courses yet, I'll explain how our grading system works. If you've already taken these courses and you know how to use the auto graders, you can skip to the next section. So for practice questions, in the first code chunk, you will write the code that needed to answer the question. Here I will just write ggplot and run it and see what plot I get. Even though this isn't the correct answer, let's just say it is. And I will try seeing what happens when I try to check the answer. First, to submit the answer, what you're going to do is delete this part that says your answer here. Copy the code that you use to create your plot. Paste it in place of your answer here and run this code. You should make sure that this object, Niger M04 scatter, appears in your environment tab after you submit it. Then what you can do is check your answer by running the check function. Each practice question will have a different check function. You don't need to put any inputs in there. Just run the code and it will tell you, now it says wrong, please try again because I purposefully entered the wrong answer. If you're stuck on how to answer the question, each practice question also has a hint function, which also requires no input. You can run the hint function and it will give you some text to help you answer the question. Finally, if you're still stuck on the question, you can write in the solution function, which is just dot solution underscore followed by the object name for that practice question. And I'm not going to run that because it'll give us the solution to that practice question. But if you need to, you can run that and it'll show you the right answer. Now you can pause here and in the RMD, do the practice question, submit it and check it. Good luck with the practice question and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. I hope the practice question went well. The answer should look something like this. We'll see actually that even from 2004, you see the same pattern that between weeks 10 and 20 is when the highest peaks are. This is following the rainy season in Niger. What we've done so far is to just use the most basic arguments for our data aesthetics and geometries layer. But we can also modify things in each layer, even in just these three layers. Generally speaking, the Grammar of Graphics framework allows you to customize quite easily. We can tinker with our existing code to change the data aesthetics and geometries layer. In fact, you've already done this in the practice question by changing the data layer 
where instead of using NigerM96, use NigerM04 to create the same kind of plot. We can also modify the aesthetics and geometries layer, and that's what we'll be doing in the next couple of changes. So first of all, we're going to change the aesthetic mappings. So let's look at our original code first. This is our original scatter plot. Now I will copy this code and I want to modify it. So paste the same code into a new code chunk. Let's try changing the aesthetic mapping here. Let's replace week in the x-axis aesthetic to region. Week is a continuous variable and region is a categorical variable. So instead of a scatter plot, we will get what is called a strip plot. You'll see that instead of the continuous scale for a week that we have before, we have eight distinct categories, one for each region. Next, we're going to change the geom function. Modifying the geometry layer will give us a different kind of plot since we're using different kinds of shapes. Here are some common geom functions in ggplot and they correspond to different kinds of plots. What we've used so far is geom point to create a scatter plot. So now we'll make an incremental change again. We'll use the original code for our, our scatter plot here and we're going to change geom point to geom call which will give us a bar plot. Call here is short for column which is another name for bar charts. So run this code and you'll see we didn't change the aesthetic mappings, we just changed the geometry layer and now we have weak against cases but a bar plot. It's important to note that we can't just change any geom function for another. In this case we changed geom point to geom call which worked because they both accept two continuous variables. Something like geom histogram would give us an error. Run this code as an example and you will see that here it says stat bin can only have an x and y aesthetic. This is because histograms show the distribution of just one numerical variable. Now that we gave AES two numerical variables, ggplot doesn't know how to map that and so it gives you an error. Now it's time for you to practice changing geom functions. You're going to be using the Niger M04 data frame again to create a bar plot of weekly cases using the geom call function. You're going to map cases on the y-axis and a week on the x-axis. Again, you will submit your answer and check it in the same way as before. Now we're going to look at aesthetic mappings that we can put inside AES in addition to X and Y position. We can also change other aesthetics of the plot, such as the shape of the points, the size of the points could be equal to a certain variable. We can also change color, line width, and line type. These apply to line graphs only. So let's return to our original scatter plot code where we added the aesthetics X and Y, and we can add now other aesthetics like color and fill. If you want to look at which other aesthetic mappings you can add to a geometric function, such as geom point, you can put in question mark geom point into your console and it will open up the help tab and then you can scroll down to aesthetics and see the different aesthetic mappings which that geometric function can accept. So now we'll add color to the points of our scatter plot. We're going to color it by region. So we are mapping the region variable onto the color aesthetic just like we mapped week and cases to x and y. So this means we're going to add a new aesthetic inside mapping equals AES. So here you will see that inside AES where we had x and y, I added color. Now if I run this code, it will produce this colored scatter plot. Here you can see that the points are colored differently according to which region that they're in. This gives us information about an additional third variable in addition to week and cases. So this time in that scatter plot, each point was colored by which region that data point was from. 
You can also see that ggplot created a color legend automatically. Now with the additional information on that plot, we can make a few observations. For example, we see classic bell-shaped curves for each region. The regions Zinder, Maradi, and Niamey were affected the most. Notice that these three regions are the most population dense. They were the biggest cities located in the southern side. Now these new insights help us understand a little more about those epidemic patterns. But the scatter plot is still a bit crowded and it's not the easiest way to understand the epidemic patterns. We might be able to try different plot types that can make this clearer. So now let's make a modification to the geometries layer of this code and change geom point to geom call to give us a bar plot and see if the patterns are clearer this way. Now this gives us a stacked bar plot. It shows us the relative contribution of each region to the number of cases in a particular week. We have 52 bars for the 52 weeks of the year and the size of each segment represents a particular region which is again coded by color because we added the color equals region aesthetic in mapping. An important thing to note is that the color aesthetic only applies to the border around a shape. It doesn't color the inside of the bars as you may have noticed. This didn't apply to our scatter plot before because the points are solid, they don't have a border and an inside, but these bars do. Let's now change the inside of the bars instead. For this we'll use a new aesthetic called fill. So here we just make a small change to the code and change color to fill and we still want fill equal to region. When you run this code, you will get another stacked bar plot except this time the inside of the bars is colored. Here again, you can see that the largest segments belong to the same regions that we saw had a high number of cases in the scatter plot. The pink, blue, and green bars from Zinder, Niamey, and Maradi are still shown to contribute the most cases. Now you can practice applying the color aesthetic to a new type of plot, line graphs. You can see that we want to create a line graph using the geom line geometric function. We haven't used this before, but you can apply the same principles of modifying the geometry layer, changing the geom function to geom line, and this will produce a line graph. These are actually considered the best way to represent time series data for an epidemic. It will be more clear than the scatter plot. So you can pause now and work on this in your RMD. again. So now you should have completed that practice question showing a line graph of measles cases in Niger from 2004. Just to double check, your line graph should look something like this one. Here you'll see a line graph with eight separate lines, each one colored a different color according to the region of Niger that it's from. Note that the highest epidemics belong to regions that were not the same as they were in 96. So we see that even though there are still these seasonal patterns from year to year, there's differences in which region might have the biggest epidemics. So far, we've been matching color or fill in the case of bar charts to the region variable so that the data from each region is mapped with a different color. Those are known as aesthetic mappings, but we can also look at fixed aesthetics, which are a different kind of aesthetic modification to make to a plot. It is very important to understand the difference between aesthetic mappings and fixed aesthetics and how and when to use them. Some of the most common aesthetics we'll use in ggplot2 are color, fill, size, and alpha. Now these all could be either aesthetic mappings, as we've mapped color and fill so far, or they could be fixed aesthetics. For example, we already did color as an aesthetic mapping and called color equal to region, and then the data variable region was mapped to color. So aesthetic mappings use data. But aesthetics that are fixed are equated to a constant value, like color equals blue. Then the geometric objects or their shapes, whether they be points, lines, aren't going to change depending on the data, they'll just all be blue. 
This all depends on whether you put it inside the mapping equals AES argument in ggplot2. So far, as you've practiced and seen the examples, they have all gone inside mapping equals AES. The best way to understand the difference between fixed aesthetics and aesthetic mappings is with some examples. So let's get started and use color as a fixed aesthetic in our original scatter plot to make all the points blue. So here's the code that we used to create our original scatter plot, which looks like this. Here there are no color mappings. And remember the fixed aesthetic goes inside geom point. So over here I'm going to enter color equals blue. Now if I run this code, you'll notice that the color of the points have changed. They are all now uniformly this blue color. So not only is every point the same color, this uniform color has nothing to do with the data. We can make it any color we like and it doesn't represent additional information about variables. As I said, the color should go inside quotation marks and there are a variety of colors you can use. If you want to know what they are, you can run just the colors function in your console to see what the choices are. Let's take a look at them for a second. Now, when I run this, it prints out a whole list of different colors that are valid in R. So you can pick any random one that you want and put them in your points. Let's try out one. Um, let's see. Aquamarine sounds good. Let's do Aquamarine 3. So I would just go here, back to the code, and change blue. And then when I run it, we have this nice aquamarine color applied to all of the points. You can feel free to experiment with any of those R colors and you'll get to practice them in the next practice question. Now we've used color as both an aesthetic mapping, where we mapped it to the region variable, and we used it as a fixed aesthetic. Let's explore a new aesthetic called size. The size aesthetic does exactly what you might think it does. It controls the size of the geometric object. We can change the size of points, but let's visit the line graph to see how line width can be controlled by using size. So first, I'm going to run it without any fixed aesthetics to just see what the size looks like by default. So this is quite similar to the last practice question you did, but using data from 96 instead of 2004. And the lines are pretty thin. The default here being used is 0.5 millimeters. So let's double the size of that and set it to one millimeters. Size as a fixed aesthetic will go inside geom line. So I will type in size equals one. So now that we've run this code, you can see that the lines are a little bit thicker than they were before, which makes it easier to see the differences in color and just gives us a bolder plot. So now it's your turn to use the fill aesthetic as a fixed aesthetic. You used it before as an aesthetic mapping for a bar plot, but now you're going to fix it to a constant value. So you'll use the same data and x and y variables as before using the Niger M04 data frame and mapping cases against weak. And the R color that you want to use as your fixed aesthetic for filling the color of the bars is hot pink. So Feel free to pause the video here and please work on the practice question before you return and you can use the check and hint functions as usual. I hope you had fun making your hot pink bar graph which should look something like this. We see that the region variable is no longer mapped, we don't have a color key showing us which color responds to which region, it's a fixed aesthetic and all the bars are uniformly colored hot pink. So in this lesson, we've kept it simple and only covered the three basic layers, data, aesthetics, and geometries. What about the other layers? We will see them more frequently as you go along in this course. Let's take a quick sneak preview of what that might look like using the Niger M data. Very soon, you'll be able to write ggplot code that looks like this. So here, we have data equals Niger M, and you'll notice some mappings that you recognize, like X, Y, and color, fixed aesthetics, size, which we've done, but alpha we haven't covered yet, but it just makes the lines a little more transparent, and geom line, so we're going to make line graphs for all of those years. 
The facet layer, you might remember as a GG layer, it creates subplots. We'll make subplots for each year. The scale layer here controls the color palette. Themes controls all the non-data ink of the plot, so it just makes it a little more attractive. And then last but not least, here are the labels. So we're adding a title, subtitle, changing the axis labels, adding a caption, and changing the name of the legend. This might seem complicated, but it'll just take you a couple of lessons to get here. Let's see what the plot looks like. And here is the resulting plot. We have 11 different subplots, one for each year. Eight different lines, one for each region. The default colors are no longer being used, the rainbow color palette. We chose a different color palette, so you'll notice that, and the color key is there. The axis labels have been made more descriptive and we have a title subtitle caption linking to the data source now you might say this looks pretty complicated i've just done a few basic plots but because ggplot offers such a consistent scheme and a framework it's actually not that hard to get to this level so don't be intimidated take a couple more of these classes and you'll soon be able to make presentation worthy plots like this one. So let's revisit the learning outcomes and see if we've met them all. First of all, you can understand the ggplot framework and how it relates to the grammar of graphics. You can name and explain what the three essential layers are. You can write code to build a complete plot using those three layers. You're able to create scatter plots, line graphs, and bar graphs. And you can add and modify different aesthetics like color, fill, and size. In the next lesson, we'll be looking more into detail on scatter plots. That's all for this lesson and hope to see you in the next one. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And if you're taking this course for credit, don't forget to go to the Graph Courses website and complete the quiz related to these lessons. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes, and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello, and welcome to the scatter plots lesson of our data visualization course. Scatter plots, which are sometimes known as bivariate plots, allow us to visualize the relationship between two numerical variables. We can also make the trends and relationships in our scatter plot more clear by overlaying a trend line or a smoothing line on top of the points. We'll be doing all of this and more with the ggplot2 package in R. So let's get started. Here are our learning objectives for today. You can pause here to read them if you'd like, but I'll go through them in more detail at the end of the lesson to make sure we've achieved these outcomes. First, let's load in the packages that we're going to need in this lesson. The first package we're going to load in is the tidyverse. Tidyverse is a meta package, which means when we load this in, it will also load in a set of core packages, including ggplot2, which is the main package for data visualization that we'll be using in this lesson and in this course. The second and final package we're going to load is called here. The here package simply helps us more easily and accurately reference files that we want to load in. Run this chunk to load these packages into your R session, and now we're ready to go. Let's look at the data set that we will be using to plot in this lesson. The data we will be using for plotting today comes from a prospective observational study of acute diarrhea in children aged 0 to 59 months. These data were collected from Mali and Bangladesh and analyzed in this study. However, for today we'll just be looking at the results from Mali. Now let's load in our data set and look at the variables. 
we can see that the data has 150 rows and each row corresponds to one patient that was surveyed. We're going to begin by visualizing the relationship between age in months on the x-axis and viral load on the y-axis. In ggplot terms, we're going to map the age variable to the x-aesthetic and map the viral load variable to the y-aesthetic. Keep in mind the template that we used in previous lessons in order to see the minimum arguments and functions required to build a ggplot. First, I will just initialize plot with ggplot, then add the data argument. When you add mapping equals AES, don't forget to close the brackets at the end. Here we'll put in our x and y variables. we add a plus sign and start a new line to add the third and last geometric layer. Which is geom point for a scatter plot. Run these few lines of code and you'll produce the scatter plot that is shown over here. This tells us that perhaps viral load decreases with age. Later on, when we look at it more closely and add a trend line, we'll get further insights into this plot, but this is the base plot that we'll be adapting throughout the lesson. And now it's your turn to do a practice question. If you haven't done a TGC course yet, or use the practice question functions, I'll quickly run through that with you. First, in this section, you'll write code to create the plot that this question is asking for. Here, we'd like you to use the MollyDD data frame to create a scatter plot of age versus height. Age on the x-axis and height on the y-axis. Please pause the video now and work on the practice question in your RMV. Good luck and see you in a bit. Now let's modify the aesthetics of our points. As a reminder, aesthetics in ggplot refer to the visual properties of the geometric objects in your plot. There are two kinds of aesthetics that we change in ggplot. First of all, we can map information about our data onto aesthetics of a plot. You can color points according to values of a specific variable. The other way is by setting fixed aesthetics of our plot. This goes as a direct argument in our geometric function and doesn't represent any data. First, we're going to map variables to aesthetics in our plot. Before we had the X and Y aesthetics inside AES, now we will add color. This will allow us to visualize a third variable on our two-dimensional scatter plot. This is the code we use to create the original scatter plot. So now let's map the patient's height measured by the variable height cm onto the color of our points. So when we want to map an aesthetic, we add it inside the AES function. Usually what we've done is to add a comma after x and y and add the color aesthetic within the AES function connected to ggplot instead. code works for what we're trying to do. It gives us a plot where the colors are scaled according to the height cm variable. However, this time we're not going to keep our color aesthetic in the ggplot function along with x and y. That's because the aesthetic mappings that we specify in the ggplot function, the main function, 
are inherited by the subsequent geom functions. But if we want to add, say, another geometric layer, as we will later on for a trend line, we don't want this color mapping to be inherited by the trend line as well. We just want the color mapping to apply to the points. So instead of adding color here in the ggplot function, we're going to move it down to geom point. But we can't just put it directly into geom point, we need to add it as an aesthetic mapping. So what we're going to do is add mapping equals AES again in the geom point function. So now I've removed the color equals height cm from ggplot, and I'm going to add mapping to geom point. Now you can see that mapping appears within geom point and color equals height cm. We get the same plot, but it matters that the color mapping belongs to the geom point layer and not the main aesthetic mappings in ggplot. When we assign a continuous variable to the color aesthetic, what we get is a color gradient scaled by the values of that continuous variable. ggplot has already scaled the colors to match the values of height cm. The points here are different shades of the same blue hue, with darker colors representing smaller numbers. So what we're seeing here is with lower age, you have lower height, and as age increases and viral load decreases, the points get lighter, which means children who are older are taller and height increases with age, as we might expect. Now, instead of mapping a continuous variable like height, we can also map a categorical or binary variable like the breastfeeding variable in the MollyDD data frame. This variable has two values, 0 and 1. 1 represents that yes, the child is being breastfed, and 0 is no, the child is not being breastfed. So this time, instead of height, we have breastfeeding in the geom point mapping aesthetic for color. Run this code and see what we get. Here we get the same gradual color scaling across the color gradient that we saw with the height cm variable, which is a continuous variable. This communicates that there is a continuum of values in the breastfeeding variable, but this is not true. The breastfeeding variable has two distinct, discrete possibilities, 0 or 1. But why does ggplot scale it as a continuum? This is because of the data class of the breastfeeding variable in the MollyDD data frame. We can ask the class function what R thinks the breastfeeding variable is. It tells us that the data class of this variable is numeric, which is true, it is made up of ones and zeros. However, even though it's a numeric variable, it has two discrete values, so continuous color scaling that we saw before is not ideal for this plot. In cases like this, we use the factor function to tell ggplot to treat a variable as a factor. So we start off with the same code as we wrote before, adding a mapping argument inside geom point and assigning color to breastfeeding, but this time we'll wrap the variable with the factor function. Now when you run this code, we will get a different result. When the variable is treated as a factor, each value 
of the variable 0 and 1 is given a unique color that are clearly distinguishable from each other. We can see that the orange points belong to 0, which means the children are not breastfed, and the blue points belong to 1, which means they are. Now it's time for another practice question. This time we want you to use the MOLLY-DD data frame again to show the relationship between age and viral load as we've been doing. This time, map a third variable, frequency of respiration, which is a continuous variable, to color, the same way we did with height. And the second part of this question is to plot the age versus height scatter plot that we did earlier and map the variable fever to the color of the points. Remember that this mapping doesn't go inside the main ggplot function, it goes inside geom point, and fever, like breastfeeding, is a binary variable made of zeros and ones, so make sure that ggplot treats it like a factor. Good luck with this practice question, work on it on the RMD, pause this video, and come back when you're done. Welcome back, and I hope you had no trouble mapping these aesthetic variables to color of our points. Now we're moving on from mapping aesthetics to setting fixed aesthetics. Aesthetic arguments that are set to a fixed value remain static and don't vary depending on the data. This means they go outside the AES function and directly to the geom function corresponding to the layer that we want to apply the aesthetic argument to. In this section, we'll be adding the following fixed aesthetics to geom point. Color, which changes the point color or the point outline if you have a fillable point, which we'll see later. We've used this fixed aesthetic already. Something new is size, where we get to change the point's size in order to make it more readable. Alpha, which is not as intuitive as color or size, controls the opacity of points. The alpha aesthetic controls the opacity of our points. We can make them a little more transparent if we'd like to see where points overlap. We can also change the point shape. The default are these solid black circles, but we can also use triangles, squares, and a number of other shapes that ggplot offers. And finally, we will also edit the fill of our points. For points that have an outline and an interior, color changes the border of the points, and fill changes the interior color of the points. First, we'll be addressing color, size, and alpha. So let's change the color of our points to a fixed value by adding the color aesthetic directly within geom point. Here's the code of our original scatter plot with no color mappings, and now we'll add color equals whatever color we want directly in geom point without using mapping equals AES. In this case, we want our points to be steel blue, and there is an R color called steel blue. You need to put it in quotes so that R recognizes it as a color. After running this code, you'll see the same scatter plot we had before, but instead of having solid black points, we have blue points that are uniformly the same color and not data dependent. Now in addition to color, let's do size. In the same way that we did with color, we'll add size directly here in geom point. Size is measured in millimeters in ggplot and the default is one. Let's say we want slightly bigger points, so we'll increase size to two millimeters. After running this code, you'll see that again, we get a very similar scatter plot with larger points. 
However, in some places, the points are crowded and the larger size makes them overlap a little more. So in that case, we might want to change the transparency or the opacity of these points. We do this by adding the alpha aesthetic. Alpha ranges from zero, which is completely transparent, to one, which is completely opaque. And one is the default that ggplot has been using this whole time. So to make our points a little more see-through, we're going to reduce the opacity. By setting alpha equals to 0 0.75, we're saying that we want our points to be 75% opaque, which means 25% transparency. Now, running this code will give us this pretty plot. Making the points a little transparent makes it easier to see where the points overlap and how many points are overlapping in that area. Now it's time for a practice question for you. This time we'd like you to create the same scatter plot as the previous example of age versus viral load, but this time add a few fixed aesthetics to the plot. Change the color to cornflower blue, the size to 3 millimeters, and set the opacity at 60%. Good luck with this practice question, and I'll see you when you're done. Feel free to pause the video and work in the RMD. In this next section, we'll be using shape and fill as fixed aesthetics for scatter plots. Another way to change the appearance of our points is to change their shape. We do this by adding the shape aesthetic and setting it equal to a number corresponding to our desired shape. ggplot will accept the numbers 1 through 24 as values for the shape argument, and they correspond to these shapes. So use this figure as a reference when you want to decide what shape to change your points to. Note that some of the points here are filled in with red. This indicates that the geometric objects, or shapes 21 through 24, can accept both the color and the fill aesthetics because they have an interior and an exterior border. First, let's change the shape of the points in our original scatter plot here to a shape that can be filled in. So again, we set shape directly within geom point, and here we're going to choose shape number 21. Which corresponds to this fillable circle. The points here are quite small, but you can see that they are empty circles, so they're hollow with just an outline and no color filled in. Changing the color aesthetic will change that outline color of the points. So here, we're going to add color and set it to cyan 4. Now just the outline color of the points has changed to a cyan color, and we can fill them in if we wish with the fill argument. After running that code, the resulting plot looks like this. You can tell that the outline and the fill colors are slightly different. We can further improve the readability of the plot that we saw before by increasing size and reducing opacity like we did before. So here I'm going to add the size and alpha aesthetics. This is our final enhanced scatter plot showing the same data as just a two dimensional age versus viral load, but it looks a little more presentable and a little more attractive. 
We noted before that viral load seems to decrease as age increases, but sometimes it can be hard to view relationships or trends with just points alone. In this case, we often wish to add a trend line to a scatter plot to make that relationship stand out more clearly. So we can take our original scatter plot and apply a smoothing line, also known as a trend line or best fit line. We can do this by adding another geometric function on another layer called GeomSmooth. To add another layer, we write the plus sign and start on a new line. And then we simply add the geomsmooth function. When you run this code, you'll see that we get our original scatter plot of plane points with a trend line plotted over it. The smoothing layer is literally put on top of the points Note here that some of the points are hidden by the blue line. This is because of the order that we put geometric layers in ggplot. The ones that come later get layered on top of the ones that come before. If you swap those, then the points would appear above the line. But we want our line to be on top, so we're going to keep it this way. This little message at the top of the plot tells us that the default smoothing function that's being used to plot this line is lowest. LOAS stands for Locally Weighted Scatter Plot Smoothing. It is a function used by many statistical softwares in order to plot a trend line for a scatter plot. Now, let's change the smoothing function being used. We can do that by adding the method argument inside GeomSmooth. We can set this to one of a number of options provided by GeomSmooth, including a generalized linear model. We add this as a character string, setting method equals GLM. This gives us a straight trend line going through the points. You may have noticed in the last two plots, the trend line has these gray bands around it. By default, ggplot2 shows us the 95% confidence limits around the trend line. You can take away those confident bands by adding SE equals false into GeomSmooth. So let's do this. Now we have the same plot again, but the confidence bands are no longer there. In addition to method, we can also change the other normal aesthetics that we've used for other geometric layers, such as color. The default color that we saw in the past plots was blue. Here we'll change it to dark red. Note that this is what I meant before by saying that we don't want to put the aesthetic mapping for color inside ggplot because that would have been inherited by both of these geometric functions. We just wanted to map a variable to geom point earlier, so we added the mapping equals AES separately within geom point. And here we've chosen a method, taken away the confidence interval bands, and changed the color. This linear regression agrees with what we initially noted at the beginning of this lesson, that there is a negative relationship between age and viral load. As age increases, viral load is decreasing. Now we can add a third variable from this plot. We're going to add another binary variable called vomit from the MollyDB data frame. This binary variable shows us whether the patient had vomited or not, a zero represents no, they didn't, and a one says yes, they did. So we're going to map this variable to the color aesthetic of our points. So this time we're mapping a variable, so it does go inside mapping equals AES. And as I said before, we don't want it to affect geom smooth, just geom point. So we add mapping equals AES only within the geom point layer.
And within mapping equals AES, we set the color aesthetic equal to vomit. But remember, this binary variable, similar to the variables that we used before, is going to be treated as numeric by ggplot, and it would have a continuous color scaling. We don't want this to happen, so we put the factor function around that variable. For running this code, the points are now colored with orange corresponding to zero, no vomiting, and blue corresponding to one. Yes, the child was vomiting. Let's go one step further and also change the arguments in the geomsmooth function. Let's try a new method. We're going to change the method from GLM to GAM, which stands for General Additive Model. We are going to keep the confidence bands this time. Change the color to dark gray. And we can increase the width of the line by adding the size argument. And now the resulting plot looks like this. We've modified the aesthetics of our points by mapping a variable onto it and changing the color and size of the trend line. So what does this plot tell us? Observe where the blue points are distributed compared to the orange points. The orange points are children who did not vomit and the blue points are children who did. You'll see that most of the blue points fall above the trend line and most of the orange points fall below. This tells us that with higher viral load, children were more likely to have vomited. This also makes intuitive sense that the more infected you are, the more severe your symptoms are going to be. Now it's time for you to practice setting fixed aesthetics and adding trend lines. There are two practice questions in this section. First, we'd like you to create a scatter plot of age versus height as you've done before and change a bunch of fixed aesthetics in this scatter plot. You'll be asked to change the color, size, and opacity of the points, as well as changing the method and the color of the trend line. Secondly, secondly you're going to recreate the plot that you just made in the previous practice question, but instead of setting color to a fixed aesthetic argument, you're going to be mapping a continuous variable onto the points of your scatter plot. We also want you to change the shape of your scatter plot to tilted rectangles, which is shape number 23. Good luck with these two practice questions. Please pause the video here, work on them in your RMD, and come back after you're done. Welcome back. We're now going to wrap up this lesson and review the learning objectives that we had set at the beginning to make sure that we've achieved them. Let's review the learning objectives that we set at the beginning of this lesson to make sure that we've achieved all of them. First of all, you're able to create a scatter plot with ggplot2 to visualize the relationship between two numerical variables. You're also able to map a third variable to a two-dimensional scatter plot with the color argument, and you've learned how to use both continuous and discrete variables to map to color. We also learned how to set a bunch of fixed aesthetics such as color, fill, opacity, size, and shape. And finally, you're able to add and modify a trend line to your scatter plot using GeomSmooth to summarize the relationship between the variables that you're seeing in the scatter plot. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and feel comfortable creating scatter plots in R with ggplot2. With medium to large data sets or with data sets that have a lot of variables like the MarleyDD data frame that we use today, it is useful to play around with the different modifications to a scatter plot. 
Today we added trend lines, mapped additional variables onto the plot, and changed fixed aesthetics like transparency, size, shape, etc. to improve the readability of our plot. We'll be soon covering how to create line graphs, add labels, use themes, facet our plots, create bubble charts, and even animate our plots and make them interactive. Thanks for watching this video and see you next time. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today. Hello, and welcome to this lesson on lines, scales, and labels with ggplot2. So far, we've done scatter plots and learned how to change the color, fill, shape, and opacity of points. Now we're going to be making line graphs like this one with GeomLine. We'll be also changing things like the color, transparency, and size, but this time we will add more aesthetics specific to lines and we'll also learn how to manipulate the scales, the X and Y continuous scales, so that we can relabel them or rescale them. And finally, we will add labels to our plot, like a title, a subtitle, or a caption, to add more descriptive information to the plot. So let's get started. If you'd like a more detailed description of all the things we're going to learn today, you can pause here and read the learning objectives, but I will go through them at the end of the lesson to make sure that we've covered everything. To get started, we need to load in the packages that we will be using in this lesson. In this lesson, we're just going to use two packages, Tidyverse, which contains ggplot2 for data visualization, as well as packages like dplyr, which we'll use for data manipulation and data wrangling as well. Lastly, we're going to load in the Gapminder package. This package contains the data that we're going to be using to create line graphs in this lesson. In February 2006, a Swedish physician and global health professor named Hans Rosling gave a very famous TED Talk called The Best Stats You've Ever Seen. In this TED Talk, he presented global health and development data from around the world and showed how the gap between the West and the rest is decreasing as more children are educated everywhere, life expectancy increases, income increases, and health in general is getting better. In this lesson, we will be using data collected by the Gapminder Foundation. You can visit the Gapminder website and use their interactive visualization tools to create plots like this. This was the very famous plot that Hans Rosling presented, and we will be creating it in the next lesson. In this lesson, however, we're going to stick to line graphs. We don't have to download the Gapminder data from the website. We can access a clean subset of their data from the Gapminder R package, which we just loaded. So if you run this line of code, it will load in the Gapminder data frame to your environment. Now we can print and view the data frame. Each row is a country year combination, which means it gives us some metrics for that country for that year. The first column we have is country, which simply tells us the country name. The continent is the geographic region which the country belongs to. In a moment, I'll show you that these don't match up with what we traditionally think of as continents. The year is the calendar year in which the data were recorded. Then we have life expectancy, the population, and gross domestic product per capita. The five continents that are in Gapminder are as follows. Note that the countries in the Americas are all put into one region. Line graphs are especially useful for showing the relationship between two numerical variables, just like scatter plots. This is especially useful when one of those numerical variables has an inherent ordering to it, like some notion of time. For example, you could put minutes, hours, or days on the x-axis, and that would make it a time series plot. Let's start by making a time series plot. First, we'll create a new data frame with only data from the US. Now that we created this new data frame called GAPUS, containing only GAPminded data for the United States, we're ready to feed this data into ggplot2 and create this line graph of life expectancy over time. We will start off as usual by initiating the ggplot function. 
the first required layer is always the data. Data in this case equals gap US. After specifying the data frame we need, we need to tell ggplot what to plot on the x and y axes of this line graph. To map variables to aesthetics, we give them to the mapping argument under the AES function. Here, the only aesthetics we're going to provide is X and Y. The X variable is going to represent time, so that will be our year variable from the GAPUS data frame. Next, our Y variable will be life expectancy. Now finally, we want to add our geometries layer. To make a line graph, we need to add the geom function geom line. We do this by adding a plus sign and then starting on a new line. Now you can run this code and it will produce the following time series plot. You can see that from 1952 to 2007, life expectancy steadily increased in the US from around 68 to well over 78 by the end of 2007. I broke down this code as I was writing it, but if you would like a written description of it, you can feel free to pause here and this goes through the code piece by piece to explain what it does. Once you're confident that you understand how ggplot is used to make a line graph, it is time for you to practice. In this practice question, we would like you to create a time series plot using a line graph of GDP per capita over time. You will be using the same gap US data frame that we used in the last example, but instead of life expectancy, you will be plotting GDP. Welcome back. I hope that practice question went well and you should have gotten a simple line graph that looks like this. You can see that just like life expectancy, GDP per capita also steadily increases over time. We've made these two simple line graphs, but they are quite bland. We can add aesthetics to them to make them look more visually appealing. We can add fixed aesthetics to a line graph just like what we did with scatter plots. Aesthetics that we've already looked at, like color and size, apply to line graphs too. Let's add some fixed aesthetics to our original line graph code of life expectancy over time. Remember that fixed aesthetics go inside the geom function. So here I put it inside geom line and not in mapping equals AES. Next, I will increase the size of the line for it to be somewhat thicker. The default size is about 0.5 millimeters. I'll up it to 1.5. And here we have this line, which is much thicker than before, and the color is changed to this sort of purpley color. In this lesson, we'll add a new aesthetic to our repertoire called line type. This one is specific to lines only. The argument name for setting line type is just line type or LTY for short, whichever you prefer, and you set it equal to either an integer from one through six or to the character string, and it will give you the line design that is corresponding to it. So now let's add a line type to our previous line graph. So now in addition to color and size, I will add line type after that. The line graphs we've created so far are quite informative. They can tell us the general trend that is happening over time. However, we don't actually know how many data points are collected or in which intervals of time the data were collected. We can improve the readability of these graphs by adding a layer of points. So this time, our data, our X and Y mappings, will be represented by more than one geometric object, lines and points. As long as two geoms are compatible, then they can be layered on top of each other to represent these same data points, the same mappings. In this case, 
geom point and geom line can be combined because they both accept mappings of numerical variables to the x and y axes. So here we have our original line graph, which just looks like this. And now we can add geom line by adding a plus sign and going on a new line at the end of this code. Now here you can see exactly which data points the line is connecting together. We can make the plot slightly more attractive by customizing our geoms and adding different fixed aesthetics to them. So here I increase the size of the line and change the color of the line to light gray, increase the size of the points and change the color of the points to steel blue. So the fixed aesthetics go individually in geom line and geom point and then are only applied to either geom line or geom point depending on where you put them. Now it's your turn to practice again. This time you will be creating a line graph plus points of GDP per capita over time for the US using the GAP US data frame. You will be changing the line type, so add line type as a fixed aesthetic to any one that you like and change the color as well to any valid art color that you'd like. So write your code, submit it, and check it using the check function. Please pause here to work on this practice question in your RMD and then come back when you're ready. Welcome back. I hope that practice question went well and you were able to play around with the fixed aesthetics of geom line and geom point separately. This is the plot that I came up with. In addition to fixed aesthetics, we can also map data to different aesthetics and create multiple lines. In the previous section, we just looked at one country, so we only had one line. But we can look at the time series of data from many different countries and separate those lines. So let's create a new data set and add a couple more countries to the US. So here I'm creating a data set called Gap Mini where I added Australia and Germany. You can see that this data frame has 36 rows, which means there are three countries and there's 12 years of data for each country. Now we could just take the previous code that we used to plot the singular graph for Gap US and change Gap US to Gap Mini. But if you execute this code, the resulting plot will look like this. Here there are a lot of zigzags and it's not clear how the trajectory of each country is separate. If you add a layer of points, it'll make clear what's going on here. By looking at the points, if you look vertically, you can see that there are three separate points at three different levels. This suggests that the three countries have separate trajectories but the lines have connected all the points together and are not separated by country. So needless to say, this is not a very helpful plot for trying to compare these trends that we want to see between countries. If we want ggplot to map data from each country separately, we can add what is called the group aesthetic inside the mapping argument. After x and y, I'm going to add the group aesthetic and set it equal to the country variable so that the lines are separated by each value of country. Now this is much better. We have three separate lines, one for each value of the country variable, US, Australia, and Germany, which is in our gap mini data set. Now that we have these three separate lines, we can also apply fixed aesthetics to them. Here I added line type, color, and size, to line and change the size for points. Admittedly, it's not a very attractive plot, but it does show you that you can have different aesthetics applied to it and the data will still stay grouped because you added group equals country to the mapping argument. However, notice that line type, size, and color stay consistent across the three lines. It doesn't allow us to distinguish which country the data is coming from. I don't know which line belongs to Germany or Australia or the United States. Or We can add aesthetic attributes that are visual and connect them to countries so that someone looking at this with fresh eyes would be able to tell which line belongs to which country. So here, instead of group, I'll use color 
because group will separate the lines, but it doesn't tell me which country is which line. Color, on the other hand, will. So now we can see that red belongs to Australia, green to Germany, and blue to the United States. When you're combining geoms like this, you don't always have to have the mapping within the main ggplot function call. Of course, you need to put x and y here so that these can both be inherited and you don't have to repeat yourself in these. But if you just wanted to map color to geom line but not to geom point, you can add mapping equals AES within here. Let's try that. So here, I've added a mapping equals AES as a direct argument of geom line. It's okay that there's two of them. Here we have it in ggplot already. These mappings, X and Y, are going to be passed down to both the geom line and geom point, but this mapping, color equals country, will only be applied to geom line. Now, when I run the code, you see that color has been mapped to the lines, but not to the point. Now you can get even more practice with this with a practice question. So let's see what we have next. So first up, we would like you to make a population growth time series chart. Now you'll be using GeomLine to do this as usual, but the trick is this time we want you to create a plot based not on written instructions, but something that you can see. Your assignment is to create a population growth chart with these aesthetic mappings. I won't spell out for you what they are, but you can get an idea of what it is by looking at the keys and the axis labels to see which mappings you need to put on your plot. After you've created this plot, you have a second practice question where you'll need to add a layer of points. Once you have the correct answer to the previous practice question, you'll take that code, add a layer of points, and put in the right aesthetic mappings so that your plot looks like this one over here. Welcome back! Those were a couple of challenging practice questions, but I hope you were able to get them and make full use of the check and hint functions to help you along. Next, we're going to be looking at scales. Whenever we add aesthetic mappings in ggplot, it will automatically scale the variable to fit the aesthetic. Now, what do we mean by this? Let's look at an example. Here, this plot has three aesthetic mappings. In the code, you'll see that we've mapped three different variables to x, y, and color aesthetics. The x and y positions are aesthetic mappings as well. That's important to keep in mind. The variables that we mapped to x and y were continuous variables, so ggplot has automatically scaled a continuous axis. Here, it looks at what the minimum and the maximum life expectancy was for this mini data set, and then divided the scale accordingly and decided to label it for every four years. To customize x and y scales or any scales in ggplot, we use the scale family of functions. Think back to this ggplot syntax template. Here we have data, aesthetics, and geometries. These are the three inputs that we've been using so far. We haven't touched any of them below, but congrats. First up, we're going to be looking at scale functions. Several different scale functions exist, and each one of those scale functions accepts different sets of arguments. There are a lot of different scale functions in ggplot. There are general purpose scales, x and y position scales, color and fill, as well as shape and size. But today we're just going to be focusing on scale x continuous, scale y continuous, and log scale to transform an x or y axis to be log scaled. So the first element of scales that we're going to change are these scale breaks. For this, we're going to use a new subset of the Gapminder data frame. So I want to create a new subset of Gapminder with the countries India, China, and Thailand. So what you're going to do is filter country and then this in with two percentage signs on either side and then you create a character vector of the countries that you want. Pay attention here because you'll need to do this for some of the practice questions in this lesson.
Now we take this data and use a simple line graphs code. We've been doing this with life expectancy, but now we're going to do it with GDP per capita. Great, so now we have this line graphs. They're colored by country, and we can clearly see which line belongs to which country. So here we see these scale breaks. These don't match up with the years in the data frame. So if you take gap mini 2 and pipe it into unique function, it will tell you exactly how many different years there are. And as we noticed before, it starts from 1952 to 2007, and the data is collected every five years. But on this plot, these are not the numbers that we see. So we want to change the x-axis scale to give us these years instead of the years on that plot. How do we tell ggplot to do that? We're gonna use scale continuous functions that change the position of scale breaks on the x and y axes. Quickly, I'm gonna show you the help documentation for these functions. So it tells us that we have scale x continuous and scale y continuous to change x and y axis scales for continuous variables, which is what we have, year and GDP per capita are both continuous variables. So now we can look at which arguments scale x continuous takes and scale y continuous also does the same. The one that we want to use is breaks, which is over here. So breaks equals a certain thing, this is the default input, but we want to put in our character vector of years. So we look closely at what other inputs the breaks argument can take, and here it says you can add a numeric vector of position. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to add breaks inside Scalex Continuous and add a vector. First though, we're going to create that vector. One way is to do it manually and type out all the years. Don't do that, it takes a while and you might make a mistake. We are going to create a vector with the sequence function, which is what I recommend for creating even scale breaks. So what we want is to start from 1952, go to 2007, and we want it every five years. We can easily give this to sequence. So we write from 1950. Two from 1952 to 2007 and then by five because we want the years to be every five so I will and this and it gives you the exact same vector as we got from typing it manually and the same vector that we see of unique years now why don't we just use the vector created by unique this is because you might have other data sets that are not complete. In the Gapminder data frame, it has data for every single year. But you might have another data set where you want to plot year on the x-axis or any other number, and you could have missing data for a certain year. In that case, if you use unique from the data frame and that year is missing, that year won't be labeled. So that's why I suggest using sequence if you want to have evenly spaced numbers. So then you're going to copy this sequence code. Save it and we'll paste it in soon into our ggplot code. Now this is the code that made the last line graphs plot. And to modify the scale breaks, we add the scale function. So first we add the plus sign because we're going to add a new layer. And in ggplot, we chain functions together with a plus sign. So don't forget that. Then we add scale x continuous. Within scale x continuous, the breaks argument will be equal to that sequence vector that we copied. And I will just paste that in. So breaks equals to this numeric vector, and it will label the plot. It will change the current numbers that are on the x-axis. It will change it to whatever is in that sequence vector that we supplied to breaks. So let me run the new code, and here you have it. The years now match up with the years in our data set. You can see that they are labeled like this and each year corresponds to a data point. We can make this more clear by adding points. We add geom point and you don't need to add any arguments in there. It will inherit the aesthetic mappings from before. And now that the points are added, you can see more clearly that the points line up exactly with these scale breaks 
and so the years are clearly visible and you can tell exactly which year let's say china took over india here and went over and we see that happened in 1977 rather than copying and pasting that sequence vector each time we can save the vector as an r object so i'm going to save it to gap years here you add just the regular assignment operator and then paste in that same sequence code. Now gap years is saved to your environment. And in this code, we're just going to delete this and put in gap years. Great. So you see it gives us the correct plot. And now we'll use gap years in our rest of our plots in order to make sure the x-axis is scaled by the years in the data set. Now it's time for you to practice adjusting the scale breaks on a continuous scale, except in addition to scale x continuous, I want you to add scale y continuous. The idea is exactly the same. Inside scale y continuous, you put breaks equal to, and then the numeric vector of where you want to break the axes. And so what I will ask you to do is to add y axis breaks for GDP per capita, and I want your graph to look like this. So instead of giving you which numbers exactly you need to plot in the numeric vector, you can look at where the scale breaks you need to have are, and you can use sequence to know where to start from, where to end up, and by how much do you want to space out the breaks. Welcome back. The next thing we're going to adjust on these continuous scales is to transform them mathematically. So we can use a log function to rescale one of the axes. In the logarithmic scaling examples, I'm going to add a new country to our data set and I'll soon tell you why. I had chosen India, China and Thailand because they had a similar range of GDP per capita. Now I'm going to add New Zealand, which has a much higher GDP per capita than these countries over the time period we're looking at. So this will create Gap Mini 3 with these four countries. And as we expect, Gap Mini 3 has now 48 rows, 12 for each of the four countries. So now we're going to recreate the previous line graph. So all I've done is copy over the code and change gap mini 2 to gap mini 3 for our new data subset. So now you can see that the three countries we plotted before are kind of squished at the bottom of the plot. And then we have New Zealand that is much higher. Because those three countries are sort of squished along here, it's harder to read the patterns that we saw before. So remember before we noticed how India and China were going up and down and that in 1972 China took over India. Now this is really hard to see that in this plot because they take up such a small amount of space. So one way to fix this would be to rescale the y-axis so that we have wider breaks here and we can squish the top part so that we use the plot space better and these patterns will be easier to read. So we're going to use scale x log. Pardon me, we're going to use scale y log since we're transforming the y axis. So we add the function scale y log 10 and then run this code. Now you can see how the ones that were squished together have been given more space and this empty space that was here before New Zealand has been pushed up. Now pay attention to where the scale breaks are. Here we have 1000, 3000, 10,000 and 30,000. These numbers are not increasing linearly as they did before since they've been transformed onto a log scale. So now you can practice using scale y log 10. But first I would like you to subset data to just data for Uganda. Now I'm just checking that it looks right. Great, I have my data and the country is Uganda for all of them. So you're going to use the Gap Uganda data frame, the subset that we just created, and the following changes need to be made. You need to rescale the y-axis with scale log 10 
and change the color and size of the line as fixed aesthetics. So you can change the color to any art color you'd like and perhaps increase the size so that the pattern is more clear. So please pause the video here, go in your RMD and do this practice question. Come back when you're done and I'll show you what that would look like. All right, welcome back. And what you should have created is a plot that looks like this, where you see population increasing over time, but you have rescaled the axes so that it's not linear. And don't forget to use gap years in order to add scale breaks to your X axis. I'll just show you a before and after of how it would look like if we didn't scale the Y axis by log. So this is what the population growth curve looks like when the Y axis is linear. And then when you added log, it kind of straightened it out. For this just one country, it might not be super useful, but when you have lots of countries and the population increases exponentially, then Y log can really help you with this. You can also change the country if you'd like to experiment to your own country or to any other country that you'd like to see what that looks like or add several countries and compare population growth. So far, we haven't added any text to our plots, but good plots need good labels. You want the reader to be able to look at it and understand what the data is representing without having to address any additional documentation. So here are five elements we're gonna add to our plot with the labs function. First, we have the title, which appears in large text at the top left of your plot. Below that, you add a subtitle, you can change the X and Y axis names, and you can rename also the title of the color scales or any other mapping scales that show up on the right of your plot. So let's get started. So here I've built upon our gap US plot that had both line graph and points on it. And I added in some of the elements that we did like rescaling the X axis breaks. Now let's add a title to the plot. First, let's change the X and Y axis title from their default variable names to something more understandable and readable. First, let's initialize the labs function, a plus sign, and then LABS. X equals year, we're just capitalizing Now we run this and then you can see that our axis titles have changed. Next, we'll add a title at the top of the plot. So here again, we work within labs and just add a comma and then a new argument. I'm just gonna copy over. So we can see here that the title lifespan increases over time has been added. Next, we'll add a subtitle. Next, we'll just add a small caption at the bottom of our plot. So we set caption equals, and I want to put the source of the data. So now you can see it's there in the corner in just a little tiny text and people can access that data if they'd like. Now the other thing we can change the label for is the title of a key. So I'm going to go back to our plot of Gap Mini 2 that had India, China, and Thailand. Here I have modified some of the aesthetics. I changed the size of the lines and points. I added the points, rescaled the Y and X axis scale breaks, and added these titles. So what we want to change is the 
color key title, which currently just says country. All I'm going to do is capitalize that. Now this is not a big deal in this plot, but sometimes if you have a odd variable name like we do for life exp or something similar, then you want to make it more readable. Now the important thing to remember is you set the argument as the mapping aesthetic that was used to create that key. So since we did color equals country right over here, color equals country. So the color title, we want country with a capital C and we put color equal to, there we go. Now let me show you what if I add another aesthetic mapping Geom point, I'm going to change the size to be equal to the population variable. So you have to put in mapping equals AES for it to be equal to a variable. Size equals pop. India and China have a pretty big population, so there are going to be some big circles. And I'll also make the circles a little more transparent, so in case they overlap, you can see that more clearly. So that was the alpha argument. Oops, I made the common mistake that many people made and put alpha equals 0.5 within the mapping. This is a fixed aesthetic, so it should go outside. You can see that my brackets start and close and I want to put it outside. Now that should be fixed. And here you can see that these circles are increasing with time. That makes sense because we know that as time has passed since 1952, population has grown a lot over the years. And that gives us this scale where it tells us how big the circle is for what number of population and we want to rename pop to population. So here we go back to labs and think about what we want to set pop equal to. Pop was mapped to size so if you thought it should be size equals population you are correct. And now the title of the size key has been updated to population so that the reader clearly knows what these size are representing. Now you can practice doing labels. So choose three countries that you would like to plot. They can be any countries from the data frame. I'm pretty sure it's global so all countries are represented. So remember how to use filter when there are multiple countries. You can refer back to previous examples to see how to get the syntax right for this. Once you have my gap mini you will then use it to plot gdp over time so year on the x-axis gdp on the y-axis and then you will add a list of attributes that we've put here hello again so your plot should look something like this I went with the same data set for before with those three countries, but you can choose whatever you want so it'll look a little different. And if you added the aesthetics correctly, the lines and dots will look quite similar to this. And then there's a second practice question where you want to add labels to your plot. So it tells you what you need to label the title, subtitle, X and Y axes, and you'll need to capitalize the color legend title. So go ahead and you can pause again work in your RMD and come back after you finish this question. So my plot for that practice question looked like this. I added the labels and I think it looks quite nice with the lines being a bit transparent and the cleaned up scale breaks and titles. Now let's go through the learning objectives and summarize the concepts that we've covered in this lesson. First of all, we use geom line to create plots showing the relationship between two numerical variables, especially time series plots where we had some notion of time on the x-axis, such as year. Then we learned how to add geom point and add aesthetic modifications at the geometries level. And those got pretty complex, so you could add mappings and fix aesthetics on different layers now. 
the aesthetics we used were color, size, alpha, which we covered before, and group, which we used for line graphs specifically. We then went over scales. You can modify both position scales on the x and y axis and log scale. Lastly, we learned how to add labels to different parts of the plot. I hope now that you're comfortable with line scales and labels in ggplot and you can test your knowledge on the quizzes on our website. So please visit the Graph Courses website and do the quizzes for this lesson. Good luck and hope to see you in the next video. For more resources, visit our website where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today.